Welcome to the Krill Pet Arctic World Series. It is getting very exciting as the first musher just moved out of Caltech. Now here's what's happening the upcoming hours. The Iditarod Trail Committee explicitly encourages people to not travel to Nome for the finish due to prevent the coronavirus from spreading. Thomas Werner just got out of Caltech and is now taking the lead of the race. There is Thomas Werner and also a storm is coming as the mushers are closing in on the shoreline. First up we have Dallas CV with us live from Anchorage. Good morning uh, or good evening in Dallas. Yes, good evening from Alaska. It's been another fantastic day of watching the Iditarod here in Alaska. It's, it is heating up. It is getting exciting as the mushers near the U, or the end of the Yukon River and on to the Bering Sea coast. This is where the race really starts. Let's take a look at the map. It's been, uh, like I said, it's been a hectic time as these mushers have been racing down the down the Yukon River. We're picking up here as we go into Galena, where Jesse Royer was the first musher in. Followed closely behind was Brent Sass, and right behind you were Olsum, Richie Deal, and Ryan Reddington. Uh, these mushers all had run times between 6.28 and 6.45. Six hours and 28 to 6.45, that is. Uh, Pete Kaiser, Paige Drobny, and Thomas Warner were the next in, followed by Aaron Burmeister, Lance Mackey, Michelle Phillips, Mitch Seavey, and Wade Mars. Now, all these teams had varying run times. Most of them came in at about the six and a half hours, with the exception of Thomas Warner and Wade Mars, who did it just over six hours for a very fast run time. Brent Sass was the first onto the trail, having taken no rest in the checkpoint. He stopped and rested on the trail and was quickly passed by Jesse Royer and Richie Deal as they headed over to the Nolato checkpoint. Brent Sass would stay on the trail for about five hours. They would uh, continue racing down the river there. Each of these mushers stopped for varying times in Galena. Your Olsum, Lance Mackey, and Ryan Reddington would take their mandatory eight back in Galena, so we don't see them leaving until towards the end. Most other mushers took between three and four hours. Coming into the Nolato checkpoint, Jesse Royer still had the lead in the race, followed by, closely by Richie Deal, Thomas Werner, Brent Sass, after he came off his rest there. And then um, Pete Kaiser, Paige Drobny, Aaron Burmeister, Mitch Seavey, and Michelle Phillips coming in there. You are Olsum and Ryan Reddington would round out the 10th and 11th position there. Nolato saw it kind of get changed up a li little bit. Jesse Royer only stayed three hours and 20 minutes before pressing on. Some of the mushers stayed much longer, taking their eight hour break. Richie Deal was there for 11 hours and 42 minutes, um, giving the dogs a very long break after having a little bit of trouble getting on the trail with some females in heat, some, something of a distraction for the boys. As they race towards the Caltag checkpoint, it really starts to stretch out a little bit. We see Jesse Royer, Brent Sass, he would needed to stop for another about two hours and 50 minutes on the trail on this section, but he's back in second place. Thomas Werner, Pete Kaiser, Aaron Burmeister, and Wade Mars all followed them into the checkpoint. All of these mushers had run times of approximately six hours. That seemed to be the normal run time, some as little as 5.55. Um, Thomas Werner had a good run time at five hours and 32 minutes. Uh, Pete Kaiser had one of the slower run times at six hours and 16 minutes. However, we saw a big move by Mitch Seavey coming off of his mandatory eight in the lotto with a run time of four hours and 45 minutes. Um, he is running in 10th place right now, but with a run time that's an hour and a half faster than Pete Kaiser and about, uh, what are we looking at? 45 minutes faster than the second faster smusher, Thomas Warner. That puts him in position to be, to be moving up the ranks. Speed is becoming important. I guess that's the main factor here. As they hit the coast, we want to see which teams are building speed and peaking at this moment. And it looks like Thomas Werner, who left the checkpoint in first from Caltag, has a very nice team. And uh, there's many good teams following him. But with 300 miles still to go, the speed of the team makes a big difference at this point. 
And from Caltech, we have Greg and Bruce live with us. Uh, Greg and Bruce, did you get to see Thomas Werner before he left? Yeah, Maria, it's been an absolutely spectacular day on the Iditarod Trail. Once again, trail conditions playing a big role in this race. The snow continues to fall here at Caltag, where these teams depart the Yukon River. It's great to see everyone again tonight, Greg and Bruce. And we did see Thomas Werner. Bruce, we saw them both come into Caltag. Impressive, maybe more impressive when we saw him leave. Yeah, I thought it was a lot more impressive the way he left because when he first walked out of the shelter cabin that the mushers are sleeping in his dogs just looked like they were ready to hit the trail they jumped up off their straw he hadn't even fed them the snack or put on their booties yet which tells me they just have a lot of energy and are very very willing to go and literally 30 seconds before you guys came to us, Aaron Burmeister has pulled out of this checkpoint just off to our left screen right for you watching. Jesse Royer preparing to leave. She can go at 18 minutes after the hour. So the race is on. And the question I have for you, uh, Bruce, is that Thomas Werner, I mean, he rested for five hours here. Fastest team, most amped looking team, and now five hours of rest. But he's out there by himself, at least leading the way over a 90 mile trail that has a lot of fresh snow on it. Finally, after about halfway, it starts opening up into open tundra. And the issue is now he had the advantage of following Brent and Jesse in here on a little bit more defined trail. So his travel time should be a little bit faster. Now we'll see if that reverses. Now that team looked incredibly good. And, and I would say is the strongest one come uh, right here right now but now these guys meaning Jesse and Brent Sass just took eight hours of rest they're following him we're going to really know a whole lot more about how this plays out by the time they get to Unicle. yeah and obviously tomorrow after this this big run that's in front of them we'll know a lot more but when we project forward and you look at the weather forecast Bruce these teams are going to be running on soft trail as these temperatures continue to warm almost raining now in Caltag so the snow is going to loosen up but there's also a lot of fresh snow that will continue to fall that we're being told almost into Tuesday yeah and that changes the dynamic of this a lot because as we've seen in other races you could have the strongest team and be out front but you can't find the trail that's part of this you know there's the dogs the decision making and care of the mushers and then there's the alaska weather and alaska has a big voice yeah. in how this yeah. race turns out so it, with that dynamic it's good to be out there with a strong team but it might actually be that a team setting back in eighth or ninth place is going to pull this off because they could come up, be more rested, and storm right by them. Yeah, it's what the beauty of the Iditarod really is. Over the last two years, it was Nick Petit who was sitting here in Caltag, and from an onlooker standpoint, it looked like Nick had the greatest team on the trail in both of those years. And, of course, Nick not going on to win either one of those Iditarods, having issues across Norton Sound between Shaq Tulik and Koyak. So a long way to go for Thomas Werner and a lot of race left for those that are chasing him down to try to stay in contention and perhaps overtake him. And, again... Thomas is very experienced. He's won a lot of races, but this is just his second Iditarod. And so uh, time will tell if he's got the savvy to make the right decisions over these final 350 plus miles. It's really when the race begins. And I know you guys have, have been talking over the last six weeks, whatever event we're at, it's about management, right? But these decisions coming up for all of these teams are on a different level. Yeah, these are the best of the best, but also there's that aspect. We've always had the saying in long-distance sled dog racing, good luck is not having any bad luck. <laughs> and, the, and the examples you pointed out are perfect, where weather enters in, you lose the trail. Maybe you just didn't get enough of a nap at the last checkpoint, so then you doze off, and that's the critical moment when the dogs don't see the trail and they drift off, and all at once, the whole dynamic of the trail and, and your position on it change it's often been said from the 
moment I ever knew anyone running the Iditarod. It's not the fastest team that wins the Iditarod. It's the best team. Yeah, and we have yet to determine who the best team is, and we won't know that until the winner gets to the finish line in Nome. And so Thomas Werner right now with the fastest team, I think the numbers certainly project that, and that's easy. That's evidence uh, that we can point to. But with somebody like Aaron Burmeister, Jesse Royer, Mitch Seavey, I mean, even Pete Kaiser's team when it came in here today, it was impressive looking, a lot of energy, a lot of amp in it, uh, a lot of race to go. And Thomas is going to have to prove that he can go out and outduel some of these really veteran, experienced mushers on the Iditarod Trail. Yeah, and when you've got Brent and Jesse up front breaking the trail Not here Brent, yeah. from from Galena, I mean those dogs, they're they're trail smart. They finally realize there's, you know, dogs immediately adapt to the situation. Okay, there's four inches of fresh snow. No, this isn't a loping trail. They get down into their little marching trot and they maintain that and they can do that forever. So then it becomes a real management game, so to speak, for the musher to not put extra pressure on them to go faster. They're in the gate they need to be in. And this is where that thing we hear over and over comes in, patience. Just keep the dogs well fed, let them do what they can do. And you don't want to push them on a trail, uh, you know, urge them to go faster than what they can naturally do breaking the trail. It was Brent Sass who told me earlier today, this afternoon, in fact, that he knew where Thomas was. He knew that Thomas would be leaving here first. And he was, Brent, that is, was completely comfortable with that fact. You know, <laughs> not, not to take anything away from Thomas's team, because it looks really good. It's amazing, actually, But if yeah. I had my choice, I would not be out front in this weather condition okay. because he's got to find all the little turns and every other aspect feel out the trail he's putting down scent for these other teams they're going to know what he's doing he's not going to know what they're doing i i would rather be back in like third fourth or fifth position to be honest because every team that goes every set of sled runners that go over this trail at this 30 degree temperature is going to make this trail slicker which is easier pulling for the dogs and with that said if thomas is able to make this run to unilocleat an hour or hour and a half faster than his competitors then he's got a lead possibly in this race that would be insurmountable We've got to, let's go back to the studio now to Maria. Hi, Maria. Hello, Bruce and Greg. And I wonder, uh, the coronavirus is on everybody's minds, at least here in Europe. How is it affecting the checkpoint of Caltag and uh, you? Well, you know, to be honest, it's it's on everybody's minds out here, and uh, it is something that we've all had to deal with in one way or another. And uh, it's been a, a journey, I think, that has has garnered a lot of respect, and we've all had to, to kind of watch our step as we come into these communities along uh, the Yukon River, and as we approach the Bering Sea community uh, or the communities on the Bering Sea coast. And so, uh, a lot of things are changing. I think people are working together and understanding that uh, safeties have to be put in place so that people are comfortable, both the people that live in these communities and also the people that are passing through. So it's affecting things. And I know, Bruce, even Nulato on the river, they've had to move that checkpoint down, uh, which I did a rod, did a great job in getting that set up. Uh, Shaq Tulik has made a decision that they don't want the race coming all the way into the heart of their community, that they're going to... as Jesse Royer leaving right behind us, and, and we'll continue with the story in a minute, Maria. But, Bruce, we've got our third team out on the trail now. This is Jesse Royer and quite possibly the best grinder uh, in this lead pack. Jesse is just, she is just a musher that will never give up. She's yeah. a pit bull. And, you know, I'll say to people in Norway, if you're not aware of this, Jesse is a true cowgirl from Montana. She <laughs> works cattle. She yeah. gathers up buffalo she goes out on pack trips she doesn't have any quit in her and that team is really tough and really well trained and i think she's setting in a great position right now because she's got thomas mm. and aaron out breaking trail for her right. 
and maybe she can reserve some energy on the way the Bering Sea coast. Okay, to put the cap on the cor the coronavirus story, uh, it is something that we're all dealing with out here. We're all talking about it. We're all trying to feel our way through it, as is uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and the mushers have even talked about it outwardly uh, in some of the sound bites and interviews that we've captured out on the trail. It is in the minds of everybody. And the Iditarod has always been one of those places where, you know, the mushers can go, the people that come out and follow this race and the communities that we travel through oftentimes are unaffected by what's going on in the rest of the world. And the Iditarod oftentimes has been a great diversion away from all of that. But it is something that we... Uh, have had to deal with out here, and I think we'll continue to deal with as we uh, move our way towards Nome. But the Iditarod is going to go forward, and you know the one parallel, the one imagery that everybody keeps bringing up is that in 1925, with that great serum run, and the the need to get the diphtheria uh, serum to Nome went down much of this Iditarod Trail, and today we are dealing with another infection. And so uh, the fact that this race is going on to Nome, but Bruce, it's on the minds of everybody here. Well, it's on the minds of people everywhere, but I mean, it is what it is. And yeah. I, I would like to put a positive spin on this for people watching instead of a fearful thing. It Viruses have been around forever, yeah. and I don't mean to downplay the seriousness of it, but um, life's, life's going on, and we're all okay. Yeah. We are okay. Race continues to Nome, and of course, we'll be here bringing all these pictures to you live. These great dog teams are headed down the Iditarod Trail tonight, Maria. They're headed towards the infamous Bering Sea coast. There is snow falling. There is wind blowing. The Norton Sound is frozen, and these dog teams are heading home to their genetic birthplaces. It is great imagery from Keltag tonight on the Yukon River. Let's go back to Norway. So, uh, Bruce and Greg, I have a question for the two of you. Um, it looked like coming into the checkpoint, Brent took maybe an unplanned stop only about 25 miles away from the Caltag checkpoint. It looked like it was going to be a long run, so he took some extra rest there. How did that team look coming into the Caltag checkpoint? That's something I see if, if it was uh, done at the right time could be very positive and could set him up to leave in a very strong position. What are your thoughts? Yeah, interesting question, Dallas. And, and, and Dallas is asking the question about Brent Sass's stop in between Nulato and Caltag. We talked to, to uh, Brent today about it. He thought when he got to Caltag, it, was, it ended up to be a very positive move. Explain why he did it. Well, because a lot of people, I think, this is what can be deceiving about just purely looking at stats or looking at a tracker and going, oh, my gosh, he stopped. Brent didn't stop because he couldn't go any farther. He didn't stop because his dogs didn't want to go any farther. He stopped because he made the decision of knowing where Thomas was behind him and Jesse. And he went, I'm out here. They broke enough of this. I, I think that, and I'm speaking in his terms, he's going, the, I think this is where in my early races I would have just pushed on to Caltag, but why am I? I've got plenty of food. I'm just going to stop yeah. and feed him here, which is exactly what he did. He had no depression or concern about that stop. He made a conscious decision in the new mindset of of Brent Sass to go, I'm, I'm fine here. I'll feed my dogs, put energy into them, and let those guys come up for a while. So it almost... It almost was a move like you would have seen in the history of the old Iditarods. By that, I mean from the 70s and early 80s, where mushers took turns breaking trail yeah. instead of just this last few years of fast trail and going, where he just decided, my dogs are strong, they're going good, this would be a positive time to stop. Yeah, and Dallas, I know you would appreciate when that team came in here, it was very lively. It had a lot of energy. And when he put that food down, every dog on that line stood up and woofed those bowls of food. It kind of reminds me of your dad's great team a few years ago. That team ate like, you know, the famous term alligators. And Brent Sass's team has been eating that way this entire trail. So he's a guy that I think if 
things get tough up front, he's in perfect position as well to make a run at a championship. Exciting stuff. You know, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a great comparison, uh, Greg, in that his team looks very much like that team that Mitch had that year. That It was just like they could run into a wall and bust right through it. And, and that's the type of vision I have of Brent's team right now. Maybe not the top speed, but unstoppable. Yeah. So that's the story. Thomas Werner has the lead tonight. His team looks really, really, really good, but there's a lot of world-class dog teams right on his heels. It's going to be an amazing run to Nome. That's what I wanted to hear about Brent Sass's team right there. It showed a real move of maturity is what I saw in that, and so I'm very excited to hear that he had a strong team coming in. My other question is, so far the fastest musher over there was uh, Mitch Seavey coming in there, 45 minutes faster than Thomas Werner. Now I'm curious, how much of that speed difference is based on the trail? Or is it the boost that he was getting coming off yeah. of his eight hour break in Nolato? Question from Dallas is about Mitch Seavey. Mitch had a blazing time uh, over into this checkpoint and in, in, into Keltag, and, and he's wondering: Is it because Mitch came off his eight-hour rest, or were there trail conditions that allowed it? Did the trail get better, or is it just that it was a fresher team coming here? I think it was a combination of those, and Mitch being a master yeah. of this over so many years of knowing how to manage his team to the conditions and know when they need rest. You know, he was having a little more difficulty having it all pulled together like he's used to early in the race, and he just kind of took his time with them. Uh, it, it can be having that rest. Uh, the trail conditions, it, it, the interesting thing here is, as you ask that, I think about Jesse said when she, she was out front and moving into the storm that when the snow hit, the trail didn't get slower, it got faster. Because this is that 30, high 20 degree, 30 degree Fahrenheit snow that, that is very slick. It has a lot of glide to it for skiers, uh, as an example. Where before that snow had that was the base had set at 20 and 30 below for weeks, and it was like pulling your sled over sandpaper and it had a lot of drag so Jesse said uh, as the day went on with this storm uh, the trail actually got better as long as the dogs could visually and with their smell find where the trail is so I think that played into Mitch's run on top of that he had these teams in front of him that packed this top type of snow down and if I slide my foot here like three times That's on true. top of the snow it be gets packed and it becomes glazed. It actually feels like ice. So I think all of those things came together for Mitch. And of course, this is a master, right? And this isn't about being one of the best teams in Nikolai. This is about a team peaking and getting better and finding those great rhythms as you get to the final few hundred miles of this race. So Mitch Seavey certainly put himself in a position if there's some issues up front, he's one of those guys, one of those teams that's right there to take advantage of it. Thank you so much for uh, your live update from the checkpoint of Caltech, Greg and Bruce. And uh, we will look closer at all of the teams getting into Caltech and also leaving Caltech later. But first, here are some beautiful pictures of from the race.
Yes, and uh, with me in the studio, I have Hanna Fredriksen, veterinarian, and uh, you've been also a, ha a handler uh, in Adirod some I've, years. I've uh, been on the trail, yes, yeah. How do you think it is to, to follow the race now? Well, now it's uh, really, really exciting. Uh, then they are leaving Caltag and everyone have been finishing their eight hours. So now we will really see how the teams are doing and how they are scheduling the, the rest of the, the race. It's uh, coming up a storm and it will be very exciting to see how how the, they are. Thomas have been leaving Caltag and if uh, he, him, Burning out some energy now on the trail. Yes, can... and this is the trail from uh, Ruby to Caltag. Yeah, uh, that uh, most mushers are uh, are at right now, right? Yeah, they have been uh, leaving. Thomas was having his eight in uh, in Ruby, and they are now going uh, through um, Galena and Nulato, and further on to Caltag, and then they're going over to Unalakleet. Uh, is the first checkpoint on the coast. How is this terrain here? Well, from uh, from Caltag, they are going... From Nulado here. Is it...? Uh... Um, maybe Dallas can uh, I, um, yes. uh, answer that question. Yeah. He's, uh, he's have been running it for uh, several times. <laughs> All right, Marie, I'm sorry. What was the section that you were wondering about there? Uh, the, from the... Caltag to Unalakleet? Uh, actually, the one prior that we looked at on the map, where most mushers sure. are um, are right now. Sure. Okay, Nalato to Caltag is about, a th uh, the official distance I think is 37 miles between Nalato and Caltag. Uh, this section of the trail, or this section of the Yukon River, is less traveled than the other parts that the mushers have been on. There's more snowmobile traffic between Nalato and Galena, and Galena and Ruby, so those tend to be better trails. This section tends to be a little bit softer, not as hard packed, uh, but it's running down the Yukon River much like the rest of the Yukon River. So mm -hmm. there's not any uh, elevation change, you're not going over any hills, and it can be very monotonous for the mushers. It seems like they avoided any very strong wind this year, but sometimes the wind can be a real challenge in that portion of the trail. Moving on from Caltag. Going from the Caltag yeah. to Unalakleet, the yeah, that, that section they have coming up, this is, I think many mushers would say this is their favorite section of trail, particularly if you have a really strong dog team like what we saw Thomas Werner leave with. Leaving Caltag, there's a, a very challenging series of kind of, or just, it's just a long climb as you get up to the uh, Caltag portage there. And it's, it's steep and a lot of times from snowmobiles, it gets like these steps. So you'll have maybe just a meter sharp climb up and then it levels out for a few meters and then another meter high sharp climb and it makes it very hard for the dogs to get into a good rhythm because they have to really pull that sled up and then the sled lands on the ground and they slide forward for a few feet and then they have to do it again. Once you get up uh, to the top of those steps which is about 15 to 17 miles you start to go down a valley and it's a beautiful section of trail you have mountains on either side um, it can be slow going it can be windy through there and as you get a little bit towards uh, maybe two thirds of the way into this run, there's a number of kind of these long gradual hills that are often windblown. So with this new snow and the winter storm advisory that they have out there, they're calling for some amount of wind. So that could make it challenging. And then you, you know, as you get closer to Unalakleet, you start to go down into Unalakleet and um, you actually hit the, the Unalakleet River at some point and come into the checkpoint. It's a beautiful run. It's about 79 miles. So it's a challenging run. I think we'll see many mushers break this next section of the trail into two runs resting along the way. And uh, earlier, we've seen a lot of mushers getting into the checkpoint of Caltag as we were sleeping in Europe. Now we will take a look back at many of these mushers, starting with the first one into Caltag, Jesse Royer. Beautiful All right, so Jesse Royer reached the Caltag checkpoint. She had a good run over there. She passed uh, Brent Sass, who camped about 25 miles from the checkpoint. So she was leading the race for that last 25 miles into the checkpoint there and having to break whatever trail there was. She had a great run time of about five hours and 55 minutes. Uh, that was, a, I should say, a strong run time. And so that's, that's a while, but remember, this is only a 37 mile run. So she was not moving very fast, nobody was. And we heard Greg and Bruce talk before about this being a tough team. They can, they're good at marching. 
and that can be some really uh, discouraging trail for a team that's used to always going fast. If they have to settle in and just walk along at six to seven miles an hour, which was the speed that we saw most of these mushers doing at least early on. But if her team is comfortable doing that, um, that's a, a very good thing for her because I think they're going to see a lot more of that over the next couple days here, just settling in and walking along. And but it is a nice looking yeah. team. They're not flying, but they're perky and aware and, you know, trucking along. And while uh, we were live with Greg and Bruce, we saw Tessie Royer leaving the checkpoint. Does that mean that she has taken her mandatory rest? Yes, it does. She has completed her eight hour mandatory rest. Uh, this is really where we get to see all the teams even again, you know, because they took their eights at different places on the river. So it looked like some mushers were way ahead. And then all of a sudden, somebody who was behind is caught up. But now it's all even. You know, the only other mandatory rest they have is at the next to last checkpoint, which is White Mountain. And that will almost certainly be the last checkpoint any of these competitive mushers will stop at. So we saw her leaving there. She has completed her eight. You know, she's going to have a very fresh team leaving here, having taken that long eight hour break. The real hope is that she still had enough speed and energy coming into the checkpoint that that eight hour rest will give her a good burst of speed. You have to be careful. An eight hour rest is a good rest, but it's not long enough that if you really slow your team down, it's not going to work any miracles. So it's important to have a strong team coming into your eight in Caltech. That's a very important factor. And while uh, Royer still was in uh, the Caltech checkpoint, uh, we got to talk to her. I may have to tell you guys to get back over on the other trail, not the snow machine trail, huh? Yeah, you guys are good boys. Good boys. Did it make much difference when you passed Brent? Was Brent helping at all, or it was gone so quick? I, I didn't see any of his tracks, really. It was all blown in. Hey, guys. Hi, guys. Yeah, I asked him if he was all right. You know, he said, yeah, his team was just tired. And they were breaking trail, and he was just tired, so he just pulled over and let him sleep for a while. So, uh, at that point, I didn't think that breaking trail was that hard up to that point, you know? It really started snowing after I passed Brent. Which, needless to say, I was surprised when I saw him. I thought he would be here a long time ago. So uh, she was breaking the trail there at the end. Yep, and it, it's interesting, though, what uh, Bruce was saying about the trail being a little bit easier, actually, with that new snow, that kind of uh, slippery snow on the surface there. Uh, it's never easy to break a trail, but I, I know exactly what he's talking about. When you get some fresh snow, if it's the right type of snow, it can speed you up a lot, especially if it's a really tough granular snow that was, you know, the old snow that you were running on. I, uh, Jesse was talking about, you know, seeing Brent on the trail and passing, asking if he's okay. You know, that's the, the right thing to do, absolutely, because she doesn't know if he, you know, stopped there on purpose or if the dogs got tired and really needed to stop. We have the advantage of watching the GPSs, and Brent was holding a good speed, and I saw it as a real mark of maturity for him to stop at that point um, and not push on, not force that run. You've got to work with the terrain. You know, let Jesse break that trail down. Uh, so Jesse was probably uh, surprised not to see him there, but I think it would have been better for his for her race had Brent continued to race on um, into the checkpoint. So Jesse is leaving there now. She was out in third position, and had a good run over there. She's not the fastest team, she's not the slowest team, but where the real question now is to see how much benefit did that eight hour rest give her team? Is she gonna leave with a real sharp team? Are they gonna warm up and you know go much faster than they did arriving in this checkpoint? Or did she put that rest off a little too long to where she's locked herself into a slower pace and that eight hour rest will boost the dogs, but they'll continue to move at the same speed. So this is a really interesting race. I mean, here in Caltag, I think we have 10 mushers that could still theoretically win this race. And uh, Greg asked uh, Jesse Royer the million dollar question, is she going to win? <laughs> That's the million dollar question, right. isn't it? Right. Um, it's in good shape. I got 13 dogs. Um, they're all eating good and you know, we're a little slow, but I think everybody's slow just because of the trail conditions, the new snow and 
the the snow on the river was just not sliding the sleds it was just a really like a sugary it was like gliding on sand or something like the sleds just wouldn't glide so everybody's slow um this new snow is actually helping a little bit because there's some more moisture in it okay. um but it's also so the sleds are gliding a little better on the new snow but it's also making it tougher to find the trail it's getting well wind blown and you know snowed in so the teams coming ahead are gonna everybody's gonna be breaking trail unless they're right behind somebody yeah which brings me to the next question do you want to be breaking trail do you want to be out in front of this thing with 300 and what 60 miles or whatever it is to go um not really i mean I, breaking trail through a few inches is not a big deal but if we have to start breaking trail through a lot of snow then you know, that's not fun for anybody um but I don't know how much it's snowing ahead. I, I, I heard there's more snow towards Unalakleet. Yeah. So so that's that's not good, but um, somebody's got to break it out, I guess. And, yeah. you know, it's you, you can't wait. The, the rest, there's too many people coming. You just got to go. And Thomas Werner pulled in behind us. He's taking his eight-hour back in yeah. Ruby. You guys, you and Brent are here, and you're in the midst of your eight-hour rest. So yeah. uh, compute the numbers for me. Help me with that. Uh, I don't even remember what time I came in. You got you had more sleep than I have. Uh, let's see. I left at uh, what nine thirty. So three, I think I came in around three ten ish or something. So I've been in only two hours, which means he's going to be able to leave. Um, A couple hours maybe in front of you. Yeah, depending on how long he stays, because I've only been in, I have to stay another six. So he could be a couple hours ahead. Which may not be point. a bad thing if he can lay a track down for you. Um, it'd be nice if he was only like a half hour to an hour ahead because he could lay a track down and it won't be windswept. Yeah. So a couple hours, well, by then the trail could be gone again. Yeah. So um, it's hard to say, you know. But, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy somebody's going out ahead and maybe putting the, you know, trail in. Right. So The ebbs and flow of this race, right? I mean, these... these when we're looking at the condition of the dog team and the power that's left and and everything and so where, where's yours at and do you think this eight hour will be enough to get your team back to where it needs to be to contend uh well i i, I think i am still in you contending yeah. um you know because we got we got a long ways to go and especially with the whole uh no shack tulik uh that's gonna really throw a loop in a lot of things mm -hmm. um it's, it's yeah I don't know you know there's so much that happens on the coast so I think I think all three of us here are we're not that far apart even if he does leave an hour or two ahead I mean that's nothing on the coast you know a couple hours and it depends on the run rest and what people do on the way to Unalakleet and on the way to Koyak that's that's going to be a big big deal getting to Koyak. I think we'll know a lot more by then for sure. But uh, just how people are going to handle those big runs, those two really big runs. Yeah, they're coming up, and the fans back home have to be loving this. This is a really exciting race with everybody so close, and all these tremendous dog teams. Jesse, I'm wondering how much fun it is for you guys when you're in the middle of the battle here. Uh, well, you definitely can't let up. Yeah. You know, um, there's. Like, I, I was only going to stay four hours in Galena, but then when I woke up and was getting ready to go, that was when all the chaos of, oh, no, Shaq Tulik, and, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. And so with all that, middle of that chaos, I lost, like, a half hour by the time I, you know, got out of there. I was a half hour late, so that was kind of bummed. And then and then um, New Lotto was only going to stay three, but I was so tired. I, I could not stay awake on the way to New Lotto. Kept falling asleep on the sled. So I think I was like maybe 25 minutes late leaving the lotto too. Not that the, I mean, the dogs can use the rest, yeah. but that's almost an hour yeah. that I wasn't planning on that would it made a difference. Is it going to make a difference for my team? Maybe, maybe not, but it definitely makes a difference overall that now I'm an hour, you know, further behind Thomas. Yes. So um, yes. it all adds up. You know, I've been been beat by two minutes and i've been beat by a second before <laughs> so it, it definitely all adds up yeah. but you know you can only do your best and and i know all of our race like everybody here our um, our race plans have changed with no shack tulik because uh now we've, we've all got to revamp that and rethink our strategies of what we're going to do and stuff so i think it's going to be pretty interesting 
from from here to Koyak with two really long runs, how people are going to break that up. Yeah, because it really eliminates the option at stopping at one of the cabins. You're almost forced to go to Unalakleet, right? Because you could stop halfway and go all the way to Shaktulik. W what are you thinking in this next run, how it breaks down for you? You haven't thought that far ahead yet. Well, no, I have, but yeah. I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why would I say? <laughs> uh, no, I kind of have a plan in mind. Okay, good. Um and it's, it's obviously going to be way different than what I originally had planned because originally uh, I stopped before Unalakleet and then I go to Shaktulik, but there is no Shaktulik. So, yeah, that, that all had to change. And and I know a lot of teams that do that, and so everybody's going to have to change. So how are they Are they going to run straight to Unalakleet or are they going to break that up? Um, you know, like Brent likes to do long runs. I don't think Thomas does. He likes to break it up a little more. So... Um, He's got the speed, though. He doesn't have to do long runs. He can break it up and give him more rest because he's he's got the most speed of everybody here, you know. But, um, but it's neutralized a bit with this new snow, right? And they're forecasting another foot between Elam and Nome. Oh, God, grief. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So at this point, like, yeah, yeah. you know, like, yeah, he might be an hour or two, but then he busts trail through a foot of snow and, like, boom, we catch him. I mean, like... I mean, it is, at this point, who knows, you know? All I know is is uh, none of us are going fast. I know Thomas is faster, but he's not, like, that much faster. He is faster, but he's not just, like, kicking our ass, you know? Yeah. Little bits here, little bits there, but, um, and it does add up over time, but then he's out front breaking trail and we catch him, you know? Or, um, I don't know. You know, and my team right now, like, they're strong. We're not fast, but they're eating really well. Uh, there's no major huge issues. Um, they're, they're pretty darn healthy. And so we may not be super fast, but they'll just keep going to Nome, keep creeping along. Yeah. You know, so I do know we're tough, and we don't quit. We're, we're going to be one of the teams that's always there, just never going to quit. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesse Royer, the <laughs> ultimate grinder on the Iditarod uh, yeah. Trail. I'm kind of a scrapper. You are a scrapper, yeah, a there's scrapper. no doubt. Thank you, Todd. You're welcome. Get some sleep. <laughs> I am. Jesse Royer, ladies and gentlemen. And Dallas, what are your thoughts on uh, this? Yeah, no, Jesse is, first of all, she's aware of what's going on around her. Granted, she's taken her eight-hour mandatory rest. She's had a little bit of time to think about this and process this. You know, she's gotten a little bit of sleep, but, you know, she, I know Greg and Bruce said this before, but she does handle sleep deprivation very, very well. That means she's going to make good decisions for her dog team. She's not in the driver's seat of this race. I think that's pretty clearly Thomas, but she understands her position, and she's thinking about how her team can win. What needs to happen? How does she set them up, maybe not just to win even, but to have their best possible race, because there are a lot of competitors around. So of course she's thinking about Thomas and trying to catch up with, with him, who is currently in the lead. But um, she's also aware of the other teams around her, and that's really important. At some point, maybe you realize that you're racing for third, not first, so set your team up to succeed at that. Uh, she knows her team's a little bit slower, but she's right, she's not that much slower. Thomas was a little bit faster. Um, he had a great run coming over here. He's already taken his mandatory eight. So she may be faster on the next run. But it's she's thinking about the right things, and she pointed out that the Shaq Tulik checkpoint isn't actually a checkpoint. Um, that is going to change her schedule. She's probably going to need to rest on the way over to Unalakleet, even if just a short rest. We may see somebody push all the way to Unalakleet, but I think that would be a mistake at this point in the race to do that long of a run, because as they pointed out also, They've got a long ways to go. There's 360 miles or thereabout. It's somewhere between three, let's call it 345, 350. It's not a full 360, I know that. But they have a long ways to go. And remember, if we think all the way back to Takatna, when Jesse Royer seemed to have the strongest team, she was in the lead, she had the best speed. You know, it seemed to be hers to lose at that point. That was the first third. At the end of the second third, it appears that it's Thomas's race to lose at this point. He's in the driver's seat. That could easily change again. And Jessie's, she's a hardened musher. She's been through this many, many times. She knows how much that can change. So I don't think we're gonna see her back off or let up because you know one, one bad decision by Thomas and she's right back in the thick of it and the musher to beat. So 
She's still very much a contender at this point, a very smart dog driver. She's handling the sleep deprivation well. She's making good decisions. I'm, I'm still excited to see Jessie race to the finish, and I know she's going to do well. May not be first, but she's going to have a good finish. And now let's uh, shift our focus over to the one in the driver's seat, uh, Thomas Werner. And earlier he got into Caltag here. Yeah, this was uh, a nice looking team coming in here. Thomas's dogs are vocal, they're peppy. Um, so they, they, you know, they definitely impress everybody in the checkpoints because they are that kind of outgoing bubbly type of dogs. But they're also impressing me here where all I can look at is numbers, right? She, he had a great run time over there at five hours and 32 minutes, I believe, um, which was the fastest run up to this point. He was quite a bit faster than Jesse Royer. He outran her by almost 30 minutes um, on this, this section of trail. And again, this was only a 37 mile section of trail. Right, so he's going a minute a mile faster and you think there's 350 miles to go, let's say. If he continues to be a minute a mile faster, that's a huge amount of time. And so even the smallest speed difference can add up over distance. So uh, anyway, I mean, look at this team. They're perky, they're barking. They do not look like they're tired <laughs> at all. Um, so he's gotta be just grinning ear to ear with this team. You know, I've been in this position before where you're in Caltag and your race is coming together. This is where you want to have it coming together more than anywhere else in the race, I think. So he is in a strong, strong position. He's got the target on his back as all the mushers behind him are gonna be hunting him down over the next stretch of trail. Now it's all about strategy and Thomas is sharing his plan with us. It almost seemed like you were contemplating going back out, but is it the best thing for your dog team to kind of hang out here? And if so, why? My plan, plan A, but you know, in the dog marching, it's uh, never things go, most actually do go through with about 20 miles and then stop, but it's so warm. So I think it's good for the dogs to wait to the, to the night and then cool off. Uh, pretty good much fur on those dogs though. So it's nice to, yeah, a little cooler will be really nice. Do they go through your mind to go through? Hmm? Do they go through your mind at all to maybe go through and kind of wait? And well, I said if it goes easy down, I will go through. But I think it was a, a, not a mental hard tra trip for the dogs, but a physical hard trip because of the heat and soft trail. So, so that's why I think it's good for them for the rest of the muscles and then fly down the trail to an elite. And Thomas said that it's, uh, it's pretty warm. Yeah, and that will affect his dogs in particular. He does have a, a shaggier dog team, that long-coated dog team. They're great in super cold temperatures. You know, it helps them preserve body fat in cold temperatures particularly. But it is, it does make it harder for them when it's a warm day like it is today out there. You know, Thomas is one of the mushers that really did have the option to go through Caltag. Um, it only took him, you know, like, like we were saying, five hours and 30 minutes to get here. He easily could have continued down the trail. He had just taken about a four hour rest, four hours and eight minutes in the previous checkpoint. And yet he decided to stay here for almost five hours. I see this in two, two possible directions. One, he understands that he's in the driver's seat and he understands the only way that he gets beaten in this race is if he does something foolish and loses his speed. So I think that being conservative here, resting as long as he can, he left right with uh, Aaron Burmeister. So I think he was thinking, you know, I'm gonna stay here as long as I can and I'll leave with the other teams. Uh, that's a good thing for the speed. But he's also set himself up that he could go all the way to Unilcleat. He could knock that whole 70 mile or 78, I think it's 78 or 79 mile run all the way over to Unilcleat. If he did that, I think he's one of the few teams that can do that uh, and do it well. If he were to do that, he would then have a probably three hour lead on any other team, um, but he may slow himself down and be on the same speed level as the rest of the team. So I'm not 100% certain that he's gonna stop along the way. He may go all the way through, but I think the smart thing here is take as much rest as you can. He's gonna outrun the other teams. He has more rest. Just take however much time that he outruns them by and take that much extra rest. Just you know, leave with another musher every time and be the musher that has more rest. So I think it was a smart move for him not to go through um, and log that rest here. He's, it shows that he's aware, he's being conscientious of that speed and really trying to hold on to that speed, I think. 
Now, I wonder, with him saying that it's warm temperatures, and how is it for him to break the trail? Must the dogs then use more power? Yeah, you know, I, I think they are going to be using a little more energy to break this trail out as they go, you know, leaving that Caltech checkpoint. Um, the big question is how much snow is there? And this is one of the, the downsides of being in the lead of the race is, you know, he can't really take even more rest and let somebody else go in front. I guess it would be possible, but he would be risking a little bit. We know that he's going to be faster than Aaron Burmeister on this next trail. So Aaron's going to be following him, getting to take advantage of that trail being packed down a little bit. It's more than just, uh, there's a few factors. One, the dogs are having to push through that snow with their legs. They're having to lift their legs a little bit higher or push their leg forward through the snow, actually using some different muscles. Secondly, the sled pulls harder through that, that soft snow. The team behind them, the dogs will have less snow to have to pack down. And also a big difference is that the, the runners of the second sled will be sitting right on these hard packed tracks that Aaron Burmeister is laying down. But uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, that Thomas is laying down. So it is an advantage to be right behind him. Um, if Thomas can get some distance ahead of Aaron, you might get some new snow in there and kind of erase whatever trail he put in, especially if there's any wind. So I would be thinking about that as well, maybe getting a little bit of a lead on, on Aaron to, if that trail is in the type of terrain and conditions that it will get worse behind him. So it's, it's a tough situation that Thomas is in, but it's the situation everybody wishes they were in. Having the fastest team, having the strongest team, having the best rested team, and also leaving in the lead from Caltag. This is a dream situation that a musher will spend their entire life to try to give themselves this opportunity right here. And just before leaving Caltech, we got a hold of Thomas, who thinks his team is pretty mentally strong. Well, it's all downhill from here, Thomas. So what do you think, man? Are you in pretty good shape? How do you like your chances right now? Well, I feel like I've, uh, the team is uh, mentally really high up. They've been high the whole race, actually. Of course, it's more slow going now, but my dogs are pretty used to going slow. I've been training with uh, 120 pounds of concrete and then all the gear in the sled. So that's perfect for this kind of conditions. So they're used to pulling. So the pulling, the heavy trail doesn't affect them mentally. Of course they get tired in the muscles, but you know, that's normal. How do you feel after your nap? Are you energized? Yeah, I'm very lucky because I have a lot of energy. My wife is not so, Always, uh, I think that's good. <laughs> she thinks that's uh, bad sometimes. But I'm, uh, I'm a little lucky with my jeans this way. Uh, I don't get that tired. Do you feel like right now you have to make a mistake to lose this race? I feel that I will just continue what I'm doing. And that's driving the team and uh, looking at them and keeping my eye on the mental part of it. I only look for the mental on the dogs. The physical I'm not to worry about, but when you see them going down mentally, that's when you have to rest. But they haven't been down yet, so I've been lucky. Dallas, um, I know that Thomas has uh, been uh, uh, he's, uh, um, training up in the Sinfjell Mountains a lot and is uh, used to breaking trails, to have a deep snow and everything. How do you think that impacts uh, comparing to the, the Alaskan mushers that are living in the Willow area? It's more flat, maybe. I don't know how the... Uh, have you had much of snow in uh, this year in, in Willow? Yes. I, first of all, I think Thomas's training conditions have been pretty ideal for this Iditarod. Yeah. I think the softer snow that they've had throughout the way ha has really you know, been a, a benefit to Thomas. It's a trail that his dogs are well prepared for. Uh, Alaska has had a lot of snow this year, and a lot of the mushers have been contending with that. Uh, and I think throughout the year, many of them thought it was almost frustrating because they were constantly having to break trail. Um, I think they're going to be grateful for that now. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, let's look at the mushers that are around Thomas in this race. We have Jesse Royer, who trained in, Mon trains in Montana quite a bit, and then up in Two River, I'm sorry, uh, up in, yeah, Nenana, Two Rivers area, if I'm not mistaken. That is a little bit of a flatter area. I'm not super familiar with it. 
Aaron trains in Nenana. I know it's a little bit flatter there. Brent Sass, I know he trains all over the place. He's probably well uh, accustomed to the hills and all. So at this point, I think the most important thing is that the dogs have had a lot of training in soft snow. And as it happens, I think this year, most everybody has kind of uh, been used to that. So this one year, I think everybody's used to it. But if you look back over the last many years, genetically speaking, the dogs that these mushers have chosen to breed, I think Thomas's team has probably been selected for many, many years for dogs that are better in softer snow and steep hills because that's where he lives. Probably more so than Aaron Burmeister who lives in a flatter area that doesn't see so much snow. So I think he does have an advantage, not just from this year's training, uh, but over just the type of dogs that are really succeed in the Norwegian races. Yeah. And we'll also look at Pete Kaiser getting into Caltag. All right, Pete coming in here. Pete actually had one of the slower run times over to Caltag with six hours and 16 minutes um, coming in here. That's not a not necessarily a bad thing if the team settles in and just trucks along. He has a little bit smaller team than some. He has 10 dogs in his team, but Pete's not afraid to work. You know, he, he can pedal and ski pole and help these dogs out. He's also a smaller guy, which is less weight the dogs have to carry. Uh, the team's looking good. Bruce and Greg mentioned this team specifically, that they look sharp coming in here. And so I really think that there's a few factors. One is, you know, their, their top end speed, but another one is sustainability. And when I see this team coming here to park, this looks like a team that's been running at a sustainable pace. Um, so that's, those fast teams have to be careful. They go too fast by just a little bit on one run, and their speed is much slower on the next run. So I think Pete's going to be very steady. Um, and maybe we even see him speed up, certainly speed up relative to the other teams as they go down the trail. So Pete's not out of this. He is an Iditarod champion. He won this thing last year. We know that he's got great dogs. Uh, but I do think that this softer snow may have been a, a little bit harder for him because I do think, genetically speaking, his dogs are accustomed to running on faster trails, flatter trails, oftentimes very icy. He's had tremendous success in a very fast mid-distance race that we have in Alaska, the Kuskokwim 300, having won that race five times, and it's the most competitive mid-distance race in the state. So I think he's had good training conditions this year for soft snow, but if you look at the, the type of dog team that he runs, I think they do better in faster trails. So Pete's in a good spot. Um, he's definitely gonna be a competitor. He may or may not end up winning this thing, but I think he's gonna stay near the top I don't think he's going to drift back too far, if any. I, I think we're going to see him in the top five. I think that would be a safe bet. But uh, this slower run time does scare me a little bit. At six hours and 16 minutes, he is a bit slower than everybody else. It could be one off run. I'm curious to see how long he ends up resting here. That's going to tell me if he thinks that he can get that speed back. If he stays for just a short run and get back on the trail, that says that He's committed to being a little bit slower. He's just going to take a little bit less rest, and his team can march the rest of the way. If he takes a longer rest, I think it tells us that he thinks he can get some speed back into his team. Let's hear what Pete Kaiser has to say in Caltech. Hey, so, uh, you know, being in Caltech, it's getting to be a pretty full lot. What's your, uh, what's your plan right now? I'm going to take our eight and see what the next run brings us, I guess. Not, not a whole lot of thought process going into it right now. Just, I gotta get some sleep. I haven't had any real sleep since Dakota, so I'm feeling a little fried right now. I need to. I understand. Get hey, a four or five hour nap. There you go. So why is it wait. important to rest your body for these dogs and this team? Well, you're taking care of them, so if you're beat down, it's hard to take care of them. So it'd be good to get a, more than a 45 minute nap here and. Hopefully we feel better when we take off, so that's the plan. He seemed uh, pretty tired there, Pete. Uh, can this affect <laughs> his, uh, his run time as well? It can. Um, if the musher is starting to fall asleep on the sled, um, you know, their, their sled's going to be swerving off into the softer snow conditions, and it can definitely make it a little bit harder for the dogs. You know, I have misspoken there a minute ago because I'd forgotten he hasn't taken his eight yet, so he is doing a little bit of a push into his mandatory eight. So it's fine that his run time's a little, little bit slower. He's gonna get a boost off of that. On the flip side though, 
he's got to stay here for eight hours. That's going to put him a, a ways behind these other guys. Um, going to move him back in the ranks a little bit. I still think he's a contender, though, and I think his dog team, the way that they looked, you know, alert and really kind of charging when it was time to park the team. I think this is a dog team that's going to get a big boost off that eight-hour mandatory. The slower speed that they have coming in there, uh, I think is less important, obviously, now that they're going to have their eight-hour rest. This is a team that that eight-hour rest will hugely benefit, in my opinion. We'll also take a closer look at Brandt Sess. Improvement following the team versus breaking it, or was it? Nah. Well, I mean, when I was breaking it the first time, there was no sun machine track or anything, so it was like no one non existent. That's why I stopped. I was like, this is stupid. I mean, I don't need to be breaking this trail right now, you know? So that's why I stopped just out of out of Nilato and just figured someone's gonna come along and there's probably gonna be a snow machine that comes along too. You guys. So 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 I just pulled over and fed them and it was way better then. Then there's a trail, you know, but it was just drifted hard and it was like they didn't they were just kinda like doing this because they were already six hours into the run and as it was so no, it, yeah, they did great once we, once we had a trail, it was fine. I mean, it's you're not making rocket speed, that's for sure, but... You can at least see where you're going. You, you, you don't have to be g and and ha them, that's the thing. Like, for a while, it was like, they didn't, because there's a bunch of different snow machine tracks, and some are harder than others, and some there was none, there was none in a lot of places, so... It just kept getting worse, and I was like, I can either battle this, or I can just feed them and <laughs> they enjoy that a lot more than than battling it I'll tell you that right now didn't you yeah it was good it was a good decision I've made the bad decision on that run or the run from Galena to Lotto the last time and that was the beginning of the issues for me so you gotta learn something at some point that was, that was the lesson we lost three hours but it was well worth it so he didn't want to break the trail. Is that a good strategy? Yeah, no, I mean, this was probably the single best move that Brent Sass had made this entire race, to be perfectly honest. You know, going into this race, we we talked to Brent Sass a couple times. Um, you know, he's taken a break from the Iditarod and kind of re reevaluated how he was racing dogs and kind of his perspective on it. And I was really excited to see Brent Sass race the Iditarod this year and see, see what the new Brent Sass is like. And what we saw him do today was, the, I think, the right thing. And it's a mistake he would have made three or four years ago, and he didn't make it today. So I think when he looks back at this race and you know, pinpoints the best move he made, it will be that stop right there. And it's that willingness to lose three hours, but for the sake of building the team. He will get that three hours back and more by the time he reaches the finish line. So I think that was a brilliant move. Um, you know, he, he, he made a little gamble. He tried to do the river in two runs instead of three runs like most of the teams. Uh, it started out working pretty well. He got caught by the bad weather. It slowed the trail down. And instead of trying to force it, instead of trying to push through those conditions and tiring out his team, he uh, adjusted. He adapted. He did the right thing for the team. Now he's sitting in Caltech, and he's going to have a pretty nice-looking dog team leaving Caltech. They had a three-hour break, uh, only about 20 miles, 25 miles before Cal Caltech. And then when they reached Caltech, he took his mandatory eight. Here we see him going through Galena, and he had a, a great-looking team. This is where he didn't stop and then continued down the trail to rest out on the, on the river. So I think that was a great move on Brent's part. It wasn't planned. He got thrown a curveball, and he reacted perfectly. And Greg Heister also got the hold of Brandt Sess. He left Mulatto and stopped. That yeah. Was the original plan or? It was in the plan. I mean, okay. when I when I pulled through Mulatto, I made a point of going and getting a whole meal and heat. Yeah. And uh, and I knew, because I'd already come five hours from my camp spot, and if I would have done all the way to here, that's looking at more like 10. Oh, yeah. I didn't know how the trail was going to be. And I got down there a little ways, and I could see that it wasn't going to be like a yeah. smooth Yukon River Trail. Yeah. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't going to be smooth. So I just pulled over and they ate like that. So it was totally worth it. Yeah. I got another meal in them and yeah. You told me in Anchorage when we sat down that you're the new and improved Brent Sass and that you're going to be patient for all of these things. And I have to be honest, I had a lot of mushers tell me that. So congratulations <laughs> to you that for right following there. through. Exactly. Right? That was, that was, I mean, in 2016, that was the beginning of 
of some of my problems I, on my run from Galena to Nulato. Yeah. I, I pushed and the run got really long and the dogs paid for it. And so this time I was like, nope, pull over. <laughs> and they ate just like that. And it just brings a smile to your face. And it was three hours. Doesn't matter right now. It doesn't. It just doesn't matter right now. You're taking your eight hours. Thomas Reiner just pulled in. Yep. He's taking his eight hours. Yep. So time wise, when he leaves, he's he's going to be in the lead. He is. You are right with him. I'm happy with that. <laughs> Look at this weather. <laughs> I'd much rather have somebody else in the lead than myself. I already proved that. I'd, yeah. I'd just be pulling over probably. I mean, right now is not the time to be in the lead as far as I'm concerned. I think he knows that too. But um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, I'm I'm totally fine with that. Um, I really wanted to get here for my eight. I think it's a great springboard, especially with the weather and what stuff ahead. Uh, this long rest will do them some good. And they got an extra three hours back there on the trail. So, and I'm still here, you know, in, in the hunt. So I'm happy with it. I asked Jesse the same question. This has got to be incredibly fun for the fans because everybody's so close and so many great dog teams. I'm wondering how much fun it is for you in the heat of the battle. Is it stressful? Uh, it's not too stressful only because it will get stressful. I think yeah. later on down right now, I'm still doing a good job of not caring too much about what they're doing, yeah. focusing on my team. But I think as we get closer <laughs> to the coast, the, the nerves will come and be like, well, we're, we're in, you know, we're almost to where we start racing in my head, you know? And so the goal was to get a dog team that could race to, to that point. And, they're doing, they're doing good. I mean, eating like they just ate, there isn't a kibble left in any of those bowls and they just ravaged it, so. Yeah, they're standing up. Yeah, I mean, they're moving around. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. And it just, it just drives home that that move back there was the right, was the right move, uh, so. So uh, where is Brent uh, now uh, in, on the ranking? No, he's, he's getting very close to being able to leave the uh, Caltag checkpoint after having completed his mandatory eight-hour layover. He's going to be on the trail here soon. But he's right. This is, you don't need to be in the lead yet. It's too early. I mean, yeah, it's great if you have, like, like Thomas Warner, if you have the fastest team and you also get to be in the lead, that's great. But the most important thing is to have the strongest team. And I'm not convinced that... Um, when Brent Sass leaves this checkpoint that he's not going to have the strongest team. He may start to outrun Thomas and start to reel him in. I think Brent is probably the person that Thomas should be most concerned about right now. I still think Thomas's position is better, but I think Brent is the, the most likely musher to be able to challenge him on the trail coming up. So, uh, yeah, Brent made a great move there. Like he said, he gave up time. And I, I'm watching this kind of uh, internal struggle play out in Brent's ass to give up that time. He is very focused on racing. But the key thing is make the race as easy as possible for the dogs. That's the most important thing. Never make it too difficult. Never make a big challenge. Um, and that's what he did. He took a situation that would have been perhaps, you know, more race focused move which would have been to push all the way through to caltag and keep you know and not lose that three hours but instead he changed it into what's the easiest thing for the dogs like he said they got another good meal they had an easy run over to caltag now they're going to take a long rest i i know at least one of the races that i've won the the best move that i made in the entire race is where i did almost the exact same thing between you know coming down the down the river there and decided to throw another rest in because the trail was tough and at the time I thought you know what I'm giving up on the race I'm not going to win this one if I do this but this is what the team needs right now and down the trail another day or two it was pretty clear that that was the best possible decision I could have made for the race I think Brent's going to feel the same way when he reaches the finish line. Another musher that got into Caltech earlier uh, is uh, Aaron Burmeister. Aaron came in here with a nice run time, but not the fastest run time. You know, he was moving nicely, nice looking dog team. It took him six hours and one minute to get here um, from the Nolato checkpoint. You know, Aaron's dogs are also pretty accustomed to just kind of trucking along. I think uh, they feel very comfortable with these slower speeds. You know, Aaron has traditionally been one of the mushers that moves a little bit slower on the trail, but uh, can go for very long distances at a time. So I don't think his dogs are going to get mentally frustrated with the slower speeds. He has done a better job than I've ever seen him do before on the Iditarod about keeping his speed. And he's been traveling nicely. He's been giving his dogs lots of rest. So he's definitely still a contender here. But um, 
you know, maybe we're going to see a new Aaron Burmeister this year. I don't know. But I feel like if Aaron was going to be able to win this race, he would need to have a little more of a lead at this point because I don't see him as the speed team that's going to be able to compete with um, Brent Sass and Thomas Werner if they're right there with him. So um, I'm not, uh, I certainly can't count him out. He's got a nice dog team. He's got a bunch of sled dogs here that are looking good. 12 dog team coming in here. He had a respectable run time over here. He's obviously a very experienced musher, but I don't think he has the best position right now. Uh, but I do think it's helpful for him to get to follow Thomas over to Unicleat. Aaron's another musher that we may see try to go all the way to Unicleat um, and try to get a little bit of a lead and just try to outmarch the other teams. I don't know. It, Aaron has a couple different plays right now, and I would be curious to see how he thinks he has a chance to win this race. And uh, while still being in Caltech, we also got an interview with Aaron. Not my cup of tea. We don't know the kind of the warm weather at all. The dogs aren't. We've been in 20 to 40 below all winter, so this isn't our our type of conditions at all. Dogs just tend to walk through it, and we get there, but they're just walking slow and hot. So it's it'd be much more convenient, but if it cooled down. I'd much rather have 30 below temperatures than 30 above any day, and today is close to 40. It is a pretty warm uh, day out there. Yes, it is, and uh, Aaron's dogs are accustomed to much colder temperatures, like he's saying. He lives near Fairbanks up in Nenana, and it does tend to be very cold in that area. And traditionally, that's an area that has very cold temperatures and not a ton of snow. They do have some snow. It's almost always enough to mush, but it's not common for there to be feet upon feet of snow, like maybe in Trapper Creek, Alaska, or uh, where some of these other mushers are from. So Aaron, it's really important. He's putting a lot of emphasis on the temperature. It probably is a very big factor for his team. So what I could see him doing is doing a much longer run tonight when it is cooler and trying to take a longer rest tomorrow. That might be, that might go into his plan here. We may see him try to run, maybe not all the way to Unicleat, but do a big chunk of that trail tonight uh, just to run as long as possible when it's cool. You may also see him take a very short break to try to complete that run before the sun comes up. I'm not sure what Aaron's gonna do exactly, but this warmer temperatures and deep snow is probably not playing to his favor at this point. Aaron is the one chasing Thomas uh, Werner out there. Turn ahead, guys. Turn ahead. Yep, yep, he's right on his heels. He left, I think, only one or two minutes behind Thomas. Thomas had a little bit longer rest. I think he stayed there about 4.47. If I remember correctly, uh, Aaron was there about 20 minutes less than Thomas, took a little bit shorter break, and followed him right out, which tells me uh, that Aaron wanted to be behind Thomas, uh, wanted to just follow his tracks out there. Probably a good play. Um, I again, I think that Aaron's going to want to maximize the cooler evening temperatures as much as possible. I think it's much more important for his team than some of the other teams in this race. Another musher we'll have a look at who arrived in Caltech earlier is Wade Mars. So Wade had a good run coming over here. Um, he actually had a really fast run time going over to, uh, um, I believe it was Galena, and then over to Nolato. He had a, a good run over there. He's been moving along pretty well. He did break this up into two runs on the Yukon River. I think he was the only one that did it in two runs here, so a little bit longer haul. Uh, you know, Wade's an accomplished musher. He knows what he's doing. He, he did this run in six hours and four minutes, uh, pretty much the same time as Aaron Burmeister. But he also was coming off of uh, not a very long, well, a, just less rest, I guess would be the way to put it. Uh, Wade stopped one time between Galena and Nulato, so he just did a much longer run coming over here, and his speed was the same as Aaron's. So Wade is kind of making a move. He's kind of moving up the ranks here. Um, he's completed his eight-hour mandatory rest. I think we're going to see him take a slightly longer rest than some of the other mushers here, 
because he did just do a rather long trip with the dogs. He's still running 12 dogs, which is a plenty big dog team at this point in the race. And Wade's not afraid to, to pedal and ski pole and work alongside the sled. He's a pretty athletic guy. So that does help um, help him in this next section of trail if it is going to be deeper snow, climbing up the hills, getting up into the kind of the valley up there. I think he's going to be doing a lot of running. I can see the ski poles sticking out the, the back of his sled. He's probably been using those a fair bit along the way. So I think Wade's in a good spot to have another solid finish this year. The question is going to be, did this these did these two longer runs that he just did in some difficult snow conditions, difficult trail conditions, did that take a lot out of his team? And uh, let's hear what Wade has to say about the race. You should have ran quite a bit faster than me coming off the rest. These guys are pumping it out. It's a surprising little dog team, I think. That was, well, that was the longest run of our race, so they kept their speed decent. And they didn't like me working either. Every time I started working, they looked back like, what do you think, we need help or something? I'm like, okay, I'll sit back down. They just speed up a little bit whenever I sat down, so <laughs> I don't know, maybe the plastic was better on the back. <laughs> so his team speeded up when he sat down? <laughs> you can you can see that a couple in a couple conditions for sure. One is of course when it's really windy, but if you got to be careful when you're pedaling and ski pulling because if you push too hard, it can actually create slack in the tow line. And what, from the dog's perspective, and you always have to look at it from the dog's perspective, they're leaning into the harness, they're pulling, there's steady pressure, and then all of a sudden what they're leaning on gives way, and they almost fall forward just a little bit. And then when the musher's foot comes off the ground, the sled slides back, it kind of tugs the dog back again. So you have to be really careful on how you help the dogs. And in some conditions, it's really hard to put even pressure on the snow with your foot because it's a softer trail. So I've definitely seen that with the dogs where, um, you know, it's, it's easier for them if you just sit down and be quiet and let them do their job. And it seems like that was the case here. He said something important there, and that is this team's really coming together. And I think he's absolutely right. That was one of the longest or the, the longest run that he's done in the race. Um, and they seem to have come off it very well. The question again is going to be how does that affect this team tomorrow? You know, did they power through it today and are they going to be slower tomorrow? Or did they cruise through it today and look, are they going to look exactly the same tomorrow? Which is of course what he hopes to see. Now, so he will be taking his eighth during the night. I believe he has already accomplished his eight hour mandatory layover, having taken that uh, back in the Ruby checkpoint, the first place that he could take it. So he took his mandatory eight in Ruby. He then went through Galena and stopped and rested for quite a long rest. He stayed for five and a half hours. And then he left that camping place and ran all the way here to Caltech. Um, now he is gonna owe these dogs a significant rest, having just done those two long runs but he's in a pretty good position and he certainly has moved up in the ranks having done the Yukon River with just that five and a half hour break plus whatever he takes here in Caltag. Now we will hear from Ryan Reddington. Trail. Well, not much going on a little bit, but uh, we're not used to going this slow ever, you know, but we're, we're going forward. Do you think the trail was about the same as it was for everybody, or? Uh, I don't know on that. It was snowing good when Pete left, so I'm not sure. We stayed longer, you know, we rested longer, though. but I don't think it was a good trail for any of us. You still using that Henry up there? Oh yeah, he hasn't been out of lead yet. He's never, he doesn't mind this kind of trail breaking at all, huh? No, he's, he's really good. He's the heart of the team. Uh, yeah, I just need 13 others like him. <laughs> but, yeah, he's a good one. There's a lot of people that, in Galena that went out on the trail and watched in the race. And they came back in and they were asking me if they want to know who that dog was. Tell me about that lead, that brown lead dog. It was 
pretty special dog. Well, you, you see him from behind, but when you see him coming at you, he almost looks like he's smiling, you know, yeah. like he's just telling him. Yeah, yeah, he, I bred to him uh, on the drive up here. I'm excited to get, get his pups. Everyone in that litter is leaders. So nobody left here yet, huh? Not yet. Everybody's here. <laughs> thirty below to thirty above. You got you got rain gear. I got an anorak. Yeah, it's pretty pretty good. And I could see a smile on Ryan's face when he heard that no one had left the Caltech at that point. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's probably some welcome news there. You know, Ryan's got a really, really good team here. Uh, he had a good run over, I mean, all the way up the river here. He took his eight-hour mandatory rest in Galena. He then had about a seven-hour and ten-minute run over to Nalato, where he took a, a short four-hour break. And then coming over to Caltag, it was 7.46. Uh, I'm sorry, 5.46, making him about a little bit less than 15 minutes slower than Thomas Werner. But he had a very good run time, outran many of the other teams. Uh, Ryan's one of the mushers that I think this, this softer trail condition is not going to help. Ryan's been, uh, he has a very fast team. We've seen him post some of the fastest run times throughout the race, or maybe not the fastest every time, but consistently one of the fastest. And I think that's even better. Rather than burning up all the speed on any one run, he's just steadily putting good run times back. Um, but I do think that I, I don't know 100%. I know he trains his teams faster. We saw him in the Bear Grease have a very good race earlier this winter. And so I think he's one that would prefer to have a speedier trail. But he's certainly handling this softer trail at this point very, very well. And his dogs don't seem to be phased by it. I do know that in a soft trail like they have now and like they're supposed to have for the remainder of the race, this is prime conditions for the faster teams to make up a lot of time. Generally speaking, the worse the trail, the more time you can make up with a fresh dog team. So if Ryan's team is you know, well rested, they're able to do these faster run times, we could see him make up quite a bit of time on, say, maybe somebody like Aaron Burmeister, who has a little bit slower team at this point. Uh, of course, Aaron just, uh, you know, well, Aaron, we'll, we'll see. He has the ability to do some pretty dang long hauls. So Ryan's in a good spot here. Ryan's in a good spot. You know, he may not end up winning this race, but I think he's probably going to have his best finish yet. And earlier we've seen uh, Ryan Reddington and Juad Ulsum racing pretty close together. We also got an interview with Juad. All right, we're good. So how was the trail where you were versus the front runners? Was it slicker, better slide than 30 below snow or breaking trail? It wasn't much trail breaking, no, it was just soft and snowing and sleeting and all the good stuff. <laughs> and the dogs look really pretty strong coming in, so it, it, they don't really get hurt at those speeds and stuff. It's just steady pulling. Right? It's just six miles an hour, you know. Not much happening. <laughs> so we noticed you had that great dog Dodge up front. He's back in single lead again. He's doing good. But he doesn't lead in training, huh? He does, but he's not the too old to lead her. And luckily, I mean, last year he stepped up and he just got better and better as a leader. And this year he's back at it, so that's good. So how do you look at running this race now with this weather and just starting up the coast in your position? And how are you, what are you thinking? Because I know you're thinking up ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got lots of strong teams around me and ahead of me and behind me. So I think I'll just try and maintain my position or just, you know, keep trucking along and go down the trail. But... <coughs> As far as what's going to happen on the coast here, we'll we're gonna have a lot of snow and a lot of weather, so we'll see what, what that does to things, but hopefully not too bad. You're in striking this. I mean, yeah. Hopefully we can just keep doing what we have been doing, you know? And Dallas, how is uh, UI positioning himself uh, right now? 
You know, uh, first of all, I just got to say, we've got so many good teams right together. And it's almost like we're saying the same thing about each team here, but they really are close together and very similarly matched, which means any of these mushers could, I mean, this could shake out any way. You could take the top 10, put them in a bucket, shake it up and dump it out, and it can come out any random way. Uh, and it's just as likely as the next direction. The only one I see kind of that I can put a little bit ahead of the others is Thomas. I like Brent's position. You know, everybody else, they're so close together that one little mistake is going to make a big difference. Any of these mushers that are, aren't running at a pace that's fully sustainable for their team might fall to the back of that top 10, but it's a close race. That being said, you are, I think, is one of the best mushers on this trail for managing a team and really kind of finding that sweet spot, exactly what the team can do, holding a speed. We've seen a super consistent career out of this guy. He's always right there between seventh and first every single time. So I think he's in a good spot. You know, he had a very similar run time with Ryan Reddington. They were right together coming over there. UR has a 10 dog team coming into Caltag. Um, he's had, again, just like Ryan, one of the good run times, never really the fastest, but definitely not the slowest. He's always right there. And that tells me that what he's doing is sustainable and steady for his team. We saw him here um, coming into Galena earlier in the race where he took his mandatory eight hour rest. I think Galena was a, a good choice. Um, it's kind of you know, midway down the Yukon River. So they haven't, you know, it's more, the, he's had his eight hour rest more recently than Thomas and Aaron who took it at the first available spot there in Ruby. Same with Wade Mars that took it earlier. So those little factors like where on the Yukon River the musher took their mandatory eight, that's going to make a difference as they face the next 350 miles trail and, you know, ultimately getting to that finish line in Nome particularly if this last stretch of trail is challenging like it looks like it's going to be. So UR has positioned himself to where he's still in this race. He's still competing. He hasn't made any major mistakes throughout this entire race. He's in a strong position, not in the best position, but in a strong position like all these other mushers in Caltag. So I would always bet on your when in doubt. Um, I would guess that we're going to see your move up the ranks from where he is right now, not back. I think he has, um, I think he has the ability to move up, and that's far more likely. Sometimes the snow condition make, uh, can make the trail actually faster. We talked to Bruce in Caltag. So I was just talking to Jesse Royer here in Caltag about the snow and if it was affecting the progress of the teams at all. And Jesse made a great observation that I kind of wondered about anyway, and that is that the snow temperature is such that it's actually making the trail faster, slicker. And what happens is, like even here, if you take your boot and you slide it back and forth on this surface, it becomes smooth and is actually now feels like a slick icy surface whereas before they were traveling on snow that was 30 below and it was like dragging a sled through sand just gripping the runner so for her it actually felt like the dogs were moving a, with a little less effort and i think that's going to be the case as they head on out of here up into the pass towards a woman so uh, now it's getting later it's getting dark uh, do you think the trail will continue to be this way you know, the trail is going to stay damp for some amount of time. You know, when we saw the interview with Ryan Reddington a little bit ago, you saw that the, the snow had pretty much turned to rain. It was very, very wet. This is going to be that kind of, I mean, with this much moisture in the snow, any tracks over it is going to pack it down a little bit. So I think the trail over to Unilocleet is probably going to get better and better as they go along. We're looking at live footage from the Caltag checkpoint here. It's still coming down. That seems to be a kind of a wet, heavy snow. It's going to, I mean, you look at the sleds in the background there, and it's accumulating, and it's sticking to those sleds. But as Bruce was illustrating, this is a nice, slippery snow. It's going to be a little bit of resistance for the teams that have to pack it down. But I think this could be a bit of a game changer. I mean, again, we have so many teams so close together, both in kind of the strength of the team and also in the actual position in the race, that one team or two or three teams that go over this and have a little bit harder time packing it down, the amount of energy that that'll take off their team could make the difference. And then we see mushers like Ryan Reddington and UR Olsum in seventh and eighth position coming into the Caltag checkpoint. If they get to run on a trail that several mushers have been over, it's slippery snow, it's packed down, 
we could see a significant difference in run time if they do the trail quicker and it's easier for the dogs, they then owe their dogs less rest. If Thomas, for example, is out in front, has to work harder, maybe he runs for six hours, he's gonna owe those dogs a longer rest as well as that time that he lost traveling. So this is where you know the situation can compound and make it harder and harder. But the weather is always an element. It's always something the mushers are adjusting to. Sometimes you find yourself in Caltag in the lead and it's a trail that you have a huge advantage for being in the lead. Other times you get there in the lead and it's a huge disadvantage because you have to now break through you know, inches or even feet of snow out there. A musher who keeps gathering awards along the trail is Jesse Royer. Remember how to tell you guys to get back over on the other trail, not the snow machine trail, huh? Yeah, you guys are good boys. Good boys. Did it make much difference when you passed Brent? Was Brent helping at all, or it was gone so quick? I, I didn't see any of his tracks, really. It was all blown in. Hey, guys. Hi, guys. Yeah, I asked him if he was all right. You know, he said, yeah. Hey. Dusty, Richard, the checker here. All right. And uh, first team into Caltag this year. We have a presentation <laughs> from right. Adam wow. Posh from Bristol Bay Native Corporation. That's awesome. For the first team off the Yukon in the Caltag. And boy, is it nice to be off the Yukon. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Thank on, you. On behalf of Bristol Bay Native Corporation, and it's more than 10,000 shareholders, we'd like to congratulate you on being the first <laughs> musher to Caltag, Alaska. It's my privilege to present you, Jesse Royer, with the 2020 Bristol Bay Native Corporation Fish First Award, along with $2,000 wow. and 25 <laughs> pounds of Bristol Bay salmon. Congratulations. I should have been first a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. And uh, so she, she got another award along the trail there. This is the fourth for her on this race. Um, and again, going into this race, I believe she had never won an award for being first to, the check, first to a checkpoint along the way, and now she's got four of them. So she's doing a, a fantastic job out there. I would be a little bit concerned, um, just statistically speaking, being in front for that much of the race. Now, she has kind of peaked and been in front at just the right time. For example, Brent Sass was leading just 25 miles prior to this, and she pops out in front, gets the award, and then Thomas Warder is the one that leads out of this checkpoint. So she was in the lead at just the right moment. Um, early on in this race, she was in lead for quite a bit of the race. Uh, so anyway, we have also seen that, you know, Traditionally, the mushers who win a lot of the, the first to a checkpoint award have just been holding a fast pace the whole time and it can be detrimental to them. We've also seen mushers that have taken off strong, led the entire way, won every award along the way, and then won the race at the finish as well. So uh, it's fun to look at the numbers, but I don't think that uh, really makes a big difference for the final result. She is going to have some fantastic uh, salmon there for the rest of the year. And of course, another $2,000 to stick in her pocket here for her hard work out there. And uh, Dallas, can you update us on the map? Absolutely. Let's take a look at this map. So Thomas Warner is out on the trail leading this race. Um, he's got a pretty good gap between him and Aaron Burmeister. Remember that they left the checkpoint only minutes apart. Now there sometimes is a you know, discrepancy in the GPS's when they update. Thomas Warner stayed at the last checkpoint of Caltag for four hours and 47 minutes after just a five and a half hour run to reach that checkpoint. That is to say, he had a fairly quick run time over to the checkpoint, a fairly short run, took a nice long rest. He's banking on that speed. As we drift back down the trail, we're going to find Aaron Burmeister coming along. Aaron was about 30 minutes slower on the previous run coming over to Caltag. He then took about 20 minutes less rest than Thomas Werner and is out on the trail right now moving along. Both Thomas and Aaron have 12 dogs in their team. When we drift back into third place, we find Jessie Royer and all her awards that she's collected along the way so far. She had a five hour and 55 minute run time to reach the Caltag checkpoint, but then she logged a full eight hours at the Caltag checkpoint where she took her mandatory rest there. She has 13 dogs in her team and is probably making up a little bit of time on Aaron in front of her, who looks to have left um, 
left uh, about 12 minutes before her in the last checkpoint. Now, just out of the Caltag checkpoint here, we have Wade Mars in fourth position and Brent Sass in fifth position. Wade Mars stayed at the checkpoint for five hours and seven minutes after doing a run of about six hours to get, actually his run was a little bit longer because he came from even before the last checkpoint. Um, Brent Sass stayed for his eight hour mandatory rest in Caltag uh, and left with 13 dogs. Wade Mars has 12 dogs in his team. Now we've talked a lot about uh, Caltech because that's where it all uh, happens. But let's move back a little bit to the 12th checkpoint of Galena. And at the Galena checkpoint, uh, we got to talk to Matthew Failer about his relation to his dogs. <laughs> Hi. To me, the you know the whole point about the sport is, of going down on Iditarod is is you get to do it with your best buds. You, these are your best friends. I mean, I spend every day with mine. I've got a, a small crew that that helps me, but um, at at the end of the day, these are my teammates and. Um, we, uh, we go through this together. Um, Iditarod is an awesome event. It's not always like, uh, it's not always sunshine and rainbows every day. You know, it's a hard event. It's, 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 um, challenging and, uh, but that's what makes it rewarding. You know, nothing good comes easy. And it's one of the things that, that the dogs and I, I think, it makes our it makes our relationship even better because we go through something so difficult we come through the other side um, and that that deepens this this relationship um, this is foxy yeah foxy has really stepped up uh this year as a four-year-old um, she's been running in lead most of this race we've been rotating her around but she ran in lead in the copper basin and it's foxy brown you in meditation mode uh -huh. um they're yeah they're they're an awesome it's an awesome breed i can't say enough about them from a like nobody cares that if this dog is black and white and has slightly floppy ears their their heart is amazing you know they're uh they're just stronger in so many ways than so many other types of dogs and people um and then to work as a team and go through all of these variables is just unreal. We had a crazy storm in the beginning of the race. Pretty uneventful, like smooth trail to this point, but now it's 30 degrees and raining and we'll walk out of here and kind of handle with whatever is thrown at us and, and continue on. I mean, anytime you find a good lead dog, it's, without leaders, the, the team won't go, I mean, all of these dogs want to run, but the, the bottom line is some of them are not the greatest in lead. We try, we try to get them to become leaders by teaching them and putting them in positions to succeed, but at the end of the day, some are just better at it than others. And um, yeah, for whatever reason, she's taken to it. She really likes it up front. Um, she's a heavily coated dog, a dark coated dog. And so sometimes if it's really warm out, I don't put her in lead all the time, but We'll give her a shot today. She really likes it when it's like 30, 40 below. She was running in the copper basin at 60 below zero and no problem. <laughs> I was freezing, but she was just like, 
So totally in her element, you know, completely covered from, from the cold. And Dallas, have you seen any Siberian Huskies uh, during this side of the road, or is it only Alaskan Huskies? Uh, you know, I have not seen any Siberians in this one. I, I don't believe we have any all Siberian teams in this race. Um, you know, it's more common for the Alaskan Huskies in here, of course. Uh, we have seen many Siberian teams in the Iditarod over the past years, some of which having done very, very well in this race. But typically speaking, the mushers who race the Iditarod and are competitive in it, they're most interested in working with the, the very best athlete, the best possible dog, and they really don't care what the breed of the dog is. So there's not really any advantage to having a purebred Siberian team. If, for example, they had one good Siberian that made their team, I don't think any musher would hesitate to take that dog and race that dog. Um, uh, again, the, the breed of the dog doesn't make that much of a difference. What we're looking for is dogs that have the ability to do what we want to do at, or as excited to mush down the trail as we are and that are great athletes. That's what's fun to travel with. For me, I mean, the number one thing I want to see in a sled dog is I want drive. I want a dog that is, ex is as excited to run down the trail as I am. That's what I'm looking for. They have a team that loves to do what we're doing. So that enthusiasm and drive is number one on my list of priorities, followed by athleticism and their ability to carry body fat and their tough feet and things like that. But first and foremost, they've got to want to do it. They've got to love to do it. If you give me that dog, I can work with them. I can train them. If they don't have that innate drive, that's not something you can train. That's not something that you can develop. If the dog doesn't want to really be out there, then he should be doing something that they do enjoy, recreational mushing or maybe catching a frisbee. And looking at Matthew Failer, how is he doing in the race? He's doing well. Um, he's a little bit farther back in the rankings here. He just took his mandatory eight-hour rest in Galena. He's got uh, not a huge team. He's got nine dogs, which is not enough to be scary just yet, but it's certainly something that the musher would have liked to have, you know, 11 or 12 at the Caltag checkpoint. Um, it really depends on which nine dogs it is. With the right nine dogs, he's in fine shape. Uh, I don't think Matthew Failer is going to be one that we're going to see in the very top of this year's race, but I do hope to see them have a good finishing portion of the race for that last, you know, last section of the Yukon River and then going up the coast. You know, this is a guy that has been doing well in the mid-distance races and still is really figuring out how the long distance I did around really, really works and finding his niche in there. I think he's a guy that we will see improve over the next couple of years and become a top contender. He did race farther up in this race earlier on, um, but he's making good time. He's moving down the trail, but not, not in striking distance for the lead. I think our, our top 10 mushers are, are starting to kind of get settled in and identified here. We might have 11 that are in contention for the top 10 spots, um, and we might see some changes there. But Matthew Failer, I don't think, is going to be one of them in the top 10. Another one in the Galena checkpoint, we chatted with uh, Tim Papas. I, I had a couple dogs that just were, were got, they got a little sore, so I just worked on massaging them. I got one, one of them with me here, and he's doing, doing really good now. Um, but a couple of them I, I sent home, so um, I just lost a little bit of power. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just kind of taking it easy, going to prioritize getting to know him. Yeah, it's not, it's not that helpful. Um, you know, it's warm enough that it's pretty slippery, but it's, it's also very wet and everything is completely saturated. So, um, you know, just trying to dry things out right now. I mean, my run here, we, I had a great time. Um, I was listening to some music and singing and ski poling like crazy and, you know, just staying active and staying upbeat. Keep these guys jazzed and, and continue on. At least the team is satisfied. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, some of these guys have probably had to reevaluate their priorities. Um, but Tim's run a pretty steady race, I think, most of the way here. Um, he's going to have a good finish as long as he does exactly what he says, focus on just taking care of the team, getting down the trail, and taking it one step at a time. I think that's the most important factor. You know, He's got uh, a really nice dog team out there, but is still getting more experience himself. So 
Hopefully these kind of learning experiences are going to continue to build him as a musher. And you have to do a couple races like that. You know, you've got you've to work your way up the ranks. You've got to be 20th and 15th and then 10th and then 5th. And then you've got a chance at first. It's a process. This is not something that you get to walk into, you know, and be a musher for two years and win the Iditarod. You know, we've been watching Jessie Royer, for example, up there. She's done, what, 15, 16, 18. I, don't, I mean, a ton of Iditarods. Aaron Burmeister, I think, is on his 18th Iditarod. I mean, these guys have done a lot of these things. It, they've paid their dues to be up in that top 10 group. All of those guys have. So I think Tim is another one we could see up there in a few years, but uh, not this year. Now, earlier we heard an interview from Ryan Reddington in Caltag, and here we'll have his brother, Robert Reddington, from Galena. Well, we got really wet and snow dumping, and I left my fog tog out. At home, yeah, I had the fog togs in my sled the last four years, and now I wish I had them. So I end up making a poncho out of the trash bag and wish I had a hood. So I got another trash bag and got the hood going on. Gulado's a outside checkpoint, so I want to keep. All the gear I have with me as dry as I can. So, um, we'll see. And then I think it's supposed to clear up. King Lee. And then, uh, King Lee. And then we'll, uh, stay dry for the coat. Let's see what, what goes on there. So he was actually using a garbage bag to dr stay dry. <laughs> yeah, that's actually not an uncommon uh, fashion statement on the Iditarod Trail. Obviously, these mushers go out there expecting it to be, you know, winter. <laughs> and early on in the Iditarod, when it was 30 below zero, if you had told them they'd be seeing rain later on, uh, maybe it'd be hard to believe that. Uh, he was talking about how leaving his frog togs behind is kind of like a almost not quite a disposable rain gear, but nearly it's you know small and light and packable. And many mushers do carry some sort of rain gear in their in their sled. Uh, we also heard one of the mushers talking about having their anorak that was pretty waterproof. Um, you know, I like having at least one layer, typically my anorak that goes over the top of everything, that does kind of double as a rain protection type layer. Uh, but I have mushed down the Iditarod in garbage bags. I think 2013 I had a full garbage bag suit as well. So uh, the, the hood, though, that's a new ad adapt adaptation to the garbage bag rain jacket. So I, I like seeing Robert Reddington getting creative there. He's got the hood to go with it. This is a whole new uh, design pattern we have going on here. Definitely. And uh, we also saw a rookie, Riley Dish, moving uh, up uh, in the slow, snowy trail to Galena. I mean, four, literally right out of Ruby, four miles an hour. Just like the second we hit the trail, wasn't even, didn't even have time for them to get slowed down. There's a paddle track snow machine had been through right ahead of me, and that just made it. It was just like the dogs were just up to their chests as soon as I left. I mean, four, literally right out of Ruby, four miles an hour. Just like the second we hit the trail, wasn't even, didn't even have time for them to get slowed down. There's a paddle track snow machine had been through right ahead of me and that just made it it was just like the dogs were just up to their chest as soon as I left the checkpoint and then we were out there I fed a meal halfway through but I didn't want to say stop for too long because it just kept getting deeper as <laughs> I was sitting there but they did made it and they did we good made it. that was not a not the seven hours that most people have been running it in prior to today and following that fashion statement, Riley also, but he's saying that he struggled a bit on the trail. 
Yeah, it can be a soft trail out there slowing down the teams. You know, and, and the trail does change, whether it's new snow that comes or even if the trail has started to set up and be a nice surface and then a snow machine or five snow machines pass you, they can oftentimes break up the surface that you're running on and now it's this deeper, sugarier snow. So it can constantly change. Uh, there's always an element the mushers are dealing with and facing. And that's why you have to adjust your plan, your schedule, and your expectations step by step. And again, the number one goal is just get through it easily. Make this trail as easy as possible for the teams or for your dog team, because if it's easy, they'll do it quickly. So he seems to be doing well. Riley's, uh, right now he's the th their third highest rookie in this race. Um, seems to be running a great race. I believe he has 11 dogs in his team. Uh, seems to be upbeat and happy. There's still a long ways to go. And so I think he's in a good position, and he's got to be having a, a great experience out there. He, he's doing a great job for a rookie on his first Iditarod, and this Iditarod has had a few challenges for the mushers out there. A lot of snow at the Galena checkpoint means a lot of work. We talked to one of the volunteers. Really a month or two before to um, make this dog yard here possible. We've had a lot, especially this winter, we've had a lot of deep snow. And so that took some maintenance to get out here with a snow machine and pack it, pack it, pack it. You don't want to, uh, the night before I did a rod shows up and say, oh, uh, I guess we're going to put them on the lake and there's four feet of loose powder out there and expect that to go well. That won't go well. And even now with the warm weather, we, it's getting gnarly out there, very punchy. But we started at least, <laughs> the leaders yesterday was a nice firm uh, dog yard, which otherwise would have been just loose snow. So it takes planning. It takes planning to put in the trails um, to get the dogs exactly uh, routed to this spot the way we want them to, which may not be on the normal uh, use snow machine trails in this town. And then when you come to race week, it's just a time of making sure things like, to me, I feel like a big part of my job is making sure that the sewer is not going to overflow in the community hall. I think that that's 50% of what I deem success in this race, uh, is that, that people can flush a toilet in our community hall and the checkpoint and have it reliably go away. That's a big victory to me. And we fill a, that sewer tank uh, with Iditarod quickly. So making arrangements to bring guys on overtime from the city to come pump out the sewer and make sure I know, just think about the logistics and the contingencies that might happen here. Well, I think there's a strong tradition in these villages of taking care of travelers and taking care of out-of-towners that might be visiting and try to put your best foot forward, show them some hospitality and show them that you respect what they're doing. And I think Iditarod is a great example of that. Iditarod used to really be centered on the villages. The first mushers were from the villages. And its legacy really comes from the villages. The dogs, the bloodlines come from the villages. A lot has changed and very few mushers are from the villages anymore, but I think this is still kind of a bit of living history for people here. They respect that it's still happening and that it comes to their town. And even if it's just to watch the leader come and go, people bring their kids and grandkids and make sure they see what a real dog team looks like these days, which is fleeting in this town and others because um, the snow machine has pretty well replaced the dog team at this point. We, we're down to our last team and, and they're even uh, edging towards retirement. So uh, Iditarod serves a great function for us of remembering our past. And uh, it must be a big responsibility for those making the trail to make sure that no mushers or dog teams get lost out there. Yeah, putting in the trail is very important, of course, you know, that's something the mushers spend a lot of time focusing on. But what these guys do in the checkpoint cannot, I mean, how important that is cannot be overstated. You know, they're out there putting the checkpoint in weeks in advance, you know, packing down the area that the dogs are going to be camped. Um, the Iditarod can really almost, I don't want to say be a burden, but it, it can be a burden on these small towns and villages. You know, we fly in all this supplies and that needs to be positioned and taken from the airport to the checkpoint, you know, packing down the place that the dogs are going to camp. You know, in that particular place, we take over the community hall. And like you say, and just making sure that the toilets flush the whole time with this, you know, huge amount of uh, additional use for that infrastructure. You know, I really do appreciate what happens at these checkpoints and how much work happens in these checkpoints. And then as a musher, you race in there, you're in a hurry, you know, you get your dogs bedded down, you go to sleep, you take your nap, you stand up, you take off, and you leave again. 
and we don't really get the opportunity to really you know thank everybody involved in getting that set up for us so that we do have a place to park our dogs and the straw is right there and many of the checkpoints have hot waters and we do have a bathroom that flushes i mean that there's a lot that goes into that um and it's it's uh, you know greatly appreciated all the effort that goes into putting this on because there is no way the Iditarod could run without the support of all these villages along the way and more than the villages the individuals who are out there themselves volunteering their time and energy to do this um, so I do hope that you know traveling through there with dog teams does help to keep that uh, that history and culture of the sled dogs alive and keep that part of Alaska's culture. I, I would love to see some more teams, especially in these Yukon River villages, uh, begin racing in the Iditarod and see some new teams out there. But, you know, snow machines are taking over. It's quite frankly, a more practical mode of transportation out there than the dog team. And that's why the dog teams are kind of, were disappearing and ultimately why the Iditarod was started was to prevent the sled dog from going extinct. And now we've looked at the Galena checkpoint and we'll start to look at the next checkpoint uh, moving on from Galena and over to the next checkpoint of Nolado. Nolado is the 13th uh, checkpoint along the trail. We will look at some pictures from the trail. And we talked to the twin sisters, Christy and Anna Barrington, resting on the trail. I think the trail's surprisingly better than what I was expecting. I thought it was going to be a lot softer 
and just with low traffic and how much snow is out here, I thought it was gonna be super slow. And I find that the mushers are working really good together to help each other pass because it's it's this wide and that's what we have to work with. So yeah, good you lead step dogs. off the edge or yeah. here. Good lead dogs and good teamwork and mushers are helping each other pass and be passed, so which is really, really nice. Yeah, and it's it's hard to find a place to pull over and camp. Some people are like tucked in really tight to the side of the trail because by rules you can't block the trail. So it's nice when you find a pull off like this and have our own little private spot down there and the team can pass by and our dogs won't even know and they can sleep and have a nice, mm -hmm. nice nap time. In the beginning of the race, it was hard to stop. The dogs are just so yeah. jazzed that even you set both their snow hooks and they're still pulling them before you get to the sled and then they get sucked under the sled and you're trying to stop and dig them out and they're just laughing at you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's all, it's gotten more manageable now. They wait till I get back to the sled before they start going. <laughs> they're calming down a little bit now? Yeah. Yeah, they're just getting trail hard. They're used to the routine. Like, oh, we travel this many, you know, hours and then take a break and then go again and we get to eat and yeah, sleep. They, they and... know what to expect. Yeah. Is that what it's all about, routine? Dogs love routine. They like to know what's going on and they're yeah. comfortable with that. They like a job and then routine. Yeah, so then mm -hmm. if they can expect to know what's going on, then you'll get a res better response out of They know as soon as they see that straw, they're going to take a break. Their body already starts preparing to, to, to rest, rest uh -huh. as soon as they see it. And um, that's what you, try, what you try to train for is we call it race simulation. And that's what you try to do is do, Practice a, that. Yeah, do a certain percentage of whatever it is race you're doing. And we do like sections of I did a rod in what our race schedule is at a time and I mean, try yeah to um, mimic that yeah when you pull over and camp some people have described it as like a, a surgeon's procedure of when a musher does their checkpoint routine it's like they every step they're doing and then the, you do that way every single time like you park you put your leader hook out then you pull off booties you undo the tugs you do straw if you do that same routine every time this the dogs are easier to manage because they know okay we're gonna do this and, and our dogs even get a special snack that they only get when we're camping the first mm -hmm. thing so they know already that oh you know we're staying here for a little bit just relax this thing uh-huh <laughs> It's chicken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, human grade chicken. They yeah. love it. Uh -huh. nice. It's their favorite. How, how are you two feeling about where you are right now? Uh, um, I would say we, that yeah. I have, we are having a nice run, but I am not having a good race. Yeah, that's well put. And why is that? I didn't want to be back here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. it's just, I mean, right away the with it, we got like 11 inches of snow or something at the start and right away that threw a monkey in it to be well I guess I'm gonna stop in Yetna because it took me over five hours to get here yep. and right away the plan changed and yeah it's okay adapt and overcome and get through it and that kind of thing but since that happened I feel like instead of playing keep up we started playing catch up and it's harder to do that when you're in the field of people you want to be with you can see kind of what they're doing and have an idea but if you're behind it's hard to to catch up and see what they're doing and try to adjust your schedule a little bit. I feel like now we're having to adjust it a lot to try to catch up. And yeah, just, just yeah, falling short and uh, kind of falling flat, coming up yeah. short. That's just what it kind of seems. It's just things aren't just clicking. They're not just happening. It's yeah. kind of one little issue here and there. I mean, mm -hmm. I've lost one of my best leaders in Nikolai. She had a little bit of a sore wrist and I was like, nope, you're done and sent her home and I'm feeling that. I really miss having her on my team. That and my other lead dog, Duramax, who wasn't able to start because I decided to save him for another task. Wow. He's gonna make some babies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So that, that's kind of hard, especially when last year Christine had her best finishes. So then every, all these people are saying, yeah, top 10 this year, you guys. And yeah, it's your year and stuff like that. And then, so you get pumped on that kind of thing. and. In the back of my mind, I made some probably poor decisions on which dogs to take last minute, but I chose what I did. Well, yeah, we, and you know, and it, it was wanting to put experience on some of our younger ones, and they're showing their their age right now, and they're novice. They're, yeah, yeah, they're they're doing good, but you can tell that they're like, wow, you know, this is this is a long way. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning should have ended two hundred yeah, miles uh -huh. ago because we yeah. do three hundred mile sets. And <laughs> yeah, so you can you can't. I mean, in a way, I feel like I'm letting a lot of people down that kind of thing. But then at the same time, that the race isn't over. you got to race it till the end because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, what Dr. Seuss say, those that 
matter don't mind and those that mind don't matter. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but yeah, it's yeah. There's plenty of race still left, and of course, no, none of us are going to win it, but mm-hmm. we can still do the best we can, and that's all you can ask for. And give the best experience we can for yeah. the dogs, uh-huh. and, and learn from it. We're already talking about what changes we're going to make for next year, yeah. <laughs> which is a sick, sick addiction. <laughs> <laughs> what changes are you going to make next year? Um. Well, it's. We haven't discussed it really, but I've gone through some ideas in my head, and one of them is let's make a competitive dog team. Let's send Anna out here, and and a couple years ago she was in the basically in the top 20 with her dog team, and I feel like she knows the southern route and she likes the southern route, and I think <laughs> that I think you can do really well, and that we we're gonna stack a dog team and send her to do that, and. Um, in my mind, I want to take the puppies we have at home and go do the quest and a couple of leaders and just have yeah. a good time. Uh-huh. Or then, then next year, Christy can take the main team and, and race the, the northern. <laughs> yeah, and the quest or race the northern route, and I did a rod. So. Allie and Alan make that work, yeah. and Paige and Cody, and I think that it's a way for both of us to race and um, support each other. And Anna can drive for me and handle on the quest and see me at the checkpoints. And um, yeah, because it's really hard to field two teams and try to stay competitive out of one little kennel yeah usually it's a puppy team and uh yeah the a team that people have out of one kennel and we're trying to field two b plus teams and it's hard yeah uh-huh <laughs> yeah yeah i think you guys bring up a good point um <clears throat> excuse me along those lines um teams you see there's also a lot of uh there's a lot of family members uh mushing together over the years uh i to my knowledge, you're the only twins, female twins out here. Yeah, I think we're the only sisters that have run. No, a mother and daughter have done it, but we're yeah. the only sisters. Yeah, and the you only got twins. the CVs and the Mackies and the Osmars and the Smith brothers. The Smith brothers and yeah, a whole bunch. I'm probably missing. And then Martin and his son. Martin and his kid. Yes, yeah. So I'm probably missing even more people. Mm-hmm. So and you, and you never ever. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen any of them mush together. No, I think one, yeah, not really. I mean, Lance and Jason, I think, ended up mushing together at one point, and then I think mm-hmm. that Martin and one of his Roan, sons, Roan, ended together. up racing together, but usually they don't. Like, yeah. when Mitch and Dallas were racing, it was kind of like, yeah, you do your thing, I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like that. Uh, Paige and Cody ended up racing together once. I yeah. Know uh-huh. that. And Andy and I raced together, but it's different. Yeah. You two don't have that, I mean, you have this more cooperate, cooperative spirit together. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? I think we've had that cooperative spirit our whole lives. Just yeah, because we have the same interests mm-hmm. and things, and we have raised all these dogs together, and that. So it's not like those ones are yours at birth, and these ones are mine, and I'm gonna make mine awesome. It's just we work with all of them together, and when I see Chrissy do so well with our dogs, I mean that that gives me pride and happiness mm-hmm. too. So it's it's the whole kennel is doing good when she does good. Mm-hmm. Uh, what advantages do you think you have traveling together and making uh, making your plans together when you're out here? It's helped me uh, chasing Anna out at some of the checkpoints because I have some really novice leaders since I don't have my my two veterans on the team. That last year, well, the main guy I have right now, his name is Wallace, and he's good. He's got ADD when he's just like very easily distracted. He's super excited. So he's, he's a wonderful dog. He just, he needs that veteran leader to kind of focus him in and let's head down the trail and not bark and screw off and stuff. So he needs that. And I don't have that dominance on my team to teach him that. I mean, the, the females up there with now, she's a really good leader, but she's half his size. So she can't really pull him in the right direction and be like, hey, get your act together because he just wants to goof around. And she's in heat, so I can't run them together anymore. So that's another snag that I have yeah. going on. Yeah, and it was nice too. Like I was following Christy and she found this awesome camp spot because I was behind a little ways. So that was nice. She scoped that out. And then earlier in the, when we were running, the trail had blown shut on the way into Cripple so we could take turns trail breaking. So it's not one mm-hmm. team getting burned out on trail breaking. We can take turns. So yeah, dogs like to chase things, so we put the other team up front and they kind of draft off each other and, yeah, something to chase. I did a rod in and of itself is a pretty special, momentous uh, um, race. How much more so is it doing it with a sister? Oh, we can look back at this and 
We'll have these memories and times we had together our whole lives. Yeah, I'm snapping pictures on my phone all the time so we can look back and... And we'll even have stuff we laugh about and talk about that remember for years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we get a little uh, rummy and punch drunk when you don't sleep a lot. And we just laugh about the yeah, stupidest uh-huh. yeah, things. Yeah, like, like in the like, cabin, <laughs> you, like just like, oh, bed it down, take a little nap. And all of a sudden, you, <laughs> yeah, it's giggling. Like giggling, laughing and stuff like that about something super dumb. But it's just... One time we were in Ofer and we were giggling like that. And Mike Ellis came and he's like... Are you okay? You guys crying? We're like, no, we're laughing. We're just trying <laughs> yeah, to be uh-huh. quiet. So, yeah, it's just, it's fun. And um, Christy's done a couple more I did rods than I have. So I've learned a lot from her. And um, we, we're both still learning. There's so much still to learn. So we can bounce mm-hmm. ideas off of each other and just try to grow together and um, be get better. Yeah. Right. And um, what's your plan right now? Trying not to get sunburn. Yeah, yeah <laughs> let the exactly. dogs. Yeah, let the dogs take a nice nap sun. and hopefully watch the temperature go down some. And yeah, this time of year, I think four o'clock is the heat of the day. I mean, I'd be comfortable in a t-shirt right now. Yeah. So we'll peel the coats off them before we leave. But right now, they might as well just, you know, bake a little bit and yeah, get all warm stay and sleepy. Warm, keep their muscles nice and soft. And yeah. Then we'll continue on to Ruby and take a break in Ruby and then. Go to Galena, take a break in Galena, and see what the checkpoint in Nolato has for us because they said that we don't get to go in the school now because of the coronavirus, so I don't even know mm-hmm. what that checkpoint is going to be like. Yeah, be interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole coronavirus pretty weird what's going on. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's interesting. Someone told me that we're the only sporting event going on in the entire world. Everything else has been canceled. Bas- NCAA, just everything is done, and we're the only thing that's still going on. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Especially with the history of, you know, the idea of not only Joe Reddington's dream of keeping the uh, breed of the Alaskan Husky alive and its purpose, but also going back to the serum run and Leonard Seppla of, you know, saving villages that way. And it's kind of like not what we're facing a similar um, epidemic, but it kind of has some similarities. Yeah, it just... You know, that history is kind of coming back in a way and makes you think and remember everybody that blazed the trail for us. And how, how we could put up a, a heck of a relay team with the mushrooms that we <laughs> yeah. have these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah see so we could get there in a week. <laughs> Not even, I bet days. Yeah, <laughs> they're That's staged, true. right? Yeah, uh-huh. That's funny. Um, is there anything you want to talk about that I haven't asked you about? Um... Totally open to anything. Yeah, it's just like when you're talking about the the race and how, like, not that our race fell apart, but it's not going the way we want it to. And I was thinking about that running, and it's like there's a lot of reasons why people run a marathon. Not everybody enters that marathon to win it, and there's just so many more experiences that go along with it. And to really to realize that you're not going to get what you want and be as as good as you did, just to kind of pull back and soak it all in, the, the nature, the dogs, um, doing this with Anna, just the that how blessed we are just to be able to do this and it's kind of humbling and um, I really uh, respect and um, love the people that aren't going to ask what happened right away they're going to be more like tell oh tell me about your race you know because that you know that question is hanging out in people's minds when they look and see like man you were 16 and 17 last year now you're way back there what happened <laughs> yeah yeah cause it kind of feels like there's two ways for me to have fun doing this race. It's taking a puppy team and watching all those young dogs make it to the finish line that you raised and trained and that kind of thing. Or the second fun is racing and being competitive. And when you're not doing well racing, then it doesn't get so fun. Yeah. <laughs> so like Chris said, you just got to turn your focus on the other things and you got to keep your spirit and attitude up because the dogs can pick up on that. And mm-hmm. um, their enthusiasm is contagious. You can feel a little bit bummed out, but they're all barking and excited. It's like, yeah. Yeah, and it's still fun. It's, it's like, still it's not fun. exactly yeah. what you wanted, but it's still Yeah, you've got to take away from it and learn, and mm-hmm. it'll just grow from it. And that was the Barrington sisters. And uh, hearing what, they, what they're saying, Dallas, uh, a little bit disappointing that they can't make it and be up there like they were yes, uh, last year, but they know that their fans will... Uh, will not ask that question like the first thing <laughs> when they're coming in. Yeah, 
I just completing the trail is the first challenge, right? Every year to, I mean, think about it. They're traveling a thousand miles by dog team across Alaska. That's a pretty major accomplishment, just making it down the trail. So sometimes we get so wrapped up in the race and focusing on, you know, who ran faster by five minutes on a certain section of the trail. But if you zoom out, you know, let's, let's take a couple steps back here and look at this thing. Every musher that's traveling down the trail is taking on an amazing challenge, kind of you know, celebrating the sled dog, celebrating the culture and the history of that this is meant to Alaska. You know, Alaska would not be the state that it is now without the sled dog. It was crucial to, the, I mean, to be able to do what we did, whether it's the gold rushes or earlier the natives who lived in Alaska and were so close with these sled dogs to be able to survive in this very harsh country and terrain. So yeah, there, it's probably a little bit disappointing. I, I understand that sentiment for sure when you train all year and you want to have a good finish. But at the end of the day, I think anybody watching it has to just you know, appreciate what these people are doing, the trail that they're taking on, that journey with their dog team. And I think we can all kind of celebrate that regardless of the position that they're moving down the trail. And uh, a little earlier, we saw Matt failure. We've got uh, another hold of him uh, resting on the trail. So how's your run going? Um, the run, the run here is doing, or well, the run's going just fine. I did a rods. I don't even. Do you mean the run here or the the I did a rod in general? How about both? Um, our I did a rod has gone slightly off schedule. We're kind of. Uh, being less competitive the last two days but due to what the dogs need not due to what i need but um the most bizarre one but a true success story was when we were in our uh, in Takatna on our 24 i fed the team and uh um uh, my dog cool cat um, was acting totally out of character and she was crying and not doing well so I just asked her, you know, I was like, how are you doing? And she, she was whining. And so I called the vet over and um, we got her up on her feet and he knew right away that, that she had a, a potential twisted gut. So that was um, a uh, straight like um, flight, you know, medevac almost, I guess you'd call it. So he, he released the pressure on her. He found, he found a spot on her stomach and basically lanced it with a little needle and like a hot air balloon all this air came pouring out of her stomach and basically saved her life and this guy I mean he did save her life they put her on the plane and took her to McGrath and then a plane took her from McGrath to Anchorage and um, she's alive now so she was stable and she got to a veterinarian there and then she did an awesome job and I supposedly righted her stomach back and tacked it to the side of the wall of the stomach so just an awesome job by the veterinarians here I'm um, saving my dog's life. Wow, that is quite the story. Yes, it's unbelievable. And it needs to get out too because they were phenomenal. He he acted unemotional, analytical, very, very, like he knew exactly what was going on and he said, this is what we need to do. And then the other veterinarian, I can't remember her name at the moment, but they worked together and they were quick and precise and they got the dog what it needed and saved her life. Nice. Yeah pretty crazy I mean very heavy stuff and completely un um, attached to dog mushing I mean any animal probably humans too can get a twisted gut I, I would I don't know but I know I know cows and all that but totally something that could just happen to any any dog um, unrelated to mushing so it was just a neat story that had a happy ending and here you are yeah, so that, that was like in Takatna was just, I mean, we were up and down and but we left there once I got the word that she was stable, we left there and carried on. And yeah. What's your plan now? Um, to be honest with you, it's just to hold it all together. Uh, if, if a couple more dogs get sore, I mean, it, it could be the end of the race for me because you can only have six um, and right now I have nine. Um, and. Uh, SB is doing awesome, but having to do a lot of massaging. She has a, a, a tight wrist, so she's fine. But if that were to get any worse, then I'd probably drop her. So we go down to eight. So really, it's just just keeping them healthy and and continuing on. As far as being competitive, it's out the window. Just kind of holding on a little bit here. 
What are you, what are your expectations after when you know that you're not going to be competitive anymore? What what are you out here for? What 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 keeps you moving forward? Um, it, I mean, it do, like running dogs is is such a fine balance between trying to be competitive and you know run for the namesake of the kennel, but you have the well-being of the dogs that comes before that and the well-being of myself that comes before that. If I'm not healthy, we can't be competitive and vice versa. So um, the this is what we work for all year is to come to Iditarod and it is it is like a mini vacation. The dogs enjoy it, uh, I enjoy it, and it's a chance to go to a beautiful place on earth and just travel the trail and we get to see some amazing stuff. So as long as they're healthy, and I'm healthy, we'll continue on and try to be competitive. That is the, you know, that is the goal. But if they can't be competitive, we're just going to go along and, and make sure everyone has a good time. But it's it's hard because you want to be you want to be competitive, but you can't, you know, you can't overdo it because then your race is over. Yeah. Okay. Anything you want to talk about? I didn't ask you about. Um, no. I just like to say hi to everybody at home. Um, everybody uh, that's cheering us on. I really appreciate all your support. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to take care of the dogs and just have a good time. And, and uh, uh, that's about it. That was a very dramatical story Matthew was telling and mm -hmm. Hannah as a veterinarian, what happened to his dogs? Yeah, what we're hearing, uh, Matt uh, had a dog uh, with a twisted gut. That is actually uh, a twisting of the stomach of the dog. So um, we have a, a twist between the, the stomach and the intestine. And uh, what's happening is that the stomach is then blowing up like a balloon. So what we heard here that he was coming into the checkpoint and straight away uh, talking to the vets. And there were then vets that was um, diagnosing the, the dog and um, uh, have the right diagnostic and they uh, were evacuating the gas in the stomach to save the dog and it's uh, this is a critical situation for for a dog so um, they have to be fast and and so that the dog is not dying and of course this is a really critical situation because uh, he was telling I think it was in Takotna and in Takotna there is no animal hospital or something like that. So you have to get the, the dog out of the checkpoint to your animal hospital. And they were flewing the dog then uh, out to Anchorage uh, for surgery. And um, uh, they uh, were saving the dog. And this is a, a little bit of the, I think this is a, it's a situation that we see um, that here is the communication between the musher uh, seeing the dog that is something wrong with the dog coming into the checkpoint telling straight away to the veterinarians and we have the this uh, this uh, volunteer veterinarians that uh, are on the checkpoints all around uh, on the Aditra trail and uh, they are working down together as a team in the checkpoint um, and can be aware of this situation and do something with it uh, and the twisted stomach, uh, uh, Matthew said that it can happen uh, like any time. Not, it's not the race. Uh, race no, it's uh, it can happen any time. Actually, it's not very very common, but it can be that uh, they are picking up snow along the trail and they have uh, they are eating a lot. The, the sled dogs have to eat like uh, a uh, ten to twelve thousand calories a day so they are eating a lot of a uh, uh, lot of food and while they are running they, it can happen that they actually the gut or the stomach then have this twist uh, then when they are uh, are running on the trail mm. yeah. but it barely never happens yeah, yeah dallas uh, what do you have to say about this and I, I just wanted to jump in on that first of all the first thing that comes to mind for me is you know it's honestly a really good thing you know, if, if something like this is going to happen, which of course you never want to have something un like this happen, but if it does happen, the fact that they're in a checkpoint in Takatna where there are vets not 100 yards away is pretty fortunate. A lot of these mushers and a lot of people in Alaska in general 
live in some very remote areas yeah. where it could be maybe a two hour drive to a veterinary clinic, you know, and that's a long time when you have a situation like this, it's mm -hmm. too long. So I'm the first thing that comes to mind is how, I mean, fortunate it is that again, this is in a checkpoint where there are veterinarians right there. I mean, that's the closest this team has been to veterinarians, you know, all year when they're on the race and they're, mm -hmm. they're close by. So again, fortunate, I think that it is in a checkpoint and had veterinary assistance right there because again, if they were, you know, for some of the mushers that live in more remote parts of the state or even on the road system, they might be some long drive from a, a veterinary clinic. Yeah. So that's kind of fortunate. And I, I just, I haven't seen this very often, uh, as, as a veterinarian, how often do you do you see that uh, circumstance? I think it, it depends on uh, because uh, depends on where you are living and how, what kind of dogs actually you are working with, because uh, it's uh, it's more happening with dogs uh, that are more in activity and bigger dogs that it's not quite common on uh, smaller smaller dog. Um, dogs so um, I don't think it we see it uh, quite often in the race but we can see it then off the race uh, races then and of course big clinics they have this twisted tum stomachs then um, it's not uncommon uh, to have dogs coming in for surgery for, uh, for twisted uh, guts and how do they recover from it well, the surgery in itself, it's uh, for the, the, the big hospitals with uh, a big sur uh, surgery team, it's uh, like a routine operation. So they, uh, they will actually then, it's different techniques, but uh, they actually take the gut and will um, um, have it uh, done, uh, twisted twist, twist, uh, twist it back. Yeah, that it's evacuating the gas and they will twist it, the, the, the gut back and uh, they suited it then uh, afterwards. And the, the, the recovery is uh, mostly quite good. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, but it must be incredibly scary for the musher, Matthew, to experience this and, yeah. uh, with his best friends out there. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, anything like that is, you know, absolutely terrifying. And like you said, you know, it must have been a huge relief when he was in the Tocotna checkpoint and heard back after the dog had gone to Anchorage and had the surgery and heard back that the dog was okay and in, in good condition. Um, then he was, you know, able to move on the trail. But still, that's that's got to linger with you. You know, that that affects your ability to be able to compete or anything like that. Um, but I guess if you're if you're processing that as a musher, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be than with my team on the trail when there is something difficult like that going on. Um, you want to be with your best friends. You want to be close to the, the people and the, you know, the animals that you care about. So he's in a good place as far as, you know, a wilderness area that he can kind of reflect and, and have time to think and process. Um, and fortunately, everything turned out well. And, you know, it's, I think he's got his mind in the right place, uh, watching the dog team, just making it down the trail easily. And of course, if things don't go well, he'll he'll pull out of the race. Um, if it gets to the point that it's not fun for the team to do it, he has no reason to to keep going down the trail. So he will, you know, fly home. But as of right now, I think if he's you know just settles into an easy traveling pace, he'll probably be able to continue on down the trail. Might leave a one or two more dogs behind if somebody has an issue. Um, but it, with plenty of rest, you can go a long ways with seven or eight dogs if you are making sure that they have lots and lots of rest and they have plenty of energy because there is a little bit more work for each dog when you get down to that size of a team. And we'll take a look at another musher, Richie Deal, as he's getting into Nulato. Hi. Hi, guys. Hello. All right, here we have Richie coming into the Nolato checkpoint. You can see it's kind of a soft trail out there. The, the dog's feet are sinking in a little bit into the snow. This is going to make for some, some harder pulling for these dogs out there. You know, Richie had uh, an all right run going over there. Um, I'm just looking at the run time here. It took him seven hours and 21 minutes, which I believe was slower than some of the other teams. You know, faster than some, slower than others going into the Nolato checkpoint. You see a lot of wagon tails. They seem perky and happy um, coming in there. But it is a, it is a challenging condition. And, you know, this Richie's been near the front of the race quite uh, pretty much the whole time. Since the beginning, he was off on a pretty brisk pace. He was out in front. So they've been working hard holding that pace. Um, 
Yeah, he's still got uh, a big lineup of dogs in that team also. So he's, he's got a nice looking gang. I know he's had a little bit of trouble out there, but uh, he has, you know, in that checkpoint, he came in with 14 dogs. Again, a seven hour and 21 minute run over there. Uh, there's got wagon tails and whatnot. They're all alert and happy here. But uh, yeah, that's a long dog team. <laughs> He's got a long tow line set up there. We also got an interview with uh, Richie Deal, still being in Nulato. Yeah. Well, kind of a, a bunch of stuff going on here. We got a checkpoint that's weird. <laughs> And then a storm moving in. Uh -huh. Do you have any concerns? Uh, a little. I mean, I, I mean, what can we do? I mean, at least we got a tent here to, or a cabin to hop into. Um, so I guess it's not all that bad. The storm, I don't know. It seems like everybody's got a different prediction for the storm that's moving in. So who knows? How's your team doing? They're doing all right. It seems they're going through a little. Mid race slump, I think, right now. <laughs> so hopefully, get them to bounce back here and get a little speed back. And how about yourself? How's your mid race coming? It's it's good. It's, I mean, I'm still really happy with how they're doing and where we're at. So um, I think we're doing just fine. With Shack Tulik being closed down, do you have kind of a rough idea of how you're gonna adjust? I don't know, that last run I thought about the whole run and I still can't figure out what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea. I guess just win it when we get to it. Uh, Dallas, uh, Richie had uh, a good run time for 7 hours and 21 minutes over to Nulato. And he is uh, now saying that he's actually satisfied with his team, but he stayed for 11 hours and 42 minutes in Nolato and should be staying for like his eight, uh, either in Nolato or in Caltag. So, and he is driving over to Caltag in six hours and three minutes. Uh, so how do you say in that? Yeah, so actually I believe Richie um, stayed there for some number of hours. I want to say it was four or five and prepared to leave the checkpoint and then went out and um, was having trouble just getting the team traveling well. The dogs, I mean, we saw them come into the checkpoint, and they're uh, perky and they're wagging tails, but I know that he has a couple females in heat, and he got out there and spent a little bit of time trying to get everything figured out, and, you know, somebody's got to go first sort of a thing, and they were all happy, um, but none of them really wanted to go first. And for the lead dogs, they probably were distracted with some females in heat, and instead of trying to force that situation, I think Richie recognized that there is a lot of trail left to go. So he turned around, went back into the checkpoint, um, spent some time there. I mean, he ended up staying there for 11 hours and 40 minutes or something, took a good long break. And uh, then once they had rested up completely, um, took off for the Caltag checkpoint. He had a good run over to Caltag uh, once they had that nice long rest. But, uh, you know, that's not uncommon to see. Well, I shouldn't say uncommon. It's, it's not normal. But, you know, he's been running a brisk pace. You look at the dogs, they're, they're happy in their wagon tails. You know, they're, they're having a good time. But it starts to get a little bit challenging. And if there's some females in heat and it's distracting, you know, you really got to reset, take a long rest. And then going over to, to Caltech, he did have a good run time. Um, I think he did it in like six hours. Yeah, six hours and three minutes over to Caltag. That's a fine run time. So obviously that extra rest did the team well, uh, did them a lot of good there. And I think we're going to see Richie probably adjust his pace a little bit, continue to give him some more rest, and he'll have a good finish. But that's the sort of thing that, you know, it's, it's a tough challenge. But it, you, you wonder, you know, is it something that he could have seen earlier on? maybe made a small adjustment sooner? Would, would one hour extra at the previous checkpoint saved him five hours at this checkpoint? Or was it something that, um, you know, it's, it really is one dog that he was relying as a lead dog? And this is one reason that I like having a lot of lead dogs is so you can break up that workload and nobody spends too much time up there. If one, one main leader gets distracted by females, you have other options. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a nice looking team, so for him to end up staying 11 hours seems like a, a long time, but clearly it's a cautious move and undoubtedly the right move. So you think that he be, can be catching up again? Uh, not, not all the way <laughs> catching up. Uh, 
you know, b before I think we could have said, you know, he had a, had a chance, but this is the yeah. sort of underlying stuff that it, just one little difference will make, or one little thing will make a big difference at this point in the race. And I think, I have no idea who, but I think we might see another couple mushers that kind of, you know, pull their name out of that top contenders list that are right now in the top 10. They're going to recognize, you know what, if I try to win this, we're, we're going to end up, you know, not having the run that we want to have or not having the team we want to have. And they will drop back and start racing for fifth or just to try to make sure they stay in the top 10. And mushers will start kind of self-selecting where they should be competing and which teams they should be competing with. So I think Richie has made that adjustment here. Uh, that long rest will do that team well. I mean, it's a nice looking dog team. Give that team 12 hours of rest like they did. And I think they're, you're gonna see their speed bounce back um, and maybe they'll focus a little more. He did leave two dogs behind. He may have opted in, in the Nolato checkpoint. He left two dogs behind. He may have opted to leave the females in heat if that's if that's what causing the problem, even if they're some of his best dogs. You've got to, as a musher, you've got to look at the team as a whole, right? So those are the decisions you got to make. And we actually have some pictures of uh, Richie Deal returning back into Nulato. So uh, what just happened? Um, I really don't know. My dogs just they left here totally fine. And then all of a sudden, all my boys were interested in one female. And it just put the slammer on everything. Tried switching dogs around, couldn't get, you know. The way it went, and I tried dropping the female, and yeah. So what'd you have to do? Come back. <laughs> That's why I'm back here. So what's your plan now? I don't know. I have no idea. Give him some rest and see what they look like. Okay. What's going through your mind right now? I don't. I don't know. Pretty disgusted. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So. so that was uh, Richie Deal and uh, Hannah. How important is it, or difficult is it, when you have females in heat? Well, it, uh, when you have females in heat, it's always um, uh, it can be a problem in the team because uh, all the boys in the team they are focusing on this uh, one or two females. Then we heard then Richie here have two two uh, fe uh, female uh, dogs in in heat, and um, the problem is with the the male dogs. Then they are focusing then on on the the females and not in actually doing their job. Then in the race, so they are a little bit unfocused. Want to uh, to focus on the love and not on on running, <laughs> and it also can cause that the the male dogs can be eating less, and that will also be a problem for uh, the. The dogs have to eat so much to have the calories and the energy than during the race. So uh, being unfocused on other things than actually doing the job uh, for uh, going forward and pulling, uh, that can be caused and problems for the whole team that they are uh, having this extra energy to focus on, other, on the females and not on, on the trail. So Dallas, uh, do some mushers have uh, only females and only male dogs uh, in their team then? You know, I, I do know several teams that um, you know, have only male dogs in the team and they have two or three females that are, are definitely good enough to be in the team. Uh, but they're concerned about just that. Uh, you know, the dog, the female is good enough to be in the team, maybe even one of their better lead dogs. But if that dog comes in season, it will throw the whole team out of whack. Um, I, we do see that teams that have more of a 50-50 mix of males and females, the males are actually more accustomed to running with the girls. It doesn't really affect them so much. They're used to one of them always being in heat. It's just a normal part of life. Um, but it, it can be a challenge. And like Hannah was saying, you know, they don't eat as well. A lot of times when they're not very tired, particularly in the beginning of the race, instead of curling up and sleeping anyway, they're sitting there playing or, you know, barking at the female. Um, but I, I got to touch on this real quick. You know, this is a really tough situation for, for Richie. You know, you can see that he's clearly just distraught in the situation. And, you know, one thing that stood out to me, you know, I, I hate to draw attention to it, but he says, you know, I'm just disgusted. And, and this is really tough. First of all, the musher is tired. 
they are they're tired, which makes them really kind of a lot of them. They're very emotionally vulnerable. Um, they can be kind of pessimist, pessimistic. And right now, Richie's just frustrated with himself, and he probably doesn't even know what he did wrong. And it's really challenging. He's like, he's going to feel like, did I let the team down? What should I have done differently? And I get, man, I feel for him. It's a tough situation. You know, clearly, he's got a big team. The dogs are looking, looking good. But, you know, there's, there's that. You feel like you let your team down. And that's a really hard thing to handle any time, much less for the musher to handle it when they're already tired and feeling kind of beat up and you feel like you're letting all, a lot of people down and he probably can't pinpoint you know what even he he should have done differently so this is a, this is a tough thing to handle and I, I feel for him out there you know you you build up to this race all year you really want to be able a good coach and get your team through it well and you make one little mistake and, and things start to snowball and then even then you can't necessarily pinpoint the mistake should he have left the female behind early is probably what he's thinking um you know the team's looking good should i have given him more rest anyway and that's what just builds one year after the next and it, it is a challenging situation that he's facing and but i think he handled it well um take a long break when in doubt rest if it's not clear what to do if you're not confident going forward rest the team rest yourself and things will become more clear tomorrow and just remember at the core of it all just travel with dogs Go to the next checkpoint. When it gets overwhelming, forget about the race and just focus on traveling with dogs well. Take care of the team. Rebuild that team. Um, I, I shouldn't even say rebuild. It's a, it's a nice-looking gang out there. So, yeah, it's a challenging situation for him, to be sure. So does this mean that Richie cannot be in the top 10 or top 15? I, I don't know about that. Um, he reached the Caltech checkpoint with a good run time. He has taken a huge amount of rest. That, that rest is going to do the team wonders. Um, he may catch up with some of the teams that you know, got ahead of him during that time. I think he, can, he could, I mean, I mean, this is without doing any serious an analysis here, but I think it's very likely that he could be back in the top 10, I think, um, if things go well from here forward, or maybe he could move back if things continue, you know, if something else goes wrong farther down the road, right? But uh, I don't think we're going to see him in the top five. And that was a very likely scenario just, you know, 20 hours ago. Moving a bit uh, back in time, uh, we will see Jesse Royer's team getting into Nulato. All right. So we see here, Jesse's cruising on into Nulato. You know, there's a snow machine was over the trail just before her looking at the tracks here. The dogs seem to be, yeah, they're still sinking into that. It seems like a very similar trail to what we saw Richie come in on a little bit ago. Maybe a little bit better for Jesse here. Um, they're moving steadily. You know, they're not flying. None of the teams are flying down this trail. It's just not the type of trail that supports very fast run times. So this does become more of a mental game where the dogs have to be com comfortable just walking along and going slow. And, you know, that could be something that's messing with, uh, with, like with Richie's team that we were just talking about a little bit, is these slower trails can just be simply frustrating for the dog team if they're accustomed to going fast all the time. Even if they're physically very healthy and fit and even rested, it can just get mentally boring for them to run down this never-ending treadmill that is the Yukon River. Jesse's dogs are, are solid, sol solid soldiers here. They're marching along. They seem perfectly comfortable just walking along, going at a slower pace, and that's what everybody's got to do at this point. This isn't a fast trail. So the mushers have to recognize that, adjust, and understand how that's going to affect each of their teams. We listened to some of the, the top mushers um, earlier, you know, to, earlier in this broadcast, back when the mushers are in, tuck, in Caltag, talking about the dog's mental state. You know, I think it was Thomas Warner that pinpointed that specifically, saying that um, what he's really paying attention to is the dog's mental state. And that's very important and very uh, astute of him to be paying attention to in this type of a terrain, because this is more of a mental game than a physical game on a trail like this. And while uh, Jessie was still in Nilado, we got a hold of her. All right, so how was your run coming in tonight? Uh, well, I guess it went pretty good. I slept through half of it, so it seemed like it took us a long time to get here. It was a long run, but just just windblown, soft snow, and uh, the snow is 
It's really dry, so the sled doesn't slide very well on it. So we're going pretty slow. We're not going moving very fast. So I'm hoping everybody behind me is not moving very fast either. <laughs> um, as you're, you know, how long did it take you to get here? I think almost like seven hours. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. And in that seven hours, I'm sure you thought about this, but have you ever had a race so affected by like outside influences? <laughs> no. Never. I mean, usually, that's the fun thing about running Iditarod is usually you run this race and you can completely forget about the outside world and you just, like, you're oblivious to, like, what's going on. Usually it's just, you run your 14 dogs in front of you and that is your world, is those 14 dogs. And that's all you care about is getting those 14 dogs to know them. And you don't really care about what's going on around, you know, the rest of the world, I guess. And, uh, you can just kind of forget about it. It's kind of like a vacation, you know? And uh, never has the rest of the world <laughs> affected this race so much, for sure. It's kind of crazy. So what are your plans? I mean, I know we had talked about it earlier, but your, your checkpoint <laughs> kind of went away. Yeah, well, you know, a bunch of us mushers were talking back at Galena because uh, a lot of us, you know, our whole race strategy is just pretty much gone out the window. Um, you know, how we've been running and resting up to this point uh, is setting us up for running and resting up the coast. And that just all changed. So some of us, yeah, it's, we would have run differently had we known sooner, but I mean, of course, you know, the race let us know as soon as they could. So it's not, they're doing, I know they're doing the best they can. So it's just kind of, kind of a, not a good deal for anybody. Not a good deal for the race organizers. I know they're probably pulling their hair out. Um, it's not been, it's not really a good deal for the racers. Um, we're all concerned. That's a pretty tough section losing Shaq Tulik. I mean, if you could, if you could pick one checkpoint that was like super critical, this whole race, I would say it's Shaq Tulik because it's just in such a harsh environment up there. I mean, if it was blue sky and good weather, then not a big deal. But when the weather's bad and it's storming and blowing, which apparently it is up there, that is such a crucial, crucial like safety checkpoint. So I know a lot of us are just worried about the safety part of it. Um, that's a really long run across probably one of the harshest sections of trail in this whole race. Yeah. Uh, aside from these challenges, everything else going okay? Dogs seem like they're eating good. Yeah, yeah. they definitely are eating good. I think they just ate 13 dogs, just ate 35 pounds of food. So they might be waddling out of here. Maybe I fed them too much. They're, they're, uh, they're pretty full, but at this point, they need all the calories they can get, so hopefully they'll just keep eating on down the trail like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, my race is going pretty good. The dogs are doing pretty good. It seems like we're going really slow, but I think it's also the snow. The sled just doesn't want to slide on the snow. So like I said, I'm hoping everybody else is going just as slow as I am. It always feels like you're going slower than everybody else, but if, uh, yeah, they're going through the same thing I am, so they can't be going much faster if they are. You just got to keep reminding yourself of that. So that was uh, Jesse Royer still being in uh, Nilado earlier. Yeah, she's talking about the Shaktulik checkpoint, which is um, still go still a food supply for the dogs, still has straw to rest the dogs, still has fuel to cook for the dogs, but is not going to have any shelter for the mushers and is not going to be a dog drop where they can leave a dog behind if somebody's having a problem. So this is going to make a long stretch of trail for the mushers where they're not going to have any real support out there. It is traditionally a, um, a pivotal checkpoint. I personally haven't stopped there in quite a while. It's a checkpoint that I've kind of skipped over. There are very good ways to run up the coast without using, without using Shaq Tulik. Um, you know, Jessie's talking about it being a, a key part of her strategy. And I don't doubt that that's the case, but you know, of course, everybody's going to be dealing with with this. So the question is not whether or not it's um, it's a big factor to the race, or whether or not it's going to affect things. The question is which musher is going to take this new information, process it, and come up with the best alternate strategy because they were all in the same situation. Um, 
So I, I hope Jesse's not worrying about that too much. Forget that Shaq Tulik ever existed and make a new plan with where you're coming from. She's in a fine spot, leaving Caltag on her eight hour break. I think she actually has more choices than some of the other mushers as to how she handles that because she is coming off her eight hour break there in Caltag. Um, yeah, I don't see it as a big hindrance. I know it's a lot to process for her right now, but by the time she gets there, I'm sure she'll have a good plan. You know, again, just forget that it was ever a checkpoint. You know, that's yesterday, today, you have new information, and that is there's straw and food at Shaq Tulik, but nothing else. Just work with that and move forward. And uh, previously and uh, earlier, we saw that Thomas Werner just left uh, Caltech. But uh, before, uh, we s we'll see now some pictures of him getting into Nilado. Yeah, Thomas coming in here with a lot of fluffy, happy dogs. Um, Man, he does have some hairy dogs out there. This warm weather can't be helping him at all, but he's still posting good run times. On the way over to Nolato, he did that run in about six hours and 40 minutes. Um, a fine run time compared to the other teams in the race. Um, I think he had the fastest time. I'm looking down the line here. I'm not seeing anybody that did it faster than him. So um, he still had a good run despite it being warmer. Of course, that's affecting all the dog teams, but he does have some longer haired dogs, so that's a, a bit more of a challenge for him, I suppose. Um, you know, getting checked in, they got to sign, the, sign the, the vet books and sign in on the, the timesheet there. Um, that's the vet book that they're actually looking at right now. The vet's flipping through it. They're going to look at what uh, the other veterinarians have written in that book in the previous checkpoint to see if there's anything specific they need to look at or check on before the team moves on. <laughs> Thomas's dogs aren't being too patient, but that's what you want to see right there is a, a team that doesn't want to stand still. So uh, it's kind of funny. You got the vet following along, trying to, <laughs> trying to look through the book as the dog team is mushing away. <laughs> but that's a, that's a strong team. And again, they are kind of in the driver's seat at this point. And while being in Nilato, we got an interview with Thomas. Start off with the easy question. How's everything going so far? Well, it's going good, pretty good. It was a steady run, but uh, soft trails. Punchy trail, so but it was okay. Just this section's been punchy. I mean, the rest of the trail in general has it just been? Yeah, it's been really good. It was been an amazing job of the trail breakers putting out that trail, but you saw all that snow coming. Yeah. So good job. How's your team? I mean, this is their first time racing in the Iditarod, right? Yeah. How's, how are they? How are they handling it? Well, they're used to the race in Norway, so you know it's not that different. Especially when you got all the snow. That's then it's more similar. Yeah. Um, the, the checkpoint change, has that has that changed your plan of attack at all? No. Not really. Not really? No. You already, you already got your eight, right, in yeah. Ruby. So you're pretty much yeah. home free for a while, huh? Yeah, I got, I got all the things I need in the sled. I got safety bag, I got all the things, shovel. You know, I can stop whenever I want. So it doesn't matter if the checkpoint's here or for it's a nice place, comfy with a bed. <laughs> That's also nice, but... Yeah. Are you feeling pretty good about your position right now? It's a good position, you know, and yeah, of course, now I can, I can start adding some rest, not cutting rest, to, you know, to try to catch up. So, so I've like to actually add half an hour, one hour more than I have planned on every stop. If I have it, if I can, if somebody comes, I will just cut down to the basic rest again. And I do hear rumors that the race is evolving right now. Dallas, can you give us an update? Absolutely. Let's take a look at the map here. The first musher out of Caltech checkpoint was Thomas Werner. Um, he is still out in front there. Behind him, we have Aaron Burmeister still in second, but just barely. Jesse Royer has started out about 12 minutes behind Aaron Burmeister and now has caught up with him. Uh, so that's Thomas Warner out in front. He's made it up uh, through kind of most of the stair steps. He's now in the flatter terrain, and he's traveling a little bit faster. And if we go back down the trail here a little bit, um, we see about uh, 8.7 and 8.9 miles behind him. We have Aaron Burmeister and Jesse Royer right together here. There's only two-tenths of a mile between them. Um, and again, Jesse Royer left the previous checkpoint about 12 minutes behind him. So she has made up time as they've gone up the stair steps. They're reaching kind of the, the plateau up there, and you should see their speed begin to pick up. In fourth position, we have Wade Mars, who uh, had a nice rest of uh, about five hours and seven minutes at the previous checkpoint before taking off. 
Uh, behind him, we have Brent Sass, who's coming off his eight hour mandatory rest and is you know, cruising down the trail. He left about 20 minutes behind Wade Mars. And um, you know, it's, it's hard to say if he's made up any real time. I'm gonna assume, looking at the distance there, that he has made up a little bit of time on him. Uh, with Wade, or, uh, Wade Mars has 12 dogs, Brent Sass has 13. Now moving back down the trail, we're gonna see some mushers who just recently have left the Caltag checkpoint. Uh, we have Ryan Reddington and you are Olsum have just left the checkpoint in position six and seven. And right behind them, we have Mitch Seavey. Now, Ryan Reddington stayed at the checkpoint for about four hours and 45 minutes. Um, you are also stayed for 4.43. Those two mushers had almost identical run times going to the Caltech checkpoint of five hours and 48 minutes. Mitch Seavey left after just two hours and 58 minutes. Um, now he did have a much faster run time. He ran about an hour faster than Ryan Reddington and you are going to the Caltech checkpoint now taking a little bit less rest and, and leaving right with them. So Mitch is now you know, moved up to several positions and is in eighth position. So we're seeing a team accelerating here. The question is gonna be, can he hold on to that speed that he had going to Caltag with a shorter rest? We may see him take a longer break on the trail over to Unilaclete, you know, kind of in the middle of that trail there after taking a shorter rest in the Caltag checkpoint. And as we see, the first mushers are moving towards the next checkpoint, Unalakleet, which is the 15th checkpoint during the Iditarod Trail. We will look at this uh, closer at this uh, checkpoint.
And we will talk more about the Unala Clay checkpoint a little later. But first, while we have Dallas, CV and Hanna with us now, let's talk some strategy and tactics moving forward. Well, Dallas, I've been seeing a little bit of the run times and um, the resting time in Caltag and the run times over to Caltag. I see your dad, Mitch, he had the fastest run time over to Caltag in four hours and 45 minutes. He is coming directly out of his eight hour mandatory rest in Nulato. And uh, he rested for just uh, three hours approximately in, uh, in Caltag. Uh, we have seen Ray Reddington and Jor uh, Ulsom. Um, they're traveling almost this, on the same time and resting then also uh, exactly the same uh, same time. And they are traveling together. Um, Jor have 10 dogs. Uh, Ryan Reddington have 11 and your father Mitch CV have also 11. And they are uh, approximately then uh, going out and from Caltag like three and a half hours after then Thomas Werner. How do you see that your father is resting like um, just for three hours? Ryan Reddington and you are, uh, is resting then nearly five hours, 4.45. Um, mm -hmm. Then how does that affect the teams and the strategies? Yeah, well, there's a lot of strategy coming together at this point in the race. Now, this has a lot to do with where the musher chose to take their mandatory eight-hour rest on the river. I believe both Ryan and uh, UR took their mandatory eight in the Galena checkpoint. I believe that's correct. Um, yeah, so they had taken that rest, and uh, certainly UR took that rest in Galena. He then had to run to Nolato, about a 50 mile run. That was a fairly challenging run. It took most mushers about six and a half to seven hours. He then rested there and did another run that took him about five hours and 45 minutes to get to Caltag. So he's had those two longer runs since his last rest. And so I think they needed to take a longer break to sustain the speed that they had. From my dad's standpoint, Mitch, when he took his mandatory eight in Nolato, he just did a 35 mile run over to Caltag. It only took the dogs four hours and 45 minutes, and then they stopped and rested for about three hours. So you gotta look at the, the ratio between the amount of run time and the amount of rest time. Now run time is kind of a, it's a difficult one to calculate because of course those two teams both traveled the same distance, but it was harder for a team that was moving a little bit slower. They were out there for longer doing it. They're gonna need to have a little more rest. On the other side, the team that's going faster is exerting a little more energy to cover that distance. But um, I think it sets both of them up well. When I think of what my dad taking just a three hour rest in Caltag, what I'm thinking is going through his mind here is we just did a short run. The dogs are fully rested coming off their eight in Nolato. I think that's evidenced by the fact that they went over to the next checkpoint about an hour faster than most of the other teams. You know, that's clearly a rested team. So when he takes that three hour break, I'm seeing it as a refuel stop, get food in the dog's stomach, get a good meal. Uh, the dogs aren't really ready for a long rest. Many of these mushers have been doing six and seven hour runs. This is a four, and a, you know, four hours and 45 minute run for him. So I think he's thinking, take a short break, recharge them, continue on down the trail, take another break, give him another recharge, maybe even a little bit longer break, and then go on to Unilacleet. I think what a lot of mushers would have done from the Nolato checkpoint after taking their eight would have been to go past the Caltag checkpoint, stop maybe 20 miles down the trail, take one rest there, and then go all the way to Unilacleet. So I know we're looking at that rest as a shorter rest, but I think that's actually a conservative play, and I'd be willing to bet he ends up with more accumulated rest by the time he actually reaches Unilacleet. He's probably decided to break it into three runs instead of two. So maybe give him two three-hour rests instead of one five-hour rest in the middle. So they'll probably end up with more rest doing this approach, keep the run short, get more meals into the dogs, and he's probably trying to preserve that speed because right now he has the fastest team. 
by quite a bit. You know, he's 45 minutes faster than Thomas Werner in just a 35 mile run. That's a significant speed difference. So when I'm looking at this, he's a ways behind Thomas, quite a ways behind Thomas. But he might actually have the team that has the speed to be able to catch up with him. The question is, can he hold on to that speed for the next 350 miles? But, uh, you know, again, 350 miles is a long time. If you're just going even 30 seconds a mile faster than your competitors, you're going to rack up, what's that, 175 minutes between there and the finish just on runtime. So this is a really interesting uh, situation. He is farther back than from the leaders. He's, you know, came in the, to, into that checkpoint, I think, in 10th position, left in 7th or 8th position. Um, it, it's a race, though. We have a race on our hands, and it is kind of interesting seeing a speedy team coming along. The real question is, are they still going to be the fastest team when they get to Unilookly? And as a, as a four-time champion uh, yourself, Dallas, uh, we will look at the piece, uh, learning more about dog training. Before stepping foot on the Iditarod Trail, every single musher has put thousands of hours of training on themselves and their dog teams. This training starts in the very beginning of summer, and that's just called having a healthy, happy dog. We're exercising on a daily basis in May, June, July, August. It's just about keeping them active. Some mushers will have advanced methods of you know, exercising the dogs, whether it's a giant hamster wheel or a great big run pin where the dogs can go play. But September 1st seems to be the, the normal starting time when real training starts. And mushers are gonna hook up teams of dogs in front of an ATV, a four-wheeler or a side-by-side, and they're gonna mush just like they would in the winter time, except for you've got dirt and mud on the ground and the musher's sitting on a four-wheeler, using that as resistance to keep the dog slowed down to a realistic pace. Usually eight to 10 miles an hour, the pace will be racing on the Iditarod. We're gonna be training on four-wheelers and side-by-sides for September and October. November is a tricky month though. November we start to get snow and certain parts of the state and you'll start to see mushers traveling from their home base, traveling farther north to go find that snow. By this time in the year, the mushers that will have built from going in maybe five mile runs five times a week in September, gradually up to doing maybe back to back 50 mile runs, like a 50 mile run on Monday, 50 mile run on Tuesday, and then give the dogs Wednesday off. In the beginning of December, we have to be on snow. This is where you're gonna be going out if you don't have snow at home and really making a point to search out those snowy trails. Now you're on sleds. This is what mushers love, is traveling down the trail with a team of dogs on their sled. Now this is also when training starts to be more about series of training events, um, series of runs where you're linking a 50 mile run and then a four or five, maybe six hour rest and then another 50 mile run, just like the dogs are gonna be doing on the Iditarod. These series are crucial for teaching both the mushers and the dogs how to be good at living on the trail. You know, having a good checkpoint routine for the musher where they can get the dogs bedded down and fed quickly and efficiently and make sure that every one of the dog's needs is seen to in an efficient manner and they're not overlooking anything because they have a routine. For the dogs, they have to be comfortable being out here knowing that their every need is going to be met, knowing that they're gonna lay down and sleep on this straw and the musher is gonna bring them their food in their turn. And so it's really about training the whole dog. These series of training runs might be up to three or 400 miles long in December and January. Typically in January, we start to focus on mid-distance racing. Now you have the series of runs, but it's also combined in the racing environment, where you have the checkpoints and the veterinarians and the other teams that are out there competing as well, which adds a whole nother layer. But this is still training, because in March, you have the Iditarod. And every musher that runs in the Iditarod, well, at least almost every musher that runs in the Iditarod, this is their big event. So they're gonna taper through much of February, letting the dogs rest up and really make sure they're fully charged and ready to attack the Iditarod Trail. Finally, you have the first Saturday in March when it's game time and all the training is done and it's time to see what you've got on the Iditarod Trail.
and we're seeing that there's so much training and preparations uh, ahead of Iditarod. But still now we're learning that Richie Deal and Matthew Failer uh, is having issues along the trail. Yeah, there are challenges along the way, and you know I think that's really important to make sure that you have the right mindset going into the Iditarod. When I think of training a dog team, um, that is what the winter is about. I've chosen to spend, you know, if when, when I when I am racing, you know, I choose to spend this winter training this dog team, creating. It's kind of like creating a little bit of a piece of art here. You take these raw materials, which is each individual dog, each individual personality, each individual athlete, each individual character, and you're going to develop each of these dogs and then meld them into a team over the course of the winter. And it's very important that when you start the Iditarod, you can look back and say, man, I had a fantastic winter. I am so grateful to be able to have spent this winter working with my best friends, creating this team. Um, this winter is a success. Now, we get to go race the Iditarod as kind of a, a fun finish to the year. And then you, whatever happens on the Iditarod happens on the Iditarod. What you cannot do is feel like you are suffering through training or having to work really hard through training, and the reward is the Iditarod. Because more often than not, the Iditarod might be a, a disappointing outcome as far as racing, right? You might race your entire career and never win the Iditarod. And so I think it's really important not to put that pressure on yourself. You can't go into this race thinking that the race has to justify the year. No. The training year is justifying itself because you simply love doing that. And then the race is a bonus that you get to do at the end. And I think that's a big uh, mental difference, being able to go into this race, make the decisions that you need to make that uh, are right for the team, being able to step away from the race. You know, we saw Brent Sass earlier in this broadcast when we were talking about him and stopping on the trail, um, taking an extra three-hour break between Nolato and Caltech. To be able to make a decision like that and give up time in the race and step away from the race, you have to feel like this winter has already been a huge success simply because I got to spend the year training sled dogs, regardless of any race. So I think that's a really important mindset that has certainly been helpful for me going into the race where I don't feel like there's pressure on the race to justify the year or to you know make sense of all of this. The race is something fun we get to do at the end. I love training dogs. I love developing a team. And I, I love racing as well. So that's fun to be able to do that. But I'm still training dogs even if I'm not running a race. That's not really necessary for me to enjoy that. And we see that there's so much training behind. And these dogs are top athletes. Uh, Hanna, how are sled dogs different from regular pet dogs? Yeah, this is really, really uh, top athlete, athletes. Uh, they have been breeding for, for years to, to do this job um, or for be racing dogs. And um, they have been trained and selected uh, then for breeding the different lines. Then, and uh, the capacity of these dogs is uh, actually that was do, are doing them able to, to run for this thousand, uh, thousand mile race. And the, we can, uh, there have been a, a lot of research of, uh, of uh, these dogs and we are seeing in the, the blood work before the race. Um, it's uh, actually um, uh, seeing how good they are in uh, the blood works and uh, the oxygen that they are uh, uh, um, mounting in the in the bodies. So this is uh, and with the training they are. It's like top athletes in skiing or triathletes or something like that uh, in the human world. Uh, this is uh, really really top athletes that uh, have been uh, different from human. You are breathing these dogs to do this uh, these races. And Dallas, something that really fascinates me, uh, that uh, I heard that dogs have really big hearts. Yeah, they do actually have the largest heart proportionate to their body mass of any mammal. Uh, and that is a very important factor for them to be able to do what they do. Canines are a phenomenal creature. Um, uh, you know, obviously, when you think of endurance athlete, you, you're thinking of something that has large lung capacity, has the ability to uh, process a lot of calories. That's a very important factor here. And those are two things sled dogs do phenomenally well and canines in general do very well. So these dogs have the ability to consume 10 to 12,000 calories a day very efficiently 
well, first of all, they're running on fats, which is the perfect fuel for an endurance athlete to be burning is fat. So they already have a system designed to run on fats rather than, uh, you know, carbohydrates broken down. So these guys have the right system. They can turn that fat into body fat very efficiently and quickly. They can either burn fat that they have just ingested or they can switch to burning body fat very efficiently. That's a transition that's much harder for humans to do. We hear of human athletes, uh, marathon runners, you know, talking about bonking or hitting the wall at 20 miles on a marathon. This is generally when their body runs out of glucose in the bloodstream and has to start utilizing stored body fat. This is a difficult transition and a difficult process for a human athlete, and a canine does it very easily. But yeah, the, the canine's heart is the, the, a key factor. They have the largest heart of any mammal just to start with. They can build their heart up to, I believe it is 1% of their body mass uh, through training and exercise. It starts out at, I think, 0.08 of their body mass whereas most other mammals have a heart that's 0.06 of their body mass, at least to begin with, and they can develop it higher than that. So the, the sled dog, I think, is one of the top canine athletes there is, and canines in general are a phenomenal traveling animal. So it's a pretty unique uh, animals there, uh, Hanna. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's really, really fascinating how how these uh, these dogs uh, are improving. Uh, then, and uh, as uh, Dallas was telling us, uh, this uh, um, how they are uh, physically in war, then uh, able to to run this distance for so many then days, then uh, uh, days after days. It's uh, it's really, really fascinating. But of course, they have to be in the uh, trained for for this uh, to do uh, to able so we can have sled dogs that are retired they love to be on the coach and you can't just take the the dog out and go for for miles and miles for runs they have to be then adapted to the environment and adapted to the training and the physical and the mental then uh, um, uh, ch challenges uh, along the trail mm. We will take a closer look at the lead dog. Having great lead dogs is a crucial element to success on the Iditarod. There's many different types of lead dogs that mushers are gonna have on the Iditarod. One thing that they're all gonna have in common though is they're gonna be some of the best athletes in the team. It doesn't matter how great your lead dog is for steering and voice commands and all the other qualities and traits, if the dog's not a good enough athlete to set a sharp pace all the way to Nome. And that dog has to be a good enough athlete to be one of the dogs at the end of the race where great leaders really matter. So you look at a few different types of lead dogs a team generally has. You might have a sensitive lead dog, a lead dog that's more feeling, aware of the musher, that really wants to please. This dog is great for steering commands. If it's a wind blowing, kind of clean slate type of terrain where there is no trail to follow, you need a lead dog that takes your commands the second you give them and is excited and happy to do that. This would be hard terrain to go through with a really stubborn lead dog who has a mind of their own. However, if you get on the Yukon River or any other portion of this race and you're driving into 40 or 50 mile an hour winds with deep snow, a sensitive lead dog in this setting is not gonna have fun. It's gonna be difficult for them. Now's the time for the stubborn lead dog. A lead dog that can put his head down and walk along, maybe even at a very slow pace, a pace that could be frustrating for some other leaders, but just be content, they're stubborn, they're gonna power through it. That's the time for the stubborn lead dog to shine. Now we do have speed leaders as well. If you took your speed leader and put him in that same deep snow or strong wind, it would be frustrating for that dog to have to go slow and lead. But when you get out on a different section of trail where it's glazed and the surface is perfect and it's time to go nine and a half, 10 miles an hour, now it's time for that speed leader to go up front and set a fast pace and drive to the next checkpoint. So you see you have different types of lead dogs within that one team. And it's all about picking the right lead dog for the right condition so you set that dog up for success. But the ultimate lead dog, the lead dog that you will hear mushers talk about back when they won this side did or otter, had a great race here. The lead dogs that win the Golden Harness Award, these have the whole package. This is a complete lead dog. It's a lead dog that can adapt to every situation. They're almost always the best athlete the musher has ever seen. They're a lead dog that maybe it took years of training because they are a little more stubborn, but now they trust the musher and they will steer anywhere you ask them to go. 
they're gonna be able to set a fast pace on a good trail, but they'll also be able to tone it down and march through deep soft snow or driving winds for hours at a time. This is the whole package. This is the ultimate lead dog, the lead dog that a musher might only get once or twice in a 20 year career. And now the mushers are on their way to Yunala Cleet. What type of lead dog would be good at this stretch? Yeah, I mean, of course, it depends on the trail out there. But I think you want a lead dog that's comfortable to put their head down and march through it. This might be the day for a stubborn lead dog up there. It's too soon for your speed leaders. Uh, you don't want the speed leaders setting a fast pace uh, and tiring out the rest of the team or tiring themselves out going up over the, the Caltag Portage here, going over to Unilacleet. I would be saving them for either a, if the trail gets much better or for maybe the last two or three runs of this race. Um, you also might switch the lead dogs in the middle of a single run. You know, if you feel like you need to get to the next checkpoint quickly, you've got a little more fuel in the team, you need to maybe burn off a little bit of that steam, maybe you'll put that faster leader up there. But I'm going to guess that most of these guys are putting their hardened, stubborn lead dogs up there that are going to put their head down, be content walking at six and a half, seven miles an hour through the slower trail, and not going to get frustrated with that. Um, that's probably who they're using at this moment. And right now, Thomas Werner is in the lead of the race, and we will get to know one of his best lead dogs, K2. I think lead dog, it's the most important dog, because this dog was actually taking momentum in the team and making the dogs move forward. All the dogs in the team can be lead dogs, but you have some dogs in the beginning of a race, you want to hold the team back without breaking. So you're actually putting up dogs that are a little, not so hard charging. But on the end of the race, you're looking at the team and say, okay, this dog is charging more than this dog. I, no, I will try this one and see if I can get a little more speed into the team. The attitude is actually what you are putting up dogs in front. Like Jackie, she's so not so fast, but she's very steady, likes to go in, in uh, the weather. Jackie, she loves the food. She's always stealing all the food. So one of the most things with Jackie is to make sure that she doesn't get too fat. <laughs> she's a good eater. Uh, I have Krull, he's one of my main speed leaders. When I put him in front, you know, the speed goes flying. So uh, this is uh, Krull. If I put him in front of the team in the beginning of the race, I don't think I will go to the finish line. He will actually take the team up in too high speed and things will happen. This is one of my really, really good dogs. This is Bark. He's very happy for women. That's the only problem with him. So if you have a dog that's a little in the heat, he, uh, he will not focus so much on pulling. Then he's more focused on the women. That's the only weakness he has, actually. But this is also an incredible athlete and then never seem tired, always ready to go, eating his food, and will always be there. This is Kotu, and uh, this is my, I don't like to have favorite dogs, but uh, this is actually the main guy. This is actually what the dog makes that you can win races. He has this incredible inside engine, and he, I've never seen a dog tired. I've never seen him not wanting to run, and he's always going, and he has good fur, he eats good, and it's just a perfect sled dog. So this is actually the dog that I've been using in front. It is the most important lead dogs now, even if I have many other great lead dogs. So, so if I had to pick one, this would be the dog I will pick in the dog yard, actually, to say this is the greatest one. But they're all good. <laughs> So you should not have a favorite, but uh, you obviously have one. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the poodle that's running around in his yard. I'm wondering <laughs> if he has a new secret breeding program going on and in a few years, if we're going to see some standard poodles out on the trail again. No, um, I think all of us end up with a couple favorite dogs. And I know I've had numerous favorite dogs. Um, several favorites at the same time actually and, and many of them are favorites for different reasons you know you might have one that's a favorite because you just love their personality the dog that pops into my mind right now is i, I have a dog named barley um, and he's just a floppy happy dog he's a big boy a great athlete he was never a really a lead dog a, you know a good athlete a hard-working dog but never a leader 
but I just loved his personality. He just always has a big smile on his face, and it doesn't matter the mood that you're in. He's going to take it up a few more notches just because that's who Barley is. I have other dogs like um, Guinness, who was actually my, my Golden Harness winning lead dog from the 2012 Iditarod. She raced with me for many, many years, and she wasn't a real bubbly, outgoing sort of dog, but she was just so business-like, you know, she was so dang good at what she did, right? She loved traveling, she loved mushing. Um, she was friendly and nice, but she wasn't like a cuddly, affectionate type of dog. She's not the type of dog that you, you know, put in bed with you and, and curl up with. But, you know, there's a real respect for a dog like that. And also a lot of pride in a dog like that because I watched her develop and grow and went from being an okay sled dog that was not really destined to be a racing dog so much as a breeding female and become, you know, the best dog in the Iditarod. She won the MVP award and she won the Iditarod, right? So a lot of pride and respect for a dog like that. So you might have two favorites or numerous favorites, but for a little bit different reasons for each of them. Thank you, Dallas. Now, there's a lot of wolves in Alaska, and we met with a native who hunts wolves to protect his small community. This is uh, one of the wolves I got that was, uh, when we were hunting, he was sneaking around in the woods in the grass. And I just happened to see him sneaking toward, uh, sneaking toward our, our, our kill, our moose kill. So yeah, he was with another black one, but the black one got away. So I got him though. I hunt wolves, yes. Try to keep the population down so they can, uh, don't wipe out our moose. There's a lot of problems all over the state, and you know they used to have aerial wolf hunting further down, but we don't, they don't, we don't do that around here. We just go out and take care of them on our, on our own. So we have moose to hunt in our hunting season. Just like four miles down, you'll hit a hit where they're killing moose already, killing young ones. And uh, the snow was, uh, had a great part to do this year. We didn't have no uh, no snow for quite a while, then all of a sudden it got. A lot of snow and the moose are having a hard time getting around so those wolves get them no problem and they're pretty smart animals so you gotta be actually a little smarter than them so they're shy a lot of the, um they're shy from traps and snares and all that they're pretty smart they know they could i mean they can smell you so it's pretty hard to trap them you usually find their kills and then you just snare it off and you get a yeah you usually get the young ones because they don't they're just so um they're not as smart as the older ones and, so you get a lot of young ones out of there, and that's a good thing. If you can get the alphas, that'd be the best, but usually you don't. They've been a group, and the uh, best time to hunt them, like I say, is uh, nighttime and uh, in the morning, early in the morning, is when they're out and about. Now, a time like this now, in the uh, daytime, they'd be probably laying down, sunning themselves, rubbing, getting rid of their fur, because it's just gonna start warming up for them, so. How do you do it? Um... I mean, do you do it on the skis, snowshoes, or snow machine? Snow machine is what we usually we use around here, and you just go go until you hit their tracks, and um, you'll see where they all walk in a line, and uh, you just follow their tracks until you see them where they start splitting up and running from you, and you know they're on them, and chase can last for 20, 30 miles before you even get them. I mean, before you even see them, it's just, and they'll usually hit to the timber line, and they'll, once they hit the timber line, they'll usually get away from us, or hit the mountains, they'll usually get away from us. Why is that? Because it's hard. Snow machines are pretty awesome, but they can't go everywhere. What do you do with the fur? Well, look at the rough on your jacket. So there you go. That could you and... Could you tell me, what kind of fur do I have, Kelvin? See, this is wolf. This is wolf, yeah. I actually got it from Alaska, but somebody told me it was wolverine. But no, this is wolverine. This is wolf, right? Could be wolverine. Don't look like it, but yeah, could be. You believe it's wolf? Yeah. Hmm, awesome. <laughs> well, what do you do with the meat? Oh, nothing. We'll, we'll burn it. Yeah, we gotta burn. It's a uh, native belief. Our elders, they say we gotta burn it because uh, 
Wolves got a strong spirit and stuff, I guess they said, same as the Wolverine will burn them. Interesting. Yeah, burn them, I don't know. And otherwise, leave you bad luck. So you want to use the, the meat as bait for some other animals? You never see them uh, eating each other unless they're really hungry. But they will. They will, uh, they will eat, each, eat each other. Last question, Kelvin. How many wolves do you believe is in this area of Kaltag? Let's see, I got one, two, three, four. So about five packs I know around here. So in five packs, let's see, there's eight, eight about eight are packs, so about 40. Yeah. And that's within about a 25, 30 mile range. Will there be any of these packs on the direction, in the direction of Old Woman Cabin going through Unalakleet for the mushers? There's a pack out here, about five of them. They're black wolves too. There's five in the pack, but they're one of the ones you can't get because as you go out here, they hang in the pass. In the pass, you got no, it's hard riding in there with snow machine, so. But you see them, I mean, they got away from me twice, so. So the mushroom might see the black, uh, the black uh, wolves in the pack up in here, yeah. Yeah, you have a good chance, but I mean, they're quiet. And after, um, for some reason, like when, after the, I did a rot coast through every year, no matter which way they come from, up river or down river, um, wolves will, because of the dogs, you know, wolves will go to the river and they smell it, so they will go there. How does it feel to live in a village with wolves around you? You know, the, it's pretty awesome actually, because uh, we we're, we're ain't afraid of them and they're afraid of us, so we're still at the top, I think, so. And our reporter Nina is waiting for the mushers in Unalakleet. And while she's waiting, she is having a blast. the checkpoint of Yunalaklis, a small Inupiat village by the Bering Sea. So we have the beach and the Bering Sea right behind me here. As you see, my glasses are getting really wet right now. It's snowing. It's been snowing a lot since yesterday night. The snow is wet. Today we've been walking around the village. We've seen small kids making snowmen. We know the people here are using a lot of time to shovel snow for their, uh, their houses. People mostly have snow machines, four-wheelers and cars here, but they, today most of them are using four-wheelers or snow machines to move around. It's again a lot of snow here now and the snow is really heavy. As you might see, it's a wet snow. I'm able to make a snowball, right? So it sure is going to be one uh, tough uh, trail coming over from Kaltag. The free smasher do need to make trail, to break trail, and that's going to be tough. Because it's not only a lot of new snow, it's heavy snow, it's wet snow. It's about zero degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, this jacket is actually too warm for me right now, but I'm traveling, so just a little bit. I don't have too much space for much uh, clothes in my luggage, so, well, just gonna take it off. It's just too warm, really. It's nice. We've seen people actually walking around in shorts here today. I mean, I wouldn't do that, but it is warm. And uh, as you see, the boats, the, the cars here, the whole area, it's just a lot of fresh snow 
heavy snow and well, we're not expecting the measures in to uh, Unalakleet as soon as we thought. They will probably not be here until tomorrow sometime. So it's sure going to be a long, tough um, ride for the, uh, the dogs and the measures coming here uh, with all this snow. They had to break trail. But this is a bit rad. This is how it is competing in the winter. Wow, let's go make some snow angels. Yeah, it's gonna be wet. I didn't think about that. But you know, it's nice just laying around in the snow. What a great race this is. The last great race. It is 95 years since the legendary Serum run to Nome. And now the Alaskan wilderness is facing another race where disease is stealing the headlines. We got a hold of the mayor in Anchorage, in Anchorage who's talking about the coronavirus and how it affects Alaska. I'm standing here with the mayor of Anchorage, Mr. Ethan Berkowitz, and thank you for taking this time and talk to us here. Um, I did rod. It's important for the town of Anchorage. Could you tell, tell me a little bit about how you build on that? Well, dogs are a critical part of Anchorage's heritage, but the Iditarod itself is a great party that brings people from all over Alaska and all over the world to Anchorage, and it's a, a great way for us to celebrate and share our heritage with so many people. It's important in terms of marketing for the place? It, it's a great tourist draw. There's no question about that. And tell me a little bit. Um, I saw you at this show start down in Anchorage together with the the the, the mayor of Nome. Mm -hmm. um, how are you guys, different mayors, to go on together to get this this underway? Do you have an incorporation somehow? Well, the we we know each other from many years, and the mayors of Nome and the mayor of Anchorage is always a friendly little bit of rivalry between us. But it's also one state, and even though we are so far apart, we we feel re very proud, both of us, to be Alaskans. And nowadays, in, in Europe, everything is closing down, of course, because of the coronavirus. Um, could you give us a little update on the situation here in Anchorage? You know, the, the coronavirus came in its greatest strength while the Iditarod was getting started. And during the time of the race, we've closed down everything in the municipality of Anchorage. I've closed down all uh, municipal facilities, and we are in a shutdown mode. Schools have closed, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that we reduce the amount of impact impact that the virus has because that's the best way to make sure that our hospital capacity, our medical capacity is what we need it to be when the virus hits in strength. So, so how many cases of the positive cases do you have right now? We just have one case right now, and, and we know it's inevitable that we will have more. We're part of, we're the air crossroads of the world. People come from all over the world here. Alaskans travel everywhere. It's just a matter of time before we get more cases. But we want to make sure that whatever we get is something we can control and can contain. 
Do you understand? Because uh, the organizers now ask people not to go to Nome, to the Finnish area of the Adiada Road. Can you understand why this is important? It's a, it's a remote place. Well, Nome is a fairly small town. There's only 3,000 people who live there. It's not connected by road to any other place. Its hospital capacities, its medical facilities are very limited. And, and we, would, we wouldn't want them to be overwhelmed by any stretch of the imagination. We also want to make sure that all of Alaska has the ability to stay healthy for as long as we can. And that's our wish for not just uh, Alaska, but for people across the world. This is a, a global virus. And one of the things it brings home to us is how connected we are across the world and how, inter and how much we depend on one another. We have the ability to do something to combat this virus, but we have to be smart about it. Everybody has the power to help make the world a little bit safer. And we're, we're just going to have to engage in the kind of practices that will do that. The Department of Human Health Services is involved in and, and having contact with the organizing committee of the Adeta Rod. What kind of, uh, uh, say, what do you say, um, what do they say to you? Well, we're we're getting the same advice that people from the World Health Organization and from the Center for Disease Control in the United States have offered. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Um, practice social distancing and keep an eye out for one another. This is a time for us to be aware of our surroundings. If we're not feeling well, if people we know aren't feeling well, we need to be very attentive to what that means. But we also have to remain calm in the midst of all this. This is not the first time the world has gone through a pandemic like this. This is the first time that we've had the ability to respond so quickly. But it gives everybody, every individual has the ability to help combat this virus, and it's everybody's responsibility to do that. That's how we remain healthy, and that's how we keep our, our fellows across the world healthy as well. Uh, they they canceled the famine race in Norway. Uh, it's a it's a dog sled race in Norway. And is there any has there been any discussions about canceling the data rod? Um, the idea to ride is once it got started, it's going. We've canceled many other events in Anchorage since then and across Alaska since then. It's really important for us not to gather in crowds. One of the virtues of the idea to ride is that it takes place outdoors. And so the, the whole notion of people being close together is incredibly rare. The dogs get much closer together than the people do. Yeah, there's not that much that public around the trails out there, is it? Uh, this a thousand mile race. There's 58 competitors and they stretch out uh, across a good long bit of territory. And so I don't think that there's any real danger to the competitors or for the folks along the trail, but we want to make sure that they don't get together in a crowd and that we, we uh, don't do things that, that create a, be a breeding ground for, for the virus. I will touch up and talk to one of the organizers a little bit later, but thank you so much for your time and um, may this go well here in Anchorage. Well, thank you very much and I hope everybody in Norway and across the world stay safe as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. That was the mayor in Anchorage. And like we saw earlier, it's been, uh, this virus has caused a lot uh, and especially it has impacted the sporting events like the Finnmark race in Northern Norway was canceled due to it. At least I did or it is still going. But what I'm wondering about is that can the virus affect the dogs? Well, of course, the, the virus is now affecting the, the whole country here in now, Norway now. And uh, very many people are asking uh, if the virus can be affecting from between animals and, uh, and humans. Uh, what we know, uh, the, the coronavirus that we are now um, facing uh, with is uh, uh, actually a new type of uh, coronavirus. We have different ki kind of uh, coronavirus and we, all, we have the coronaviruses uh, in animals too, but that is a different kind of virus. What we see now is a, um, a coronavirus that is uh, uh, mainly on human, an infectious disease that are going on hu human. The COVID-19? Yeah, the COVID-19. Um, and it's, a, as I said, a, a new type of virus, so we don't know actually how very, very much about it. But it's not documented that um, 
this virus can go from a human to an animal or versus then from an animal for if you have a dog or something uh, a pet uh, that it's going from uh, infectious from the animal to uh, to the humans and we, it's not documented uh, until now that uh, dogs or pets or livestock can be uh, be sick of the virus but of course it's a new type of virus we don't know everything about it so we have to be uh, careful and as we heard here the mayors are saying wash your hands don't take your hands up in your face and everything and don't um, keep uh, the restrictions that uh, that you are following we also uh talk to the CEO of Iditarod uh, and how the coronavirus is affecting the race. I'm sitting here with Rob Urbeck and you're the CEO of the Iditarod organization and you're a busy man. I've seen you running around for over a week now. How are you doing? Well, it's been intense. We've had a myriad of challenges. We still have a great race going, but uh, I'm uh, holding strong all the way to the finish. Holding strong because there has been some some challenges the, the past days with the coronavirus and you know Europe is closing down for the moment here in Anchorage. I just spoke to the mayor. Things are under control, but they're making precautions. And so, what is happening to the other road? Because people want to know. Sure. I mean, first of all, naturally, we're probably the best example of social distancing. Largely, everyone out in the trail has been in the rural parts of Alaska. Now, we have certainly, uh, the abundance of caution, have pared down all of our people to essential, mission-critical people. That means only people that are handling dogs, veterinarians, the responsible for the safety of the human mushers and the dogs are now on the trail. So we pulled back our operations substantially. And we've also rerouted our checkpoints away from the community centers. We're no longer using schools and community centers at the checkpoints that we normally would. There's a number of challenges. We don't necessarily yeah. have the same internet access. We don't have the same power, the same running water. But we're pretty hardy folk, and our Alaskans were improvising as we go along to make this race as safe as possible. Yeah, because, you know, Finnmark's race in Norway got cancelled. I mean, they're out on the trails, but as you say, they go through small communities and... and are they the vulnerable for for a, for, a, for a coronavirus? Well, I think that most of the people that have been on the trail have been in Alaska for some time. Mm. Uh, so naturally, with the maximum 14-day incubation period, if somebody came down with a virus, it probably already happened. Now, it's not riskless. Because of that, we are not having any contact with villagers that we normally would. We are also have ample disinfectant supplies, wipes, et cetera, and a whole protocol in case there's a problem. So far, we believe that, you know, we don't, there has been no community to community contact in Alaska. You know, maybe that'll change. But right now, we believe we're operating safely. Mm -hmm. You're in contact with the Department of Health and Human Services. What kind of, what do they tell you to do? The, we're taking, we've, we first met with them about two weeks ago it was first we learned of the developing virus and planned out our protocol. We have in, in contact on a daily basis with the governor, with the chief medical officer, with the state epidemiologist on a regular basis mm -hmm. to ensure them that we are practicing the most hygiene for our teams and for all the personnel that are on the trail. We are, again, distancing ourselves from human to human contact. Mm. We are outside. So we canceled our finisher's banquet. We canceled our musher greeting. We're canceling all the ancillary events where there would have been gatherings of people. And we've actually communicated we love our fans. We obviously want them to enjoy and be experienced the Iditarod. And hopefully now they can watch this broadcast mm -hmm. instead of coming live. So unfortunately... This is not the year to travel the trail to go to Nome. Yeah, because you told everybody that, and it concerns me, I'm here in Anchorage, and all the people that don't really have to be there, we already have teams on site, we shouldn't go. So that's what you tell handlers families, mushers families, sponsor, other clients, all the stakeholders of I, I did a road, right? Yes, we've uh, uh, pared down to just the bare bones people that need to produce this race safely. Media aren't going. 
parents, family members aren't going, sponsors aren't going, we're not flying awards or trophies to know, we're not doing dinners, food, we don't have cooks, we don't have our ecosystem is very, very small. Our footprint is very small. And not only is it very small, it is made up almost entirely of people that have been in Alaska for a while. Mm. So unlikely to be carrying in from lower 48. That being said, you know, we don't know <laughs> for sure. But we were producing a race that's very hygienic, yeah. that is practicing the best that we know how to, to ensure that that we maintain the standards in Alaska, which have so far no community community contact. Mm -hmm. And when when the the mushers come into Nome, there will be specific areas they go into and also I've heard that the organization of getting the dogs back, getting people out of Nome has been speeded up. Ordinarily they'd stay in Nome. We do the finishers banquet on the 22nd. They're in Nome for three or four days. It's kind of a celebratory mood, a party. There's a lot of ancillary events. Now it's immediately turned around. So we have just the right amount of people to get their dogs safely transported and the mushers on their way home. So you're confident that this will work out and let's hope so. We're doing the best that we can. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what's safer, being out on the trail or being here in Anchorage. Yeah. And arguably you could say if we were to do something different on the race and brought everybody back to congregate, it may be even more dangerous. So it's really hard and predictable. Things can change any moment now. Mm -hmm. So we're monitoring the situation very, very closely, 24 hours through the night as well. And unfortunately, this is not the year to experience it live. And unfortunately for some of the media folks, they also have to come back next year. So, Rob, we're talking about coronavirus. It's a very important issue this year, but you have been watching the race a bit. What do you think about the race so far? You know, we're having an amazing race. There's a number of people that can still win this race. We got a potential storm coming in tonight. It could change some of the dynamics, but we have a lot of strong teams. We're on the trail is there's many that have very strong dog teams, yeah. fully intact and rare to go. It's going to be very exciting the next three days. It's going to be the toughest hard days that, that's left, right? Absolutely, and that's probably the why the Iditarod is the Iditarod. And all the different elements, you know, all the mustards are still getting supplied with dog food, with heat, with straw for their dogs, but they're getting, it's going to be a little bit different because they're going to be outside of the villages and they're going to need to adapt to that. We're going to make some decisions on when to rest, when to run, and be really critical to them going forward. Close race so far, and I'm really excited. It's fantastic to watch this stream. Well, thank you for the more detailed information about how the organizers is uh dealing with the coronavirus and uh, hopefully maybe next year things will be different hope so thank you very much thank you and back to you in oslo right now
welcome back to more live coverage of the 48th annual Iditarod race. Here's what's happening the upcoming hour. Thomas Werner is holding on to the lead on their way to Unalakleet. The mayor of Anchorage encourages people to not travel to Nome for the finish to prevent the coronavirus from spreading. We're checking in with Greg and Bruce, who's live in Caltag. First, let's look at the map. We have uh, Thomas Werner now in the lead and he is 20 miles, that equals 32 kilometers away from Unalakleet, the next checkpoint. Behind uh, Thomas Werner, he has a pretty good lead here, uh, going from the 14th to the 15th checkpoint. Uh, behind him, we have Jesse Royer. And after that, we have Aaron Burmeister in third. We see that Jesse Royer and Burmeister is actually 10 miles behind Werner. They're running really close together. And then we have Wade Mars at fourth position. Behind there, we have Brent Sass, fifth. Mitch Seavey is uh, sixth behind Sass. You are life set Olsum, seven. Ryan Reddington, eight. Paige Drobny, nine. And Michelle Phillips, tenth. So they're all stacking up there on their way from the 14th to the 15th checkpoint. Earlier today, we saw Thomas Werner coming in to Caltech. He has 12 dogs and uh, they look pretty nice coming in to Caltech. I like their Thomas got in at 5 uh, p.m. Uh, yesterday for uh, American time, Alaskan time, and uh, earlier today in here in Europe. In Caltech, he rested for four hours and 47 minutes. Oh, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Hello there. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Signature right there, please. Yeah. While welcome being Caltech. in Caltech, yeah, we on. got an interview with Thomas. Okay. okay. It's a little heavier going really? here. Yeah. I'm going to go through, straight through. Okay. Yeah, that was the plan. <laughs> but uh, it's too warm, well, too soft. So. Is it the best thing for your dog team to kind of hang out here? And if so, why? My plan, plan A, but you know, in the dog marching, it's uh, never things go, most actually to go through with about 20 miles and then stop, but it's so warm. So I think it's good for the dogs to wait to the, to the night and then cool off. Uh, pretty good much fur on those dogs though. So it's nice to, yeah, a little cooler will be really nice. Did it go through your mind to go through? Hmm? Did it go through your mind at all to maybe go through and kind of wait? And well, I said if it goes easy down, that will go through. But I think it was a, a, not a mental hard tri trip for the dogs, but a physical hard trip because of the heat and soft trail. So, so that's why I think it's good for them for the rest of the muscles and then fly down the trail to an athlete. And Thomas left the Caltech checkpoint at 10 p.m. Okay. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hey, bye-bye. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you. Alright, good, good luck. Go and like we saw on the map, he's now about 20 miles, uh, a bit more than 30 kilometers. Uh, he has that distance before he reaches Unalakleet, the next checkpoint. 
Now we will take a look at some beautiful picture of the Alaskan wilderness. And looking at these beautiful pictures, it's not weird that people come from all over the world to watch this amazing race. Just look at this. From Dallas, Texas, and um, uh, we have followed the Iditarod for years, and um, we're friends with the parents here at Rainy Pass, and um, they gave us the opportunity to come out here to Rainy Pass Checkpoint. And so I pulled my two little girls that are 10 and 12 out of school, and. Uh, they got to ride with Anna and Christy Barrington uh, a few days ago at the ceremonial start, and then we came out here, and uh, what, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be here on the ground and see one of the coolest sports, I think, that's the um, left today. I mean, this is really neat, and um, with, you know, over a 1,000 miles in nine days is amazing, and they're athletes, um, tremendous athletes, and uh, so I get to feel it firsthand with my kids and family. They were ecstatic, and um, the Barrington twins were just darling. Um, and uh, I mean, they'll never forget it. It was so cool and going downtown with all the screaming and hollering, and and then to come out here and you know feel it, breathe it. It's pretty amazing. And one week ago, 57 dog teams headed out from the starting line in Willow. And not everyone uses uh, sled dogs to, to cover this 1,000 mile long distance from Willow to Nome. Somebody actually uses a bike. We had some technical problems, but here we uh, have our reporter Nina with us and she met someone who is hunting wolf to protect his local community. This is uh, one of the wolves I got that was, uh, when we were hunting, he was sneaking around in the woods in the grass. I just happened to see him sneaking toward, uh, sneaking toward our, our, our kill, our moose kill. So yeah, he was with another black one, but the black one got away. So I got him though. A hunt wolf, yes. Try to keep the uh, population down so they can, uh, don't wipe out our moose. There's a lot of problems all over the state, and you know they used to have aerial wolf hunting further down, but we don't, they don't, we don't do that around here. We just go out and take care of them on our, on our own. We have moose to hunt in our hunting season. Just like four miles down, you'll hit a hit where they're killing moose already, killing young ones. And uh, the snow was uh, had a great part to do this year. We didn't have no uh, no snow for quite a while, then all of a sudden it got a lot of snow and the moose are having a hard time getting around so those wolves get them no problem. And they're pretty smart animals so 
you gotta be actually a little smarter than them. So they're shy a lot of, the, um, they're shy from traps and snares and all that. They're pretty smart. They know, they could, I mean, they can smell you. So it's pretty hard to trap them. You usually find their kills and then you just snare it off and you get a, yeah, usually get the young ones because they don't, they're just so, um, they're not as smart as the older ones. And so you get a lot of young ones out of there and that's a good thing. If you can get the alphas, that'd be the best, but usually you don't. They'd be in a group and uh, best time to hunt them, like I say, is uh, nighttime and uh, in the morning, early in the morning, is when they're out and about. Now, a time like this now, in the uh, daytime, they'd be probably laying down, sunning themselves, rubbing, getting rid of their fur because it's just gonna start warming up for them, so. How do you do it? Um, I mean, do you do it on the skis, snowshoes, or snow machine? Snow machine is what we usually we use around here, and you just go go until you hit their tracks, and um, you'll see where they all walk in a line, and uh, you just follow their tracks until you see them where they start splitting up and running from you, and you know they're on them. And chase can last for 20, 30 miles before you even get them. I mean, before you even see them, it's just. And they'll usually hit to the timber line, and they'll once they hit the timber line, they'll usually get away from us, or hit the mountains, they'll usually get away from us. Why is that? Because it's hard. Snow machines are pretty awesome, but they can't go everywhere. What do you do with the fur? Well, look at the rough on your jacket. So there you go. That could you and... Could you tell me, what kind of fur do I have, Kelly? Okay, this is wolf. This is wolf, yeah. I actually got it from Alaska, but somebody told me it was wolverine. But no, this is that ain't wolverine. This is wolf, right? Could be wolverine. Don't look like it, but yeah, could be. You believe it's wolf? Yeah. Hmm, awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, what do you do with the meat? Oh, nothing. We'll, we'll burn it. Yeah, we gotta burn. It's a uh, native belief. Our elders, they say we gotta burn it because uh, wolves got a strong spirit and stuff. I guess they said, same as the wolverine, we'll burn them. Interesting. Yeah, burn them, I don't know. And otherwise, leave you bad luck. So you want to use the, the meat as bait for some other animals? You'll never see them. Uh, eating each other unless they're really hungry. But they will, they will, uh, they will eat, each, eat each other. Last question, Kelvin. Do, how many wolves do you believe is in this area of Kaltag? Let's see, I got one, two, three, four. So about five packs I know around here. So in five packs, let's see, there's eight, eight about eight are packs, so about 40. Yeah, and that's within about uh, 25, 30 mile range. Will there be any of these packs on the direction, in the direction of Old Woman Cabin going through Yunalakleet for the mushrooms? There's a pack out here, about five of them. They're black wolves too. There's five in the pack, but they're one of the ones you can't get because as you go out here, they hang in the pass. In the pass, you got no, it's hard riding in there with snow machines, so. But you see them, I mean, they got away from me twice, so. so the mushroom might see the black, uh, the black uh, wolves in the pack. Up in here, yeah. Yeah, you have a good chance, but I mean, they're quiet. And after, um, for some reason, like when after the, I did a rod coast through every year, no matter which way they come from, up river or down river, um, wolves will, because of the dogs, you know, wolves will go to the river and they smell it, so they will go there. How does it feel to live in a village with wolves around you? You know, the, it's pretty awesome, actually. Because uh, well, we ain't afraid of them and they're afraid of us, so we're still at the top, I think, so. And now we're saying good morning to Greg and Bruce. We are, they are live in Caltech. And Greg and Bruce, has the sun started to rise in Caltech?
Good morning, Maria. You know, it hasn't quite yet, but it will, within the hour, we'll start to see the sky lightning, that sun come up on another day on the Iditarod Trail. We're still here at Caltag, about 650 miles into the races. The leader's now bearing down on Unilocleet and the Bering Sea Coast. And oftentimes when the leaders get there and at least that lead pack, it is a really good time, Bruce, to kind of reassess where everybody is, look at run times. This run across the portage to the Bering Sea Coast has been so important over the years, and, and I think it's going to bear out to be that this year as well. Well, it's definitely a place where fans following the race, looking on the trackers, can see compared to each other the overall speed, the average speed of teams relative to each other. There's a steep hilly climb. It's not a steep, steep mountain, but it's a continuously steep climb the first 20 miles or so out of Caltag where we are right now. And then it's kind of levels off uh, through the forest till they get to an area that's kind of his, a historical landmark here called Old Woman uh, Mountain out in the middle of the valley. And then a relatively flat, gently rolling uh, landscape through open tundra is when we finally get out on the Bering Sea the rest of the way in, into Uniclete. So you've got this distance to see a longer average speed one team compared to the other. And it appears uh, by looking at the tracker that Jesse and Aaron Burmeister, who are chasing, trying to chase down Thomas Varner, who is on his way to Uniclete, are stopped out there at a place called Old Woman. You've been there many times. Yeah, it's a historic place. Uh, it's said that... Uh, the spirit of the old woman is at that mountain and that a musher should leave a little or anybody should when they're there that she still wanders around up on that mountain and the shelter cabin there is called the old woman shelter now chase yeah they're they're trying to not let thomas get too far out but also you when you're where they are in this run you're not only thinking about getting to uniclete you're thinking about dividing up over the next hundred miles to run to Koyuk for that run across the Bering Sea ice. So what we've seen historically is some people stop at Old Woman and go to Chateaulik. Some people go to just what's called Last Timber, a little creek with some trees for wind shelter, uh, 20, approximately 20 some miles out of uh, Uniclete and, and then run from there. Some go into Uniclete uh, some go in the Blueberry Hills, which is a series of hills outside of Uniclete and stop. So there's a lot of combinations yeah, they could yeah. be doing. Yeah, a lot of different options uh, for these teams. Old Woman is a place where, too, they'll run into some traffic because I know a lot of the locals living there in Uniclete like to go out to Old Woman Camp and greet the mushers uh, that are coming through there or, or, in some cases, even stopping. We have a couple of camera crews that are at Old Woman and following Thomas Werner. So we'll be able to bring that to you later today from Uniclete. We have a live stream over there as well. Uh, the editor will be getting there this morning to bring those pictures to you from the other areas other than, than Uniclete. We have a lot of dog teams sitting here in Caltech, and they're having really good races, Bruce, really fine races, and certainly winning is not out of the question with what we've seen happen throughout history on trail on that Bering Sea coast. Oftentimes it can be a game changer. The last two years we saw Nick Petit virtually on his way to an Iditarod championship only to be turned back when crossing Norton Sound between Shaktulik and Koyak. I believe it was 2014, Jeff King, what, 20, less than 25 miles away from his fifth Iditarod Championship when a storm shut him down. So there are all kinds of things that can happen in these miles, but right now Thomas Verner's team looks like it's keeping a good speed uh, going to Unilaclete and heading to the coast. But from Unilaclete in, it'll get tough, and there are some way to know him. Outside of Elam, I'm thinking about, and uh, he's got a lot of hard work ahead of him. Yeah, at, outside of... Uh, actually, Uniclete, those blueberry hills, yeah. is a long, steady climb. Then they you, the think of the Bering Sea coast is very flat, but it's not. That's a big climb. Uh, leaving Koyuk, you go up over another set of hills. And as you said, then climbing out of Elam is just a, a big climb, what's called Little McKinley, being that it's so steep. So it's a lot A lot can happen. I would say right now, you know, that those five teams bearing something really big happening those are the ones that have a real shot at winning these other guys are kind of in position back here but the distances 
left in this race and how far these teams sitting here are from the front starts making it pretty difficult to catch up. Unless something happens and, and Mother Nature can certainly do that. There are some teams here, Pete Kaiser's team. We just talked with Jesse Holmes a moment ago. We hope to get Jesse over here in a moment to get on here for a live interview. These are dog teams that have been sitting and resting and, and, and uh, kind of reserving energy and building up energy possibly for a run towards the Bering Sea Coast, the top five finish perhaps put themselves in a position in case something happens and they're there to, to pluck other teams off in front of them. Well, I think the great example of how you can set back and rest and then move to the front to do <clears throat> battle when the race really begins right now is pretty much exemplified by Mitch Seavey. You know, I mean, he's he's been back behind our top 10 positions for a while and suddenly he's pulled that team together and with this run down the Yukon and you know, his rest here and then taking off. He's in fifth place right now in that group. And when I looked at it before, a lot of sections, just as a comparison, uh, the teams were moving and averaging about seven miles an hour, and Mitch was averaging, so we're not counting little ups and down climbs, more like eight. And, you know, for people that have better Internet and the ability to really track to the second than what's going on uh, with the trackers than we often do out here with limited access out in the bush here. Uh, th that's that position reflects how much power and speed he has at this point. Yeah, interesting. I saw Mitch uh, late last night around midnight uh, here locally, and I asked him, "So, you know, <laughs> how did it happen?" And he says, "I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea." Now. Obviously, uh, luck is the residue of design, right? And so his team was able to pick up speed in these last few runs, and it's because he did so many things well prior to that, which allowed that team to reserve energy and then to build up speed here uh, on his way to Caltech. So kudos to him. Yeah, and also there's a saying here that uh, if you maintain the speed of your team and, and take care of them, those teams out in front of you will come back to you that's what mushers talk about yeah. and so in this situation it, it just means if you stay spit steady and they're you they come back to you and you get that that suddenly that getting thrown into the very front packs yeah, jesse come on in here and you can step stand right behind our chairs and we'll talk to you okay. we pulled jesse holmes over and uh this is a guy, I think, running his third Iditarod now. Had great success in his first one. Uh, finished, I think, 27th last year, and now he's back having a great run sitting here in Caltech. So let's start uh, generally. How's the run going overall, Jess? It's been great. You know, I've been camping out a lot and just doing my own thing all the way up till here and taking lots of rest. So it kind of paid off, and I'm here, and people aren't too far in front of me. I'm in a good group. I'm in the money. <laughs> I want to stay there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your run here to Caltech, tell me about the speed and, and why do you think your team has got so much energy right now? Well, they, they're they they're slow compared to what I'm used to because I always had a fast team, but I've trained in the mountains this year and deep snow and uh, they were just solid seven miles an hour coming over here with a good energy and everything in front of them, fed three times coming over here and uh, just really figuring the team out and how to run them in the Iditarod and in these kind of conditions. Yeah, and I know you've got, what, 360 miles or so, 350 miles to uh, the finish line in Nome, but these are important, difficult miles ahead. You've done it a few times now. Your expectations for going forward? Oh, I expect to read the dogs and try to move up in position. I'm thinking 16th place right now coming into here. I was in 34th coming into Ruby. I was also in 34th coming in, leaving Shagaluk the first year. And I was able to move up, you know, nearly 30 positions. So it's going to, you know, be a combination of exercising more patience and also being willing to go for it. I wonder if you could, like, from kind of an educational standpoint for fans looking in at this, you guys have been started off in snow and then we had a lot of 30 below. And now here we are at 30 above again. And I know you guys adjust the food. Can you kind of explain to people, like, okay, now let's talk about right here. Have you changed the diet right here where it's 30 degrees in this wetter snow versus when you were back in 30 below? 
Honestly, I'm pouring more calories to them than I was whenever it was 30 below. The dogs are eating a lot of fat and processing it as energy, and uh, they're at a real high caloric intake right now, probably around 10,000 calories at least. So the only way to keep up with that is fat for fuel. So I'm feeding a lot of pork bellies right now and uh, turkey fat and a lot of fats, beef fat. And then as you're sitting here, are you thinking of just the run to Uniclete and how you're going to run this section? Or are you already projecting and dividing up this run all the way to Koyuk? Oh, I've been thinking about the run all the way to the finish line and what I'm going to do, but that's dictated by the weather and the conditions this year, mostly. You know, what I want to do is just go gung-ho and go for it and try to win this thing, you know, because I, I know coming into here I really truly finally believed i thought looking at this team and how i've taken the patience that i could but i don't want to risk you know a good finish is there one one goal and uh you know that that'll come just keep improving the biggest thing that I, I can see from this i did or out is i learned way more than the first two it's all starting to come together to me i can tell you the exact mistakes i made early on in the race that cost me in the middle of the race, but cost me to be conservative and in the position I am now. This thing is a process. Uh, Jesse, tell us about where you live and how you train. Uh, I know it's somewhat unique compared to the others, and, and you've just bought a new place, and you're out there. Yeah, I'm 30 miles off the Denali Highway. The nearest neighbor is, uh, you know, 25, 30 miles from me, and it's a beautiful new place, and you know, I'm living just like I did in Nenana, getting my uh, water from the river, hunting, fishing, trapping, you know, living the full lifestyle with my dogs. And I just got a lot more freedom out there to take the dogs loose and go up into the tundra. And uh, training is just phenomenal. You just go and camp. And so, you know, I think it's, uh, it suits me to finally be breaking up these runs on the I did run. Let's be fair to Jesse and the people that are looking in when you say he bought a place. He bought a piece of land. He hauled everything out there. He built a log cabin with his own hands yeah. while training his dogs. So yeah. give the guy credit. Yeah, a lot of credit. Yeah. I shouldn't say there was a house and all that they're already there when you purchased it. There was it. nothing but a game trail in there. <laughs> and uh, now it's looking pretty awesome. Got yeah. a nice dog yard and two cabins built. Yeah, a lot of hard work. Is there one section on the trail that you're looking forward to, or is there one section on the trail that, like, uh, concerns you more than any the others? I mean, you definitely concerned going on to the coast with the threat of uh, imminent weather coming in, you know, but it's just so beautiful to get up there, and no matter how competitive you want to be in this race, you just got to remember that you're out in God's beautiful country and how blessed you are to be there, and you work so hard for it. You got to look around and enjoy it. And the leaders, who are your stud leaders that have been uh, up there working hard? I've been on a rotation, you know, but Tempest has just been up there. She finished as a two-year-old last year, her first year in lead, and she's just been up there yelling and screaming on every run. I mean, not just when we come up on teams, after we pass teams, she'll go like 30 miles and never shut up. And I think that picks all our spirits up. And Emmett's been doing really good. Roomba's always really good. Alpi. You, you seem awfully lively. You've been, are you sleepy? You've been getting I sleep? Did, I didn't get any sleep here. I didn't get any sleep back there, but I feel really lively because the team feels lively, and uh, I'm just excited to be here. I worked all year for it. Yeah, Jesse, we appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. Good I'm luck, go, the, good luck the rest of the dog. Go yeah. boot up some dogs and go see the God's beautiful country. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Holmes. I believe it was a fifth-place finish as a rookie, 27th last year, and it looks like he's put himself through management and really training a beautiful dog team. He's putting himself back into position, certainly, to finish in the top ten and, and maybe even better. So kudos to him. And, and Bruce, you must enjoy uh, one aspect that you must love, actually, about this race is to see these up-and-coming mushers improve and to watch them get better at what they do. And, you know, it was Doug Swingley who, who said a long time ago that the idea Iditarod isn't a dog race, it's a time management race. And it is, it truly is about managing every moment for a thousand miles. Yeah, and when Doug said that and that talk was going around, it's basic, it, it is over the whole race, but the big time management is in checkpoints. I have so many times observed people winning and losing positions which had nothing to do with the speed of dogs. It's how they manage their time at a checkpoint in a sleep 
depraved mindset, uh, saying you're going to leave in four hours, but oh, another 20 minutes sleep would yeah. be good. Or, or you're sleep deprived and you don't do your chores as efficiently. But those that really stay focused and manage their time and checkpoints more so than the speed out on the trail and for a lot of positions they're not talking about winning but that's part of it too they they just get those places closer to the front and i think when jesse's talking about learning a lot over the last two years part of it is is how to manage your time to efficiently get in and out of checkpoints yeah and, you know, the other thing, too, talking with Jesse, and it was a serious question. He seems awfully lively, which tells me that he's uh, one of these guys that can really handle sleep deprivation. We don't spend enough time talking about that as far as winning it. There are some people out on the Iditarod Trail that compete that have beautiful dog teams. They have beautiful genetics. Their training programs work. But not being able to handle sleep deprivation will keep them ever from getting to know him first. He appears to be a guy that's... Uh, that's got that knack. Yeah, and as your dogs do better and as you get closer to the intense uh, competition, it tends to stimulate you. You know, you, you're jazzed, you're thinking, and all of that comes into combination to kind of keep you going and not wanting to let the dogs down, so to speak. Yeah. So it, it's your job to be up. But even when I was talking few hours ago to the very front runners as they were leaving they were laughing at themselves like Brent Sass said he was going down the Yukon River and tipped over and fell off his sled and people go down the river standing up yeah. or sitting on their sleds asleep so yeah. it sleep is really and, and truthfully that comes into time management if you manage your time, the musher has more time to sleep, which helps them make better decisions. It is warm, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, maybe a little bit warmer than that. There's no precipitation coming down here in Caltech, but there is snow in the forecast throughout these remaining runs all the way to Nome uh, through late Monday. And so uh, the weather has has kind of settled in here. And I think this is what we're gonna have to the very end of this race. And I was talking to Aaron Burmeister yesterday before he pulled out, I believe he was the second team to leave Caltag. And he was concerned because his, his team is a cold weather team. And he just, he owned that. He says, this, this temperature really concerns me going forward because uh, it's 30 degrees above zero. He wants it to be 30 degrees below zero for his team. How do you think that these temperatures will affect many of these teams? Will it be individually or will it affect them the same all across the board? Well, it won't affect them all the same because dogs are like like us. I mean, as far as, I mean, humans, us, in that if you're used to being in a warm situation all the time, an environment, then when it does get cold, it, it kind of penetrates more. You know, a person from, say, Georgia will it get to be 35 degrees and they go i'm freezing but a person yeah. from alaska if it's been 30 below and it warms up to 30 degrees fahrenheit they're out in their t-shirts you know or somebody like you in shorts because you stay warm all the time so yeah. so it is relative to where those dogs have trained if they're used because they also build up heavier coats if they live in a cold area like say a team coming down from Kotzebue or Aaron has a lot of these gnome bloodlines uh, they tend to be more furred so that enters into it as well. Let's break down Shaq Tulik and I know uh, it looks like they've worked really hard there and congratulations to them and kudos to the people of Shaq Tulik for coming up with an option for the teams they did not want uh, all of these teams and people frankly to come into the heart of their community so it's going to be out in the old Shaq Tulik uh, and, but the question for you, Bruce, is will that change strategy? Is there enough there for teams to keep, to keep Shaq Tulik in play as far as a place to stop before heading off to Koyak across Norton Sound? Or do they, they go, they have to make this run to Unilcleet in two runs or one run? And, and now does Unilcleet to Koyak become one run? Any idea on that? Do, will we know? Shaq Tulik is totally in play now. Uh... Like you said, uh, the vi village council decided not to have the teams come, to have all the Iditarod come into the, the village at the usual checkpoint. That was a vi village council decision. And it, it wasn't 
just it wasn't so much the mushers it's the whole entourage yeah. of people that travel True. and they but they feel, have great respect and great concern about the mushers and to their credit working with the race marshal mark nordman and i talked to him yesterday they wanted to welcome the mushers they just made this decision so there's an old village only two miles away the building it's, I, I guess most people would describe it as a ghost town now mm-hmm. Uh, to picture what it is. The buildings are there, but it's been abandoned. And the villagers went out and they hauled all of the food drops, hay, uh, the fuel for cooking, everything, two miles away. They went in and they hand dug out the snow that had drifted into a building. And they're trying, the last I heard, to get a stove in there all for the convenience of the mushers because they live in that environment where there's no trees, it's just tundra. They know how severe the weather can be, even though it's 30 now. And, and you have to give those people tremendous credit for the effort they put out for these mushers to have a safe shelter and get all the food supplies there. Now, before that happened, it was the major thing on the front runners' minds as far as how are we going to handle that run if that checkpoint wasn't there because of this run that comes up after there out on the Bering Sea ice, which anyone who's ever studied or follows the Iditarod throughout time knows is can be one of the most difficult stormy areas on this entire race. And the people from Chatulik and working with with uh, our trail breakers out there who helped get the food supplies lined out for the mushers and our race marshal Mark Nordman made a tremendous effort and in a matter of hours got a checkpoint sufficient. Yeah, it's really a spectacular effort. And when you consider uh, you know, this all kind of happened in the middle of the race and so an already tired logistical team had to once again muster the energy to get in there and make out a plan. So is there enough there now as we look at the time of the day? Thomas Werner, what, 30 miles or so from Unilaclete, maybe a little bit less now. He'll be getting into Unilaclete uh, 10 a.m., 11 a.m. I haven't really done the math yet. He'll have to rest. He'll have to stop there some. Will he go all the way to Koyuk, or will he be able to stop in Shaktulik now, as they often do, before they head out across Norton Sound. Chatulik's totally in the game now. Okay, uh, okay. Fans looking in uh, should only realize that maybe on the tracker it will show the mushers stopping out, all piling up and taking a break, not quite in the checkpoint. And just remember that the old village where the checkpoint is now is two miles back down the trail from where the the new village of Chatulik is. It's yeah. totally game on, totally as gotcha. before. It is a go. And so those uh, Jesse Royer and Aaron Burmeister that are sh- sitting at Old Woman, 38 miles from Unilakley, we could in essence see them now go all the way to Chatulik before stopping. They could. Uh, there's also a few, a couple of shelter cabins between in the Blueberry Hills before you get to Chatulik. By taking a break, and, and we'll see how long they stay there. I mean, since we've started this broadcast, uh, it's possible they're even people looking on the tracker know they're moving now, or they might stay there for f- four or five hours. They've really set them up themselves up with some good options. They can stop in Uniclete. They can run uh, up into the Blueberry Hills, or it's within striking distance to just go all the way to Chatulik, yes. Yeah, and that's what makes this race so interesting from a fan's perspective and for for us that are covering this race is trying to figure out uh, run rest, where will they stop, where will they go, at what point in time do they start to cut an hour rest here or there, especially those uh, trying to chase down Thomas Werner? Are we at that point yet where they start to consider that? Or we have to wait until, you know, Elam, Koyak, Elam, Elam, White Mountain before we start to see teams react, truly react to what's going on up front? Well, as we said <clears throat> last night, uh, you know, after I talked to a lot of the mushers, a lot of the ones like Brent, Aaron and Jesse, they don't want to be in the front right now. They like being where they are uh, with Thomas in front so they can kind of keep monitoring that, uh, his positions and his rest. Uh, I would say, you know, directly what you're asking, where do you want to be right with him if he remains in front is Koyuk because there, there is so little time 
to White Mountain and then the run to Nome, that there aren't a lot of strategies left other than speed. So, at speed and power. So, right now they're still kind of drifting in there, all staying within striking distance. Can cut, they start cutting rests more uh, if necessary to keep up or to catch or to pass. But Koyuk, when they come off the ice, if in any race, if you want to really do battle for the front, you better be pretty much right there. And really from Koyak in, it is a race from checkpoint to checkpoint. We have seen through the years, teams have stopped in other places. There's some shelter cabins throughout uh, the entire Bering Sea coast. So there are cabins that they can stop up. But remember, they're all mushing towards that mandatory eight-hour rest in White Mountain, which is 77 miles from the finish line. And so, again, they get there, the clock starts, Right, and so they have to sit there for eight minutes, their team builds rest, and then it's the blast off for the final 77 miles to the finish line in Nome. And so there's a lot of strategy that goes on, uh, that continues to go on throughout these miles, but as Bruce said, there's less opportunity, the closer they get to that finish line, there's less opportunity to cut rest and try to make a move to catch who's ever uh, up front in the race. So uh, a lot to, to think over, uh, over these miles to come. You'll have to keep an eye on that to truly know uh, what will happen and what will break down. Uh, how much pressure is Thomas Werner feel in this situation, Bruce? It was Martin Boozer who always used to talk about, you know, being up in the lead is very difficult because you're the only one. Uh, everybody else behind you has all of this knowledge because uh, you're out in front and you're kind of out there all alone. Now it's changed a little bit with trackers and how the information can filter back to a musher. It's changed a lot with that, but still, you're out there all by yourself. You're the first one to put in a trail and to see. Well, that's true. Uh, Thomas, when I talked to him here in Caltag last night, I mean, he's very confident. He's very confident in these dogs. He's very confident in his race plan. He thinks it's going exactly as he planned it. He doesn't mind being up front. He does have a very nice looking team. And he might stay up front and dominate the whole way up the coast, all the way to the finish line. It's nice to have that confidence, but if all of a sudden teams start putting pressure on you and you start having to adjust your schedule, then's when you really feel that pressure. And I will use the example of Mitch now moving up into fifth place. If he hasn't seen Mitch for days and days and days, and all at once, yeah. he appears at a checkpoint yeah. right with you. Then you start thinking, huh, yeah. what's going on here? So that pressure is there. But I will say Thomas's mindset is such that he's pretty confident in that team and his plan. And he's just riding that wave right now. I remember over the last two years, it was your two years ago who got the Koyak through that storm and, and beat Nick there. And I remember him talking about how his mindset completely changed because he was now in the lead. And there's some anxiety that comes with being in that because you don't want to screw it up. Frankly, you're trying not to lose it. Uh, oftentimes, you know, a decision one bad decision from that point in could cost you a chance uh, to immortalize your name in, in this great long-distance sled dog race. So there's a lot of pressure on a team. And then last year, too, I remember Pete Kaiser talking about it in Koyak as, you know, the the community of Bethel's chest was was puffing out and Western Alaska was going crazy because their favorite son was about to, to win his first Iditarod championship and bring that trophy home. He also talked about the fact that there was pressure mounting on him in those those finishing miles. And so I can't imagine, because remember, when you're close to winning, uh, you know, a soccer championship or the World Cup, you know, there's, it all happens pretty quickly. You're battling right to the, to the to the very end, but when you're going six, seven, eight miles an hour over two of the remaining 200 miles and you're out in the lead, I think it can be excruciating because you just want to get there, get it over with, and end the race, get your championship, and go home. It's brutal. Yeah, I don't know if you want to get it over with. So well, I pay a lot of money to be out here. They ought to enjoy it. And as far as the pressure goes, like you're talking about with Pete, I, I mean, you, you last year you were aware of that, but then. When you go up and ask him, do you feel the weight of Bethel on your yeah. shoulders? That's when yeah. he feels it. So, yeah. um, 
it's you just have to take it a mile at a time. You know, any advice I've ever given anybody running the Iditarod for the first time, I tell them all the same thing. You're not going to know. Yeah. You're not going a thousand miles. You're just running the next mile. Yeah. And that's what a musher front or back has to stay focused on. But the reason I don't think any of us that are students of this or like myself that had run this race a number of times really start thinking too much about who's going to win. We just think about how the teams look at that point. Just, just let's not go way back in Iditarod history. Let's just go the last few years. Jeff King had the dominant team, had a big enough lead in White Mountain, and the weather changed, and Dallas won within less than 30 miles of the finish line, and Allie got second. We watched Nick lose the trail, and your won. We watched last year Nick with the dominant team yeah. run out and Pete won. And it's not taking anything away from the people that won those races. It's just showing team management, being focused, and that this thing isn't over till it's over. And it's also, you know, the the different mindsets, right? Because you've got Thomas Werner who's out there in the lead and just trying to manage his team to keep his speed up and to get to know him as fast as he can. And then you've got the more aggressive-minded chasers in these packs behind who are looking, okay, <clears throat> do I have to cut an hour here? Do I have to cut a half hour here? I have to work a little bit harder in the checkpoints so they can rest a little bit longer. There is a, a change in... in and a real dynamic between mindsets between the team that's in the lead and those that are chasing. And it sounds like somebody's getting ready to leave, and you can see, you hear the chorus of, of dogs starting to react to that. That's a sound you never, ever get tired of on the Iditarod Trail. No, I was just sitting here thinking, this is one of the prettiest sounds in the world to a musher when the dogs howl like that, and they do that in every kennel everywhere. Yeah. Maybe going back to the roots of where these dogs came from. Yeah, I can't tell who who just left here. Oh, it was Jesse Holmes. You just we just had him on here live. Jesse Holmes pulling out of Caltech. And now he's headed towards the Bering Sea coast and Unilocleet. And uh, we've talked, I think, throughout the last week on these live broadcasts and certainly uh, many other times as well. Uh, this next run is one of the favorites for most mushers. When you, whenever you ask a musher, what is your favorite part of the trail? It's amazing. I'll bet you 70% of the time the mushers will say it's this run to Unilocle. And it's kind of timbered, as Bruce was talking about, and it's a rise. And then you kind of come out of a chute into wide open tundra country. And on a clear day or a sunny day, you can see all the way to the Bering Sea. And so it's a fantastic run that, that Jesse is now uh, on his way uh, towards Unicleet. Both of these runs, and both, I mean, leaving Unicleet and this run going to, from a woman into Unicleet, it, it's funny that you, it strikes me that you say that, that so many of us name that, myself included. Yeah. It's one of my favorite runs. It also can be the most brutal, yeah. and I think there, there, it is just beautiful eye candy as yeah. far as a striking landscape. But it's it's really interesting thinking about that, that one of the areas that can be the most brutal with winds can also have such a deep beauty is, you know, it's kind of the beauty and the beast type yeah, thing. Yeah. And uh, it, it it is a great run, an amazing run. And I think part of it, too, Bruce, is that you finally get off the Yukon River, those boring, relentless miles on this river. And on the northern route, which they are on this year, you know, they're running uh, down the river on the southern route they're running up the river and oftentimes they have a, a headwind that they're battling through on the southern route so when they get off the river here in Caltech and head towards the Bering Sea uh, it's just a transition too in the types of environment and they get behind them uh, a really difficult stretch which is the Yukon and it, it's just a transition on the whole trail there are places like from the start to get to the Alaska range and then you hit Nikolai and you're in the interior and then you hit Ruby and it's the section of the Yukon River and then that can be mind numbing because yeah. it's such a big wide river and then this run means we've arrived and on the Bear on the coast the Bering Sea coast and everybody knows that the end of that rainbow 
is Nome. Yeah. And there's no place like Nome. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. And again, though, there's there's anxiety in these miles because throughout the Iditarod, uh, since 1973, it's the Bering Sea coast where we see a lot of teams uh, lose their energy and uh, not be able to, to leave. And so mushers are forced to give them more rest to help them uh, get to a point where they want to get back out on the trail and get to Nome. And so I think there's a lot of these mushers, too, when they get to this point, certainly these teams that have been up front for a lot of the race, they live with that anxiety uh, mile to mile. I was talking with Ryan Reddington last night, and he thinks his race is going well. But he also prefaced that by saying, i got a long way to go, and I just hope that they can hold it together. And being on the Bering Sea coast, there's almost this feeling, if I can describe it as... Uh, you're trying to quietly tiptoe by the weather gods that can suddenly yeah. get really yeah. angry with yeah. you. And if you get a free ride through there, it's one of the most beautiful places on the entire planet. But we're all very aware when we're going through there that if the weather gods decide to frown on you, you are going to have a miserable trip. Yeah, for sure. And so uh, those miles are, are to come here uh, for these teams. We're still sitting in Caltag, and uh, this is a great community. I've loved Caltag over the years. When we get here, it's a, it's a warm place, and uh, things have changed a little bit in Caltag, and obviously we don't have access to the schools uh, because of what's been going on with the coronavirus throughout uh, the rest of this race. And so for a lot of onlookers and, and people who follow this race uh, physically and actually coming here. We got a dog team. Yeah, we got a dog team coming from the other, the wrong direction. What do we have here? I can't see through our light. Yeah, hey, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, Jesse's, Jesse's doing I was going to say it had to be Jesse because he went up and did a loop and come back. He, he's 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 doing uh, loops here in Caltech. <laughs> <laughs> Took the wrong turn. Because <laughs> I was like, Bruce, he's going. There's somebody coming from the wrong direction. <laughs> that was classic. <laughs> that, was, that was fantastic. Some of the hardest parts of these trails can be the outbound trail out of these communities. And there's so many roads up there, and the dogs can easily take a wrong turn or if somebody takes a marker down in the wrong place you can get confused and jesse holmes when, he, <laughs> when, when he comes by the next time let's give him a cup of coffee yeah, seriously <laughs> stop in and say hi for a while jesse we'll get you back on we'll ask you how that loop went and to explain to people sometimes you know people have often asked many of us that have raced how do you find the trail or what it's like out there when you're on the trail between checkpoints it's not it's not so difficult because it's usually just one trail. But when you leave these villages and communities, there's lots of trails. There's, you know, somebody's woodcutting trail, a trail where the kids go out and go sledding. There's the trail to the airport. Yeah. There's the trail to the dump. So you've kind of got to get through that spider web and then get on that main trail going to the next community. So that's a good example of it right there actually it's a perfect example yeah, of yeah. it right there. and that makes one of those moments where i'm glad i was sitting here to see that because you don't see that every day on the iditarod trail especially with with a team as good as jesse holmes well any predictions what do you think's going to happen i you think, think thomas is going to win yeah you finally got around to that <laughs> <laughs> there is too much <clears throat> trail and unpredictable <clears throat> environment up ahead with those examples I gave before to say anybody's going to win right now. If I was breaking it down right now, from what I've seen, talking to the mushers, watching their dogs leave here, Thomas has the dominant team. We know Jessie is a pit bull. She has no quit in her, and she knows how to race. Probably a little less speed, which she is aware of, but a really great team. And if the weather gets bad, she's one of the strongest. Also, uh, Brent Sass, really good looking team. I'd say he has the second strongest looking team leaving here, regardless of what the speeds are out on the trail, just the way that team eats, the way it moves, not seeing and I'm looking at things like no stiffness from the first step. They're up on plane, uh, moving. Uh, and then we got Mitch coming up with more speed. He's got plenty of miles out ahead of him, and he's a master at managing time, yeah. which you brought up. So 
No, it's way too early with those caliber of teams to be saying anybody's going to win this. And I was closest to Brent Sass yesterday when those lead teams were in here, Thomas, uh, Brent, and Jesse. And to watch Brent Sass's team eat, I mean, they're all standing up and just gobbling all of that food down in the dish and looking back at Brent because they wanted more. And I know to a musher 650 miles into the race, that is absolute key. If they don't do that, you have a no chance, zero chance of staying up with the lead pack and giving yourself a chance to win. Well, yeah, and you, you do, when, they, when they're eating like that, you have to also be careful they don't overeat. Just like us, if you eat too much sitting at the table, you want to be on the couch and like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that yeah. last sausage. So uh, it's that same thing. It, again, it's management. Enough energy, but not to get them so full that they don't feel like going at all. Here's we got Pete Kaiser behind us getting ready to leave, too. I think that's Pete back there. Yeah, that looks like Pete. Pete's been uh, having a great race. And, and again, his team uh, starting in Ruby, coming down the, the Yukon. It is recharged. It is amped. He's put himself in position to make a really strong uh, finish here in the Iditarod and, and come off a, a championship with a top 10 finish. Not easy to do. When you look throughout the history of the Iditarod, you know, it's really hard to win this race. It's even harder to repeat as champion. Well, and he had some difficulty in the beginning with females that were in heat and other issues, and he just had to take time to manage the, that team and kind of pull them back together. And doing that, then, uh, you know, he had to take a little more time. But he's he's moving up now, and that team seems to have quite a bit of speed and in it but as as these front five start putting a little distance on you're always playing catch up because by the time you pull in they're rested and getting ready to go so it, we're, we're kind of getting into the point now where those front five or six teams are going to start separating out a little bit more and a little bit more from those that are in position back here you give our fans a sense of how tired these people are <laughs> sitting in Caltech knowing they still have a few days left Honestly, if I was going to make a comparison, maybe people that have been in combat yeah. have had to stay awake for endless days, do a lot of physical work at, to the point of exhaustion, or probably some of the few that understand the physical demands and the lack of sleep for basically closing in on a week of this. I mean, they, they, they walk with a almost burden you know, like they're yeah. carrying a burden because your shoulders ache you want to lay down think about it even though they have these set down sleds they spend a tremendous amount of time carrying around food drops uh in the sleep aspect it's almost that your body goes into a survival type of mode that uh, and a depth that a lot of ever get to experience in their lives because they never do that and that's why i use the example of someone who's been in a combat situation that's just had to dig deep and find their best selves to get something done yeah and as this race has increased in speed over the years the record is what eight days and and i believe six hours uh maybe three hours if i it's been a long trip for us, too. But uh, by Mitch Seavey, as this race has picked up pace, you know, the mushers have gotten less and less sleep over the years. This is going to be a, a really slow race. Uh, it is uh, Sunday morning. Generally, the teams are getting into Koyak on Sunday morning. And right now, they're headed towards Unilaclete. So uh, they're behind. And, and it has been a long slog, uh, Bruce, for these teams, starting right from the, that finish or that start line in Willow with all of that fresh snow that had fallen. And then they picked up pace through the Alaska range. But really, over the last couple of days now, as the snow started to fall, we've seen teams really slow down again. Yeah, again, it's just reacting, making decisions that suit the type of trail with your dogs. And, you know, you, you, you can't make them go faster than they want to go. And you want to give them the the management, the rest, and the food that they need to meet certain trail conditions at any given point. So uh, it is what it is. It's just managing the trail to 
and managing your dogs. And if it's going to be a nine-day race or a ten-day race or a twelve-day race, that's that's what you need to do. Yeah, we've got a lot of movement here. Is uh, another team pulling out right now? This is Richie Deal. Richie Deal. Yeah, Richie Deal back in it, and he had some trouble yesterday. Uh, leaving New Lotto and had to turn back to that checkpoint and go back and give his team a chance. And that wasn't a, an issue with a tired team. That was a team that had a female in heat, and he had to get the female out of there. And then once he did bring the female back to the checkpoint to leave it, then the boys didn't want to go down the trail without her. So he had a bit of a revolt, had to like give it some time, uh, and now he's here. And so kudos to him for that team has been tremendous through the entire race he's one i picked early on watching his progress and the way the dogs were that had a real shot at winning this that little cup really kind of kicked him back a few positions and that's just that's why we say it's not over till it's yeah. over but that has been a really beautiful team to watch until he had that problem uh well, it's still a great team, but, I mean, that problem there back at uh, New Auto uh, cost him some time. Yeah, it really cost him a chance to be up at the very, very front of this race. But who knows with what's happening. He's in position now for a really good finish if he can keep it together. A lot of activity in, in this checkpoint. We should have a few teams pulling out here very soon. You can keep an eye on that tracker to see who's going, who's staying, who's still here, who's still coming. Uh, that's how this race has changed over these years. I, I forget exactly when the trackers made their way to the Iditarod Trail, but, but prior to that, we really had no indication of exactly where everybody was, and you'd have to go outside and just wait, especially if you're covering this race, and you'd have to do some math. Okay, they left this checkpoint. It generally takes them 10 hours, so from 9 hours to 11 hours, you'd have to stand out and wait for them and, and hope that they would come. Well, that's the story from Keltag right now. The race certainly uh, heating up as these teams head towards the Bering Sea coast and the, the community of Unilaclete. Thomas Verner will be getting there this morning with Jesse Royer, Aaron Burmeister sitting out at Old Woman Cabin resting their teams. The strategies will begin to unravel here and a lot will be revealed in these coming hours on the Iditarod Trail. Who's truly in the lead? It looks like right now it is Thomas Verner. Can those chase him? chasing him, catch him. Maria, let's go back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce and Greg. And I wonder about your day today. Uh, will you stay in Caltech or will you move on forward? Well, right now we have a crew that's in Unilacleet, so the live stream will be up and going. There'll be live pictures for the fans of the race that will be able to enjoy those teams getting in there. It will be Bruce and I's job to kind of break down Caltag and be part of that process and then move this to Koyuk, where we will be when the leaders come through there sometime later today into the evening or night. I uh, have to figure that out. But we will be moving to Koyuk, and then we'll just start to leapfrog as this race now will pick up pace as we head towards the finish line in Nome. So we will be moving. That'll be weather dependent. You know, we've got a couple of pilots that are part of the crew and, and really pilots in this part of the world are experts at weather. So they'll study the weather maps and find out exactly how far we can get and when we can go. And so it'll be our hope to get out of here this morning, but you never know on the Iditarod Trail. It could be this evening, but for the fans of the race, they will have live pictures that they can see from Unilocleet regardless. And hopefully Bruce and I, when the sun sets, will be in the great community of Koyuk.